we're online, are we? Yep. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the 11 a.m. public portion of the closed litigation session of the February 12th, 2019 meeting of the City Council. In this part of the meeting, the Council will receive public testimony. Thereafter, the Council members will move to the Courtyard Conference Room for the closed session. Um, I would like to ask the clerk to please call roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Crone? Here. Glover? Here. Myers? Here. Brown? Here. Matthews? Here. Vice Mayor Cummings? Here. And Mayor Watkins? Here. Um, at this point, I'd like to see if there are any members of the public who would like to speak to us on any items listed on closed session. Seeing none. I have a brief announcement. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, the closed session item for anticipated litigation, it lists two uh, potential cases. Um, one of those will be taken off of the closed session agenda. The other one, I'm required to announce um, the subject matter if it's known to potential plaintiffs or whatnot. And that is the, um, uh, the intent under the California Voting Rights Act to bring uh, a lawsuit against the Santa Cruz City Schools school district to compel the district to switch to district elections. Um, so that will be the item that's uh, discussed by the council as anticipated litigation. Thank you, Mr. Condotti. So at this point, I will adjourn uh, the meeting to the conference, the courtyard conference room where the council will go into its closed session. All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our 12.30 p.m. session of the February 12th, 2019 meeting of City Council. I would like to ask the clerk to please call roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Crone? Here. Glover is currently absent. Myers? Here. Brown? Here. Matthews? Here. Vice Mayor Cummings? Here. And Mayor Watkins? Here. And will you please, please lead us through the Pledge of Allegiance? At this time, we'll have some uh, new employee introductions. So if we could start with our Director of Public Works, Mark Dettel, um, to introduce James Bushneff and uh, Danny Deborah, is that correct? Great, Mark Dettel, Director of Public Works, and it's my pleasure to introduce two new resource recovery collection workers. Um, next to me is James Bushnell. He was, let's see, he was born in Sonoma, grew up in Sonoma County and San Mateo County, currently lives in Capitola. He has a wife of 25 years and an 18-year-old daughter. Um, let's see, he has 20 years of driving experience, and he's graduated from Westside High School. And what he tries to do when he's not working, he tries to have fun, still mountain bikes, skates, surfs, plays music with his friends, plays guitars and drums, and he sings. We'll have to hear that at a different time. <laughs> and he's lived in, uh, kind of a fun fact, he's lived in Hawaii off and on for the last 15 years. His brother lives out there and they kind of go back and forth. So um, both nice places. So please um, join me in welcoming um, Dan um, James. Okay. And next, next to James is uh, Danny Deborah. Uh, Danny was born in Watsonville and raised in Watsonville. Uh, currently lives in Watsonville. He has two children, a five-year-old girl and a three-year-old boy. So we know what he's doing when he's not working. He's very busy with his kids. Um, worked in, uh, he's worked in waste management and, since he was 23. And he graduated from Renaissance High School, likes to go camping. And so please join me in welcoming our two new waste 
uh, resource recovery collection workers that we're in the pool right now. So um, keeping our trash and recycling off the streets and where it should be. So. Thank you and welcome. If I could now have uh, our Director of Water, uh, Rosemary Menard, come up and introduce her new employee. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I'm pleased to be uh, introducing to you Becky McNulty. Becky has joined the Water Department as an Administrative Assistant too. She works in our water distribution uh, section over in the courtyard. And she was born in Hong Kong, but grew up mostly in San Francisco and Santa Cruz. She's been uh, working with the, the city on and off over a number of years. She's worked as a sort of a temp and also uh, she worked at the police department and HR. So we're really glad to have someone who has already knows the sort of city ropes a little bit. She was working over at the courtyard um, doing something else and we sort of snagged her off of a list. So she's one of those great experiences we have here where we hire somebody temporary and then they apply for the job and then they go, get to the permanent. Um, she's very process and detailed oriented, which is really great for that particular group who have a lot of paperwork to keep track of and she's supporting that. Um, she's done a lot of work on software implementation, uh, construction software, so that's a really good uh, match to this particular group also. She enjoys outdoor activities with her family, walking on the beach, hiking, running, yoga, and she has uh, three college-aged children, one going into grad school that were also working for us at the moment in the transition and that um, her husband gave her a stand-up paddle board for Christmas. Oh, yeah. <laughs> She's looking forward to a chance to really get to use that. So please welcome <coughs> Becky McNulty. All right, well, welcome to our uh, city. So at this time, we have a presentation on Street Smarts, and I will go ahead and hand it over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor Watkins and City Council members. I'm Janice Viscard, Community Relations Specialist with the Public Works Department, and I'm here to give you a very brief update on our Street Smarts campaign with mission to reduce the number of traffic-related crashes and injuries throughout the city of Santa Cruz. Street Smarts addresses everybody that uses our roadways. So that's not only drivers, but also pedestrians and cyclists. And this was emphasized in our kickoff celebration that took place back in September 2017 at Kaiser Permanente Arena, where we had over a dozen community partners host booths with interactive traffic safety games and activities. It was a very well attended, family friendly event. I'll just point out really quick on that oh, sorry, slide. Is the little one in the middle is my daughter. <laughs> I, was like, I didn't I recognize her. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great event. <laughs> Uh, so our year one goal was to raise awareness of traffic safety issues in Santa Cruz, and our current two-year goal is to change attitudes, and a prime strategy is message repetition. So hopefully you have seen some of these messages on street pole banners, in front of schools, on the sides of city vehicles, through social media, on television, radio, in print, and online. And the bottom message, watch for me, is a new one that of course raises awareness of the vulnerability of bicyclists on our roadways. We've held uh, two informal surveys to date, uh, both occurred at the Open Streets events in 2018 and 2017, and they have indicated that our methods of message distribution are working. And another positive me measurement of campaign awareness has been the yard signs that we provide free of charge to any Santa Cruz resident, and we've given away over 400 of these to date. And here uh, represents one of the videos that we produced last year through our media sponsorship with KION Telemundo. We actually created 10 of these in English and Spanish that aired uh, they aired all last year, three weeks out of each month, twice a day. And I would just like to um, share one of these with you now. Oh, going. 
are people here on the Central Coast, but some of them still cross the street mid-block, which is dangerous. You should always cross at an intersection and preferably use a crosswalk. Don't cross between parked cars and be vigilant for cars turning. The rule is look left, <laughs> right, and left again before crossing. And make eye contact with drivers. Otherwise, even if you have the right of way, you may lose. Use your head as well as your legs when crossing the street. It's the street That's smarts thing to do. Brought to you by the city of Santa Cruz. <laughs> So I'm happy to say that these videos are evergreen. We continue to use them. This year we have a new sponsor with Comcast who is airing these in English and Spanish. And we also boost them on Facebook. I try to boost them for about a week at a time. And in general, we're seeing 200 full views of these each week. And that's only within Santa Cruz zip codes. Uh, last year, our outreach was expanded with the help of uh, Santa Cruz Police Department. We produced four different community events with them. This one occurred in June. It was our Street Smarts family bike ride with David Terrazas, with Mayor Terrazas. Uh, it was a very successful event. Ecology Action led the bike ride. Uh, we had about an hour at Laurel Park with interactive displays, again, underscoring safe rules of the road. Then we all got on our bicycles and SCPD actually escorted us across busy Laurel Street to the Riverwalk, and we all pedaled young and old along the Riverwalk to the Penny Ice Creamery, who generally, generously donated ice cream cones for all of us. So it was a very educational and yet fun event for us. Outreach to elementary school students was another focus of year one. We partnered with Santa Cruz City Schools and Santa Cruz County Health Services Agency, presenting nine assemblies to 1,600 students across all five elementary schools, and the focus was preventing distractions on the road and in the car. And we actually designed the assemblies in an after-school club at Branson to 40 Middle School, and you can see in the lower pictures, the kids, the middle school students, ended up on the stage, sort of peer-to-peer -peer education, um, performing in the assemblies for the younger kids with the help of a professional musician. And these were very interactive. You can see the kids are engaged with hand movements and sing-alongs, uh, very rewarding events. The principals, the kids, the teachers all gave us great rounds of applause. And I'd like to say we're very grateful to County Health Services for the 1,200 hours of staff time they donated in this effort. <laughs> and they paid for the take-home materials I've provided you with that extended the messaging to get the parents and siblings involved in these traffic safety lessons. Uh, currently, year two, uh, we are doing more school outreach, but this time we are partnered with Ecology Action. Uh, we are part of their elementary bike smart bike smart and walk smart programs for second and fifth graders and we just completed 12 assemblies to middle school students serving about 1200 uh, kids and you can see we have a street smarts rap artist there in the center of the screen we took the same lyrics we used for the elementary kids but we gave them a hip beat and you can see how engaged the kids are so another very successful event our year one budget was just under $50,000, and about a quarter of that was donated from community <coughs> sponsors. Currently, our year two budget is about 27,000, and about half of that is coming from the generosity of these community sponsors that you see listed here. We're so grateful to them. They extend the, the outreach that we can do. And I must say that our media sponsors also contribute to our outreach greatly. They are giving us a value of over $37,000 in media placements uh, this current year too. And the top of the list is Comcast, who's providing with us with almost 350 placements of those videos each month. And they air across a variety of networks, including ESPN, the Food Network, CNN, Family Channel, even some high-profile NFL and NBA, NBA sports, Fox Deportes, and Galavision. Uh, KAZU, our local NPR radio station, is providing us with about 33 spots during commute hours, Monday through Friday. Uh, KAZ, uh, KSCO is doing about the same thing during the Good Morning Monterey Bay Area show, again during commute hour. KZSC, 
over one a day, Monday through Friday, and Good Times as well is printing our long form ads about twice a month. So we're really grateful to our five media sponsors for year two. Uh, and we're not only using these uh, sponsor media placements to distribute our messaging, but we're continuing with outdoor signage in front of schools twice a year on street poles. Uh, we continue to table at major events like Open Streets and Earth Day. Our signs are up inside the UCSC shuttle bus. And new this year, the Santa Cruz Warriors are designating student street smarts leaders. And these leaders are getting free tickets to the basketball games and they're getting a street smart shout out at the games. Uh, and then we also use the Warriors um, mascot Mavericks and CHP's uh, Chipper the Chipmunk at many of our events that really just helps attract the kids and, and gets the messaging out there. And here is the second of our two new ads, uh, Share the Rules, Share the Road. And of course, this uh, highlights the campaign's premise that it takes all of us, whether we're drivers, cyclists, or pedestrians, to make our roadways safer. Just to review the campaign progression, year one, uh, we focused on raising awareness. We feel we succeeded at that. Currently, year two, we are attempting to change attitudes and by the end of the year three, our goal is to have succeeded in improving traffic safety behavior within the city of Santa Cruz. And I'd like to note that these objectives all align with the county's and Watsonville's newly adopted Vision Zero plan. And in fact, uh, we are going to be collaborating with Watsonville on media outreach, which is very exciting because it's gonna extend the, the, the message reach. And I'm happy to say that we have our top sponsors with us today to accept Street Smarts Awards. And Mayor Watkins, I'd like to turn this honor over to you. Okay, great, well thank you so much for the presentation and celebration of a wonderful program that is a demonstration of public and private partnership to ensure the health and safety of our children in our community. So I appreciate all the work that's gotten us to this place today. So it's really um, with my great appreciation and on behalf of our city, the city of Santa Cruz, to present our Street Smarts Gold Sponsor Award to the Monterey Bay Community Power. And, and receiving that reward on behalf of uh, the policy board is our very own uh, Council Member Sandy Brown. So. And okay, and the four Street Smarts Media Sponsor Awards will go to KAZU FM 90.3 General Manager um, Miklos. I apologize if I didn't pronounce your name correctly. Okay, okay, Mick Benedict and Underwriting Executive Jocelyn McNeil. Me to do, would you like me to come down one at a time, or how would you? Great. <laughs> That's great. We're right here. Okay. All right. The next award. <coughs> Next award goes to KSCO AM 1080, to the program director and host of Good Times Morning Monterey Bay, Rosemary Chalmers. <laughs> Our next award goes to KZSC FM 88.1, underwriting manager, Luisa Cardoza. And the last award goes to NBC Comcast, but we're gonna have to hang on to this one for the uh, account executive, Ana Jimenez, who is unable to be here today.
Thank you. Thank you to all our sponsors and our supporters and for the presentation. We really appreciate all that you've done. So. Okay. So at this time, um, we have a special opportunity to recognize a longtime employee um, honoring Carol Berg and her retirement from the city of Santa Cruz. So we'll go ahead and invite up Carol and Bonnie. Good afternoon, Mayor and members of the council. I just I had a, a, a couple of comments. Um, Carol, please, please come up. <laughs> Um, it's with great fondness, appreciation, and gratitude, and also a little bit of sadness, or a whole lot of sadness, um, to see you go, um, that we're before you today to honor you for your considerable contributions to the city and the entire Santa Cruz community over close to two decades of service. It would not be an understatement to say that you have influenced the lives of tens of thousands in our community and enabled the rehabilitation, preservation, and creation of thousands of affordable housing units in our community, allowing many Santa Cruzans to continue to call Santa Cruz home. Your impact will be felt for generations. Thank you, Carol. It's been a true privilege to work with you and learn from you all these years. <laughs> And before turning over you, I just wanted to say there will be a roast on Thursday for th some of you who are, <laughs> who are so inclined. It will be in uh, Planning Room 107 um, on the City Hall Annex. All right. Where the real fun begins. Yeah. Huh? Okay. <laughs> Carol, would you like to make any kind of statement? Or? I would. Um, for one thing, I'll warn you that I absolutely love this city and I easily cry. So I'm just warning you in advance. <laughs> Um, I almost didn't come to the city of Santa Cruz to work uh, 18 years ago. I was coming to my first interview for the position I'm in, and I got to the city the day in advance um, to go to the library, do a little research, and had my wallet stolen. And I thought, is this a sign from the universe that this is the city doesn't want me. This is not the right place for me to be. And so I, you know, I, because all my money, all my credit cards, I had $20 in my car and a checkbook. That was it. So I went to the desk at the library and asked them to see if they had my wallet, and they didn't. But the woman behind the counter said, well, you know, I live all the way down in Aptos, but if you want to come, you can stay with me. And I went, wow, this is pretty amazing. And so then I'm going, well, I had my checkbook, which was from a credit union somewhere else, and I naively thought, well, all these credit unions, maybe they talk to each other, and so I can let, get them to cash a check without any ID. So I go to the Santa Cruz Community uh, Credit Union, and they say, no, 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 we aren't connected. Um, but the manager said, but I will cash your check uh, personally. And I thought, wow, I guess maybe the city wants me. And obviously it did because I'm here. <laughs> and it went well. <laughs> um, the thing that I want to say is that I am so grateful to have been here and to work for the city for all of these years because, as you all know, it's such an incredibly special place. And the teamwork that is here. I, I've worked both in the housing department, started in the planning department or division, and moved over to the uh, economic development um, department. And in both departments, there was just a sense of real teamwork, really high professionalism, and real dedication to the city. And I, sp having spent half my career on the public side or private side had a little bit of a a little bit of an impression that was wrong about public employees and I can tell you it's absolutely wrong because the public employees that I've worked with in both planning and economic development are amazing. 
they really, the high standards and their work ethics and everything are just terrific. And I, I want to especially acknowledge and show gratitude toward the team in economic development and in particular the housing division. When I first started, there were really, we whittled down to two of us. It was Norm Daly, who's back there, one, even though he left me in June, I'm still grateful for him. <laughs> and it was just the two of us. And over time, uh, about three or four years ago, Jessica Melor, who's also back there, she came along and helped us out. And I'll tell you, after Norm left, she stepped up to the plate amazingly. She has been so incredible. Um, and then we're led by Bonnie Lipscomb, who you all cannot have a better economic development director than Bonnie. She, <laughs> these are hard times and they've been hard times and she manages the whole thing with grace. And so I just wanted to express my gratitude to Bonnie as well and to all of you because your dedication is truly amazing. Um, and the community, this community, it's so funny because people come here and they recognize what an active community Santa Cruz is because people really do care. As a civil servant, we get a lot of rewards because we're able to make change. I mean, I, whenever I'm really kind of getting down a little bit, I think about, well, there's somebody who's homeless who actually has a place to sleep tonight because something, something I worked on and did, or a family has a house to live in that they can afford. And so it, it gives me that reward so that the gratitude I have for having this job is real because I get these incredible rewards. I should say that um, it's hard because we have many masters. We have city council, we have public, we have management you know, in the city. And so it's not an easy job all the time. And I, I guess I want to say to all of you, because these last two years have been pretty tough. There's kind of reflecting the national uh, atmosphere of distrust and all. It's filtered down to the city. And, and we have such an amazing team in this city. And it's just, it's wonderful to be able to work together all toward that common purpose. And I just wanna hope that that, what I experienced when I came here in 2000 and 2001, just strengthens in the city more and more and more because it's such a beautiful and wonderful place to live. And I just you know, wanna thank you all and thank you all for allowing me, now I'm gonna cry, to be a part of your lives and to be, um, to have the privilege of serving in this community that is so amazing. And thank you, and that's it. I just I want to thank you for your service to our community and for all your dedication and work and for your kind remarks today. And it's my honor to have a mayor's proclamation here for you. So I'd like to come down and present that to you and then allow for maybe the council members who are interested in to say a few words as well. Carol, I would like to just speak to you personally. I, it was just so wonderful to hear your heartfelt remarks, um, acknowledging your sense of dedication to public service, to the work of providing housing, and to the, the spirit of public service that permeates throughout the city of dedication and the rewards that you get for under very difficult circumstances and um, 
um, demands that are almost infinite doing really good work to make good things happen. And um, it was such a personal statement. It, it really struck home. And I just want to thank you personally for all your many, many years of good work. Thanks. Errol, I want to thank you for, for your service and for your dedication to um, you know, promoting uh, the, the most um, effective affordable housing and, and, and productive affordable housing uh, <coughs> development strategies that we can possibly um, find in a, in a city that has um, limited resources. I understand that's no small feat. And I, I feel like this is something that I've not had an opportunity to say to you. Um, I come to you often with, with questions and uh, potentially critiques of the direction the city's gone. Um, and I just want to take this opportunity to say, you know, um, I'm really grateful for the patience that you've exhibited in um, dealing with, and I imagine this has happened with council members before me, um, people who um, come in with um, high expectations and interests and um, you know, walking us through this process. And um, it's been uh, my pleasure to work with you, even if that hasn't always come through in our interactions. So I just, I wanna be clear about that. You really have um, made it, um, it possible for this council member to really try to, to nav most effectively navigate the world of affording how, how's affordable housing policy and, and practice, and you will be missed and um, your spirit will live on. I might be one of those council members that you're referring to. <laughs> Carol, congratulations. We go back to, I think, 2000, um, and maybe we started working on 1010 Pacific and Schaefer Road at that time where we got significant affordability back in the good old days when redevelopment was still around. I have appreciated your taking us through over these years the CDBG process, the community development block grants and all of that red tape that goes with it and stuff. And um, thank you and happy trails. Mm -hmm. yeah. thank, you. Yes. thank you, Carol. And wishing you the best in this next chapter of your life. Okay, so next on our agenda is Innovation of the Year Award to Finance and the City. And so we have a presenter, uh, Richard Lee, who is our Finance Director of San Mateo. Welcome, Richard. Good afternoon, Honorable Mayor, members of the Council. My name is Richard Lee. I'm the Finance Director for the City of San Mateo. I'm also a member of the Board of Directors for the California Society of Municipal Finance Officers, or as we affectionately love to call it, CSMFO. Uh, CSMFO is the preeminent resource for promoting excellence in government finance. Uh, it serves all government finance professionals through innovation, collaboration, continuing education, and professional development. It is a genuine honor uh, to count Marcus among uh, my colleagues within CSMFO leadership. As an exemplary leader, he is quick to direct awards and accolades such as this to his team. Within CSMFO leadership, Marcus is um, uh, within CSMF leadership, which includes finance officers from throughout the state. Marcus is widely recognized as a leader among leaders uh, for his service to our organization and members. As the board liaison to the Monterey Bay chapter, as well as a colleague and friend, it is an absolute pleasure to present CSMFO's Innovation of the Year Award to the city of Santa Cruz in recognition for its Fiscal Sustainability Action Lab. Like many other cities throughout our great state, the city of Santa Cruz's general fund was faced with a $5.5 million deficit over the next, <clears throat> in fiscal year 2018-19 with escalating trends over the next five years. Within a short period of time, the city's finance department pitched an action lab concept that tapped the support, knowledge, and interest within supervisors and managers throughout the entire city into action-oriented teams that yielded 67 conceptual alternatives, of which 10 were incorporated into the fiscal year 1819 adopted budget. The remaining alternatives identified through the action labs can be utilized to address future budget gaps. Without further ado, I'll cede the microphone to my esteemed colleague and the city's finance director, Marcus Pimentel, to introduce the members of his team and provide additional comments. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> I, I do want to 
call special attention to our team. So just put it in context, 2018, January, we were trying to figure out how to best bridge our gaps, how to <laughs> come up with those solutions. And we had about 10 weeks to do it. So when we look back upon that time, it was Cheryl, our assistant director, myself, and a then buyer with the city of Santa Cruz, the three of us around a table trying to brainstorm ideas and we came up with this action lab concept. And what we then realized is we had 10 weeks to do it. We had no staff, no budget, but get it done. And we worked with our Laura Nolan, our purchasing manager, and borrowed her staff person, Elizabeth, who became our point on, on this project. And we soon came up with the idea of bringing in finance department staff as facilitators. So within 10 weeks, we <coughs> launched, created this new idea, engaged over 60, we call it a 60-60, we got over 60 fiscal champions within the city across city staff who started intimately understanding what was going on in the bigger picture of things and then became quickly engaged on how to provide internal solutions. What, what different ideas might we think about internally? This complemented the stuff we were already doing with the council on parallel paths with uh, community focus groups and, and budget one-on-one sessions. So this was an internal focus, you know, how we might we present this internally. So we ended up with over 60 ideas from over 60 managers who became little fiscal champions throughout the organization. And that was a bonus we didn't count on, was just that engagement with our staff and having so many people come up to us after the fact and say thank you. Thank you for bringing us in. Thank you for letting us participate. Thank you for listening to us and thank you for acting. So we're really proud of, of the outcome and I really wanna deflect anything that you were looking at me and embarrass them um, because it, it really wasn't, it, <laughs> without Denise Reed, without Jillian Morales, without Tracy Cole, without Michael Mano, without Cheryl Fife, uh, without Elizabeth Milwee who went on to big, greater, bigger things, without Jason McCluskey who couldn't be here today, without Jesse Soto who went on to bigger and better things. We, this wouldn't have happened and I really just want to commend their work because they were already busy doing other work when we came up to them and said, hey, can I borrow some more of your time that you don't have? So I'm really thankful for the outcomes. I'm really proud of the outcomes. And I would close with a little self-padding. In 2012, I got the opportunity to come here to the city and I remember saying things like, we want to create the department of choice and we want to create the best department in the county, region, and state. And so I'm honored that the State Society of Finance Officers has recognized the work that we've done at a state level. I won't say we're done, but um, we've come a long ways and I'm really proud of all of our team who's back in finance because if you're seeing these folks today, what you don't see is all the people who had to step up and help us backfill. I'm just really proud of all the commitment. So and on behalf of the city, I thank CSMFO for this award, certainly. Wonderful. Well, congratulations for all your wonderful work and recognition. And we're so lucky to have uh, such a stellar and competent team uh, with such lofty uh, um, aspirations leading the way. So thank you, Marcus. We'll see you later. Okay. So at this time, um, I have a few announcements and then we'll move on to our uh, agenda and business. So, um, so today's meeting will, is being broadcast live on community television, which is on <coughs> channel 25, as well as streaming on the city's website at thecityofsantacruz.com. Lynn Dutton is our uh, technician for both this afternoon and evening sessions. Thank you, Lynn. And I would like to thank um, him for his work. All city council members can be emailed at citycouncil at cityofsantacruz.com. If you would like to communicate with us about an agenda item, we'd like to receive your email by Monday at 5 p.m. before our council meeting. This provides us with an opportunity to review your email and include it in the rest of our agenda packet. Please do bear in mind that all items of correspondence with the city and the city council constitute public records and are generally subject to disclosure upon request by any member of the public. Accordingly, if you have sensitive or private information that you do not wish to have made public, you should not include that information in your correspondence. Our rules of decorum are located on the window edge to my left, and it's my job to keep the meeting running without disruption. And we ask that you respect your fellow citizens when you are inside as well as outside of our chambers. 
At this time, I will just take a quick moment to um, read our council interactions, as well as a few statements about the role of the mayor and the presiding officer. Um, so one of the things that we've discussed in terms of the principles we'd like to adhere to as a council uh, include to be respectful, to engage in open and honest communication, to be honest and truthful, to address difficult issues, to find and seek areas of common ground, to be open to different perspectives, to give the benefit of the doubt, to role model good leadership, and to be considerate of each other's time. And my role as mayor, regardless of our varying perspectives um, and uh, politics or policy approaches, um, is uh, my hope and role is to um, ensure that we can all at least respect the process. And so I ask um, that we uh, adhere to the handbook's guidelines for the role, which uh, seeks that every council member desiring to speak shall address me as the presiding officer, and upon recognition of the presiding of officer, shall confine comments to the question under debate to avoid all indecorous language and references to personalities and abiding by the rules of civil debate herein stated. And as stated, we may disagree but we will be uh, respectful of one another. All comments uh, will be directed to the issue at hand and all personal attacks should be avoided. So that stated, I'd like to move on to statements of disqualification and ask if any council members, um, if they have any statements of disqualification today. Okay, seeing none. Um, is there any uh, additions or deletions on behalf of our city clerk? There are not, okay. A brief statement about oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on the agenda. Oral communications will occur at or around 7 p.m. At this time, I'd like to hand it over to our city attorney to report on closed session. Um, any outcomes from that? Thank you, Mayor Watkins, members of the City Council. The uh, City Council convened this morning at 11 a.m. in the Courtyard Conference Room. There are several items on the uh, closed session agenda this morning. First uh, was liability claims and involving the claims of Martin L. Herman and Carrie Herman. Those are also listed on your consent calendar this afternoon as uh, agenda item number nine several real property negotiations items that the council received a report from, gave direction to um, its negotiators. Those are the properties at 510 River Street, owner SPG Associates, 600 Ro River Street, owner Gateway Plaza Associates LLC, 700 River Street, owner Summer Solstice LP, 808 River Street, owners Richard L. and Tawny Santee, trustees, and 744 <coughs> River Street, R&R Santee, LLC, owner. Um, a, an APN 0081721616 in the same vicinity, Richard L. and Tawny Santee, trustees, are the owners of that property. Um, Finally, real property at 125 Coral Street, owners James P. Gillespie and Jean Gillespie, trustees, uh, and Harley F. and Sandra I. Gillespie, co-trustees. There was one item of, real, uh, of labor negotiations involving the SEIU Local 521. Council received a report from its negotiator on that item. There was one item of significant exposure to litigation. The agenda lists two, but one was withdrawn prior to the closed session. Uh, council received a report from its uh, legal counsel and gave direction. There, were, there was no reportable action taken on any of those items. Thank you, Mr. Kondaki. So at this time, we'll move on to our consent agenda. And those are items four through 13 in your agenda packets. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Is there any council members wishing to pull an item? Council member Glover. Item 10, please. Item 10, okay. I believe that was the same uh, item, council member Crone, you were suggesting to pull as well. 
I would, I would like to pull um, item 12 and 13, um, and I'd like to make a comment on eight. And I wasn't gonna pull five, but I will now, the oral communications one. Any other items? This time is already, okay. Um, do you wanna make your comment on item number eight? Yes. Uh, just wanted to point out what a wonderful plan this is. Um, this is the uh, award of contract for consulting services to prepare Westcliff Drive adaptation and uh, management plan. We have a powerhouse of people. It's a, it's a local firm and we've got folks like Gary Griggs, Charles Lester, who used to be a uh, head of the um, Coastal Commission here, um, an old friend, Bill Henry, uh, Ross Clark, who used to be the climate change person. This is like really powerful group of folks. And I just wanna thank uh, Tiffany Wise West for bringing this forward and um, sorting through the, uh, the um, bids and stuff, because the bids were awfully close. So I, I assume that the city gave them a certain amount and they all came right to it. But um, really happy to have them <laughs> Ravel. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the hard work, Tiffany, indeed. Okay, so at this time, um, I'd like to see if there are any members of the public who would like to request an item be pulled or to speak to us on any items on our consent agenda with the exceptions of items 5, 10, 12, and 13 that have already been pulled by council members. Okay, seeing none, I will look for a motion. I'll move it. So moved. Okay. Second. Okay, uh, motion made by council member Matthews, seconded by council member Crone. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. We'll begin with item number five. Council Thank you, Mayor. I just heard you say on or about 7 p.m. And I was wondering, I, I thought the language I was hoping that was passed is at 7 p.m. Um, so I would just move that we make that language that says strike on or about, but at 7 p.m. Oral communications will be at 7 p.m. Second. Any further discussion? Just to state the obvious. Sometimes, for some reason, we're a few minutes late, but I think that's the intention of honor about, but if it's gonna be at, no one's gonna sue us for starting at 7.03. Um, before we- Agreed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and is, is there any member of the public who'd like to address the council on um, the oral communications item number five? Okay, so um, uh, I, Watkins, can go ahead, I just please. say this was to align with the council policy that was adopted and the language matches the policy. So are you suggesting to change suggesting the, policy? Change the policy as well? Is the motion I, I'm, I'm just suggesting that language change for sure. If that changes the policy, I don't understand the policy, but I mean. So you would essentially. I, I, I would love to see a time certain, that's all. That, hmm. that the public can look at and say, hey, seven o'clock, okay. And if we start a few minutes late, they'll understand because we went over or something from this afternoon meeting. I don't, I don't have a problem with honor about personally, but um, if there's a motion on the floor to change the policy language to remove the word about, um, and a second by council, a motion made by Councilman McCrone, seconded by Council Member Hand. Any further discussion? Um, the motion is for the Council Member Handbook, not the policy. So I don't know if that <coughs> is an issue. The item before you is the council member handbook. That's right. So ch to change the, the policy written within the council member handbook, correct? correct? Okay. So the motion would be to modify the language under or com communications within the council member handbook to remove the word about, correct? Would that be proper? It, it would be to say at 7 p.m. as opposed to on or about. At 7 p.m. That's, that's okay. correct. Thank okay. you. Which means that we have to go back and change the council handbook. Let me turn again. This policy. policy, rather. Yeah, it's much ado about I, nothing. I think it's a distinction without a difference. Yeah. So, yeah. so that, I'm that's really up to the pleasure it. of the I mean, council. I think our intention is clear one way or the other. Okay, any further discussion? Well, if, I mean, I, I just wanna, I guess I wanna weigh in here and just say um, that I understand the, the intention is you know, because it, based on the experience of my time on the council, we have had um, situations where at or about became, you know, much later. Um, and so um, I understand that concern. And so if s saying at gets us closer to, you know, in the seven o'clock range, then, you know, that I understand why this is being brought forward. Um, and so I, I would like to do something that kind of prevents us from, you know, 
creeping into you know far afield of the 7 p.m. Um, time certain, uh, but you know if if and so if at makes it more clear, then I'm you know willing to support that. I don't know that it's going to make a big difference in practice. I agree. Okay. Any further discussion? Yeah. Just uh, what I would. I wonder if it would be uh, acceptable to Councilmember Crone just hearing the desire for there to be potentially a little bit of wiggle room from 7 to 710. I'm not sure if we want to say between 7 and 705 or something, um, or if we just want to stay with a hard 7 o'clock. I'm okay with staying at the hard 7 o'clock, and then just like we did the other evening with the uh, delegate, you know, just I think it would be good. Uh, but I'm open to having to be 7 to 705 so that that window. Okay. Uh, Councilman Matthews? Way too much time on this, but um, it's much easier to control the time since our evening session starts at 7. When oral communications was in the afternoon, there was much more of an opportunity for other hearings to run over and so forth. So if the evening session starts at 7, then saying starting oral communications on or about 7. The only thing is sometimes the afternoon does run on, we take a, a dinner break and we get back at 7.15. So let's deal with reality. I think honor about hits the mark. Okay. Um, any further discussion? I just want to <laughs> state that it doesn't seem like there's been any reason for us to suggest that we're not going to start honor about seven o'clock. <laughs> We've already made those changes. And so I think that until um, it appears that we're starting to drift into the 730, 740 range, that I don't think that there's any reason that we should have to change the language now and then change policy at a subsequent meeting. And so I think that it'd be good if we'd move forward with the way the language is now and if it demonstrates that we need to change in the future that we do so. Okay. So at this point, I'll go ahead. I, I just wanted to make it clear, I mean, what Council Member Brown said that it was uh, this floating target. That, that's, that's the reason yeah, to get sure. specific in the language. Um, but if I'm hearing commitments from all council members, so I'll, I'm gonna withdraw the motion. Okay, so we have a, mis a withdrawn motion. Is there a motion then to uh, accept and move the item? I'll move the item. I'll second that. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Item number 10. Yes, thank you. Uh, so it was brought to my attention that uh, there was this agenda item with regards to the redevelopment or the renovation of the grill at the De La Viega golf course. Um, yesterday in our community programs meeting, we were struggling to find money to allocate the programs that serve underserved communities in our population. And so I'm a little distraught to see that we've spent about $925,000 in renovating the golf course restaurant on the, uh, up at the De La Vega golf course. I feel like uh, if we had had the opportunity to look at the numbers ahead of time, because it's my understanding that currently if there's a purchase that needs to be made, it requires uh, to be over $100,000 for it to come to council. So uh, in order to not only avoid uh, this happening in the future where there is a rather large quantity of money being spent on things that, especially considering our uh, fiscal situation that we just heard about and how we are currently dealing with a deficit <clears throat> and the city is expecting, <clears throat> excuse me, to have to make cuts this year also, that we start really reevaluating and looking at the ways that we're spending our money and reprioritizing it to make sure that we're taking care of the people in our community and the public good, which I believe is not thoroughly uh, achieved by spending close to a million dollars on a infrastructure piece of a golf course that I don't believe the lowest or most vulnerable parts of our community uh, ever use. Okay, is there any member of the public who'd like to speak to us on item number 10 on a consent agenda? Okay, seeing none. Uh, I have, I have okay, so we'll, I have questions. Okay, we'll turn it back to the council for questions and then maybe clarification on the ask around this item. Councilman Brum? Well, I mean, I'll make a, a general comment of concern. I, you know, I share some of, of uh, Council Member um, Glover's concerns about the, um, the the general use of, of city resources for the golf course. However, I understand that this is a particular ask for through, for capital improvement. What I am am uh, particularly concerned about today, and I will raise those when at other opportunities. I will continue to raise those um, in our budget process and when we consider our fee. Uh, structures 
overall of the city um, fee structures. However, today I do want to get some clarification on how it is that we are now being asked for such a significant increase in the the budget for this um, this structure the structural um, improvements here. Um, I mean, it's a it's a pretty significant. Uh, increase um, of six hundred thousand dollars. If I so for f for clarification on your request, is it to be ask staff to staff, come and speak? Yes, okay. please. Um, uh, how, you know how it is that we we're so far off the mark, um, and also in terms of the process, why it is that we're being asked to essentially what I understand is um, approve this. Um, you know, retrospectively, retroactive, retrospectively, um, the money, it seems to me, has been spent and, you know, the, the council was not asked, um, you know, as representatives of the public, okay. if um, we wanted to make that kind of uh, significant commitment, this is um, city property and we obviously have a commitment to maintain um, public um, properties, but, um, you know, we, we weren't asked to prioritize this one over others and, you know, so I just want to get some kind of That's understanding of, of how we got here and, and how it is that maybe this might ha not happen again in the future. So um, if I hear you correctly, there's two questions. One is how um, we got here, and two is um, the request of a retroactive pay. Is that a more or less? Well, it's, it's um, the significant, so the two questions are the, the, the significant difference between the initial amount approved by the council and uh, the, the, co the actual cost, one, and two, um, how it is that we're being asked to, to approve this after the fact, um, you know, without being asked as the, um, this kind of played out. Okay, and it's which staff would be uh, responding? Mark, do we Mark. have you here? Mark Dettel. Okay, thank you, Mark. <coughs> Mark Dettel, Director of Public Works. And unfortunately, we don't have many projects <laughs> like this. Um, this was a project that was, uh, we had a, an active um, operator for 47 years in this building. And when they moved out, um, we did an inspection, ED had a structural inspection of the facility. And it, the inspection, 62-page uh, inspection, so fairly detailed, but yet non-destructive. And they said the building was in, in reasonable shape, but had a lot of deferred maintenance. Well, when we issued a contract to do some of that maintenance and tore some of the um, sheetrock off the walls, we discovered it was in much poorer condition than we originally anticipated. Um, a lot of the piping had deteriorated, some of the structural members had, had deteriorated. And so the budget was originally created based on the original inspection um, and then some of the work had gotten started. Once the amount of work that needed to be done, that kicked it into a whole higher level, had to go to the building department, had a lot of code upgrades, had to install fire and fire sprinklers, um, ADA improvements, and just the uh, magnitude of that project increased. Um, if that had been a contract, um, we would have come back to the to the council immediately and gotten that approval, but we would have been, been back several times because of the change orders that we would have been held to. This project, unfortunately, would have probably been even significantly more. Because we manage this project in-house through our facilities, um, we were able to manage those improvements through our facilities budget hoping to get to the other end where we can we could meet the lease commitments that we had with the new operator and turn that over to them so they could start generating revenue. Unfortunately, you know, it just, unfortunately, this just escalated higher than we would have liked. So I, I share your concerns as far as how do we not do this? How do we not do to get to this point again? And one of the things we'd like to do is if we manage projects like this in the future, We'd like to report back to council on a six month basis where the budget is, where the expenditures are, and what we expect to re the remaining part of that project. Um, I think uh, it was done over several years, so it was done with maintenance funds, which are appropriate as far as facilities, um, but it did consume a lot of our energy and resources. So, thank you. I hope that answers your questions. Yeah, thank you. Does that answer your question for the most part? Yeah. Okay, and it seems like a lesson learned and that's always helpful so we can modify and adjust as needed. Councilmember Crone? A couple <clears throat> more questions. Um, how do we expect to recoup the, uh, the million dollars? Just so folks know, that this is 300,000 that the, the council appropriated at one point 
and then it's kind of 625,000 over budget, but it never came back to the city council for approval of those funds. It was used out of our maintenance funds, which we appropriate from what I understand at budget time. So the funds were just being drawn out of the maintenance funds. And now we're at being asked to replenish it, I guess, into the, the capital improvement. Um, good afternoon, um, Mayor, members of council. I was just going to comment um, as far as the revenue that we receive um, from the De La Vega um, Lodge as well as the pro shop. And um, prior to starting the um, needed improvements and renovations, we were receiving about a, a little under 160, about 159,000 a year. And this is actually with some reduced hours that we had the restaurant at that time closed at 2 p.m. And so the business plan and the model is really looking holistically at both even Shakespeare Santa Cruz and trying to change really the overall attraction of the restaurant as a, as a you know, destination in itself and other events on, on site. So their business model, I, I would expect that when the renovations are complete, the over a million dollars of investment that the Lost a Lots are putting in, in the project, that the revenue return, because we do have a percentage sale on gross sales, will be significantly higher than the 160,000 a year. So roughly within, you know, at, at the very conservative estimate of five years, the city will be repaid for the structural improvements um, and a lot of the deferred maintenance that, um, that had happened over the last you know, 47 years. Um, but I expect that it'll be significantly sooner than that because of the um, improved hours and overall um, appearance and, and attractiveness of the restaurant. Okay. So five years, you think? At the most. Thank you. I have a question for the um, city manager. Um, the uh, Council Member Glover alluded or, or referenced the 100,000. Is that, do you, know about that, like, is there, is there $100,000, anything over that, the city council, it comes back to the city council? Oh, I think what that's, that relates to is the uh, authority that the council, that the, that we have to issue uh, contracts and award contracts, uh, which is 100,000. So, uh, and this is different, this is budget authority. There's budget authority with respect to what's actually allocated in the budget. In this particular case, funds were used from the, the operating budget, the facilities maintenance budget that were allocated and budgeted by the city council. Uh, and we used to make repairs on this uh, project. Uh, what was uh, unusual about it is that we use operating budgets to fund a capital project. So that was where it, was, it, it varied. Uh, however, uh, with respect to your question, the 100,000, that applies to any, any, uh, any project, any contract, whether it's construction or uh, whether it's supplies or services. And so that's, that's a council policy that, that, that you have adopted. So Thank even you. though we may have um, saved some money by doing it in-house, if a contractor had done it, it would have come back to us at every $100,000 along the way? Yes, if if the if there's been an, an well, it depends on yes, and also if in this particular case, if the if the CAP uh, budget was going to be expended and then to be an allocation, no matter what that amount would have been, whether it's fifty thousand or twenty thousand, it would have had okay. had to have been a, an adjustment as well. I bring this to the council because I think it's a really serious serious thing that council members I feel should know about just going forward and and use this information. Okay, Councilmember Matthews. Um, just to give a little context, um, I will say in this particular case, um, I think this was, uh, there's been a lesson learned. It was not an intention to be devious. Anyone who's worked on an old house knows you, you open it up and there's some bad surprises in there. Um, I think this is um, illustrative of the fact that the city has a lot of aging facilities uh, that have often deferred maintenance on them. And uh, when the longtime operator decided that they wanted to retire, the second generation wanted to come on and had um, a, a very energetic forward-looking vision of what the uh, clubhouse and pro shop could be for the community. And bear in mind, it over time became more than just serving the golf course, but came to be serving the disc golf and Shakespeare and with a vision of other, other ways of engaging the community. So they brought that. Um, uh, idea forward with their business plan um, and with the request to extend to create a new um, 
uh, lease arrangement with them with the idea that uh, the city would make the upgrades and they too would make uh, extensive upgrades on the interior in a, in a way that would make this a much more attractive facility for the, the broader community. So um, uh, as I say, in the, in the process, as the uh, difficulties unfolded, um, uh, the other alternative would have been to, to walk <laughs> away from a decrepit facility with a contract written for some people that wanted to invest in it. I mean, so I think it was a sound decision to uh, work with the new operators of the uh, lodge and the pro shop, uh, representing a, a great vision for the future that expanded the use of De La Viega, um, both the, the park and the clubhouse. Um, and in the process, we have brought it ADA accessible, we have made it energy efficient, uh, it'll have a pretty quick payback. So again, just to repeat, I think the lesson's been learned We'll be a little more careful in the reporting and feedback to council, but overall, I think this is a really good project for the community. So um, given all that, um, I'm prepared to move the motion for approval of this recommendation. I'll second. We have a motion by Councilmember Matthews, a second by Councilmember Myers. Any further discussion? Okay. Uh, yes. I was just curious if the staff knew what percentage of the maintenance budget, the 90 or 900 Twenty thousand dollars was. Anybody know? About twenty-five percent, I would say. Um, and just a comment on the hundred thousand. There were over thirty vendors working on this project, so there weren't. There was one large contract that went to council, two hundred seventy thousand. The others were smaller contracts, under a hundred thousand. Right. Okay. Oh, I, I'm just going to continue. Um, if you don't mind, I have another. You have additional questions? I have additional questions and comments with regards to that, yeah. Okay, and then we have a motion on the floor and action and a full agenda ahead, so I'll just remind you all about that. Absolutely, we do have a full agenda ahead, but I believe, uh, just in response to that, that this exemplifies a problematic trend of spending in our city, where of all of the maintenance and budget funds, we're spending 25% of them on the development of a single building that serves a smaller population than the larger portions of the city. And uh, as just admitted by Councilmember Matthews, that the city has a lot of buildings with deferred maintenance. So I'm concerned okay. about the equitable distribution of the maintenance funds and making sure that we're using them in the most beneficial way for the largest population in our community, which is one of the reasons why this is so um, concerning. And um, I had mentioned earlier in the beginning of this, uh, the process, the, the agenda item, that I think that it would behoove the council to be updated whenever there is a purchase uh, of an amount less than 100,000 so that we can be updated. Because if you look at the uh, transcript here of the different accounts and money, it has 15, 33, 46, you know, uh, somewhere in there. So I would make the motion to change the policy so that for budgetary allocations on maintenance and or contracts be reduced from 100,000 to, let's just say 50,000 at least, so that we can get that kind of uh, an update when there's that um, expected expenses coming forward. Uh, Mr. Condotti, and then we already have a motion before, go ahead. Uh, the, the item before you is, is simply uh, transferring funds that are already allocated in your budget. You certainly could change the policy to require council to receive reports when expenditures are over a certain amount. That would be a separate agenda item that we would have to bring back with our existing uh, purchasing policy. So. I'd like to change the motion then uh, to uh, direct staff to come back with a proposed language for a policy change that would make it so that uh, expenses over $50,000 would have to come to the city council for approval. Would that be a friendly amendment? Absolutely not. I'll second it then. Okay, we have a, go ahead, Mr. It's Kandani. a separate, to, it's a separate topic. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I, I would um, suggest, and I'd be happy to distribute a copy of our existing purchasing policies to the council members, and then we could certainly revisit this other future time. that at, uh, okay. on a future agenda. Um, it, it's up to the pleasure of the council as to whether to direct it be brought back now. The concern I have about it a little bit is that I don't know exactly what that policy says. Okay. And so how to do it in a coherent way, um, I, I wouldn't be prepared to offer any advice at this point. Okay, okay, great. So we have, uh, how do you wanna, do you have a motion on the floor? Do you wanna withdraw your motion given the information you've heard from our city attorney? Uh, Can I make a quick comment? 
Uh, my preference would be that we, um, and, and I think it might be worth actually reviewing purchasing policies as a more general review, um, and that we consider that at, at that time, um, because I share your your concerns and, and think that it might be worth just looking at in the bigger picture. Okay, okay, okay Council Member excuse me, Council Member Mack. Oh, with John, Council Member I'd Mack. like to call the vote, if we can, please. Call the question on the, on the original. Okay. So all those in favor of the recommendation for item number 10 moving did, did, forward did, to the I'm sorry. Excuse me. Did somebody second? It's a point of order. Did somebody second the... Um, Councilmember yeah. Matthews yes. made the yeah. question. And now we have a call to question. So all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Nay. So that passes with Councilmember Brown, Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, myself, and Councilmember Myers in support. Councilmember Crone, Glover um, voting against. Okay. The next item on our agenda is item number 13. I'm sorry, item number 12, excuse me. Hold by Council Member Crone, I believe. Yeah, I was approached by uh, several members of the public who uh, would like to um, speak on this, and I said that I would um, pull this. This is a resolution authorizing city managers to execute an encroachment permit to Verizon Wireless for installation and maintenance of underground conduits, vaults, at grade cabinets and wireless canister antennas mounted on utility pole at 117 Morrissey Boulevard within the city's right of way. I would like to hear from the public, but if, if other council members wanna have a question. Okay, are there any members um, here who would like to speak to us on item number 12? Okay, please uh, light up to my left and um, you will have up to two minutes. Two minutes, go ahead. Um, I had previously written and asked for more time because I'm representing the group EMF Aware. I never did hear back. I never, re I didn't receive that request. It didn't oh, come to my I attention. I sent it several times, yeah. Okay. I, so I, I didn't see it, so I don't have it in my record. Oh, okay. for, for So okay. you'll be given two minutes. I apologize Okay, for that. all right. Um, okay, so um, I want to start since I only have two minutes. <laughs> This is a letter I have already sent. Exhibit A, the conditions of approval for this application, the original application states that if one or more of the following conditions is not met, this approval may be revoked. And number five, the applicant shall be responsible for the completeness and accuracy of all forms and submitting materials submitted in connection with this application and that the revocation of any approval permits if this is not the case. So I have found many errors in the report, particularly uh, in regards to the antenna. Both Verizon and Sequoia refer to this antenna as a cantenna. But in the, Hammison, in the Hammett and Edison reports, they claim one amphenol tri-directional panel antenna with one direction activated. So I looked up this serial number they had on the Amphenol website, and, and that model was not listed, could not be found. I found another ser similar serial number, it was not the same one. I, and if that is in fact the correct model, it's not a panel antenna. It's listed as an omni configuration tri-sector antenna, according to the spec sheet with a 360 degree beam width for the radiation. So, I mean, given these discrepancies, I don't know how we can trust the report of the RF specs. I know Hammond and Edison uses a proprietary program to figure the RF, so there's no way to check what they used for the specs. I know none of us are RF specialists, even in the planning department. There's Thank you, and, you're, and you feel free to submit your comments okay. and we could pass them around the council. I started late because of talking to you about the three minutes. No, I don't, I don't believe so, but thank you. We start the comments when you start your, we start the timer when you start. Okay, next please speaker. Please withdraw please. this application. Thank, next speaker, please. Well, point of order. May I just very quickly. Uh, I this did. Is, this is a chance for us to hear from the public I'm at just this point. I, you know, it's a point of order though, I believe. Bec uh, I'm not, I, I believe, but I just want to point out that I, as well as every other council member, did receive a uh, email yesterday at 11.36 a.m. from Ms. O'Ryan requesting additional time to speak. Just want to put that, just want to make, okay. make that clear, it's on the record. I, I thank you for the point of order on that one. I didn't, that didn't come to my attention, nor did it get into the agenda. So I didn't have the three minutes. I'd be, considering that, Porter Moore, I'd be open to having your additional one minute added if you'd like. 
You'll have your additional one minute. Go ahead. We'll, we'll go ahead and come back to you after two minutes. We can add one minute for her. Wait, that's okay. Do you, need, do, you, do you need your additional finish minute? Finish your remarks. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Um, okay, so to pick up where I left off, this this is a, not a panel antennae, as was stated in the Hammond and Edison report. It is a, tr a tri-sector omni, 360 degree beam width antenna. So I see no reference to this antenna anywhere in the planning file, which I looked at personally yesterday. I looked all through the entire file. So given this discrepancy, I don't see how any of the other calculations can be correct or be trusted. So given this fact, I ask that this zoning administrator approval be revoked according to the above provisions of the conditions for approval and that you deny this encroachment permit for the installation. I've said many other things in the letters that I've sent, which I hope you also got, that all of you got. Um, they have many things I don't have time to say now, but others who are here I hope will say. There's a lot of ADA issues involved in this, okay. and those are in my Thank letters you. as well. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next speaker. Mayor Watkins, members of the City Council, I've been asked to read a letter that each of you got a copy of from Nina Beatty. She's too electromagnetically sensitive to be able to be in these chambers, and so I will read parts of it so that I'm at the two minute uh, length. Dear Mayor and City Council, I am disabled by electromagnetic sensitivity, EMS. The proposed cell tower near 117 Morrissey would be an access barrier to me, blocking my access to Morrissey, Soquel Drive, Water Street, and nearby businesses. Despite the well-known disabled minority in Santa Cruz, the city of Santa Cruz has apparently never created policy or practices to accommodate those disabled by EMS in city services and buildings or protect their equal access or even develop a transition plan as delineated in the ADA Title II Technical Assistance Manual. In 2012, Santa Cruz County Health Officer Poki Namkung delivered a report to the Board of Supervisors in response to their request, which evaluated RF health impacts and included acknowledgement of this disabling condition. Where is Santa Cruz? Why the silence? The city has apparently taken no action. It has allowed the downtown area to be increasingly inaccessible for EMS disabled individuals, and now additional small cell towers have been approved at central places such as the Clock Tower and Trader Joe's. These access barriers reduce vitality, diversity, and economic drivers in the downtown and erect a barrier to goods and services for me and people like me. Morrissey is a primary access point into the city and its main arteries from Highway 1. As Verizon and other companies blanket cities with powerful small cell towers in the public's right of way, even though the... Thank you, and, you're, Thank you. and do feel free to leave your comments with our clerk here as well. Thank you. Okay, next speaker. I'm, I'm Drew Lewis, Santa Cruz. Uh, permitting the development of small cell microwave antennas using technology, wavelengths, and energy levels that fall in the category of a class 2B carcinogen as stated by the World Health Organization would be a direct act of chemical trespass, violation of civil rights under the U.S. Constitution, and violation of the Nuremberg Code under the category of medical practices and medical experiments conducted on populations without informed consent. We are dealing with an industry using a technology that has ominous implications for the health and safety of all people and all living things in our communities. The industry forcing this known health hazard on all of us is playing is paying morally challenged scientists and doctors to fake so-called studies on the safety of this technology. They are using tobacco science that cigarette manufacturers use to lie about tobacco cancer length. This class and type of technology is already being used as a military weapon of war and crowd control at higher energy levels. At very high energy levels of power, this same technology and energy form is used to cook food in a 
microwave oven. The California Firefighters Association, CFA, after several years of many documented adverse health effects experimented by firefighters after being exposed to this technology and its microwave radiation, have taken an official position of opposing the stationing of microwave antennas on or near their stations. We had an excellent presentation by doctors and scientists on the adverse health effects of the wireless rollout, and I have sent you links on those presentation. Therefore, I recommend that the city council reject any and all proposals to deploy this very unsafe and untested technology in our communities. Anyone who participates in this crime against humanity Thank will, you. who knows or should have known the health Thank effects you. on the up, general you're population. Welcome your, you're welcome to leave your This comments. technology Excuse be liable me. for all criminal and civil penalties. I, I, and I think it's really unfair that you only minutes. allow three minutes for public comment. Okay, thank you. Next speaker, please. You have two minutes. <clears throat> Dear Santa Cruz City Council members, um, and congratulations uh, to the new mayor and all the new uh, council members. Um, I hope you're enjoying your time now. <laughs> um, my name is Frederick Rico Baker. I'm a Vietnam veteran and a graduate of UCSC. I came to Santa Cruz in 1966 to attend the pioneer class of Stevenson College. I'm here to ask you to look closely at the dangers of approving small cell antennas. By the way, it doesn't mean they're small. They're actually pretty big. Um, uh, specifically, I, I would like you to not approve the encroachment permit for 117 Morrissey Boulevard. I happen to be electromagnetically sensitive, partially due to the EMF and chemical pollution uh, I received in Vietnam, including being exposed to uh, ancient Agent Orange. My wife and I do our shopping at Staff of Life Market, located just across the street from where the antenna is planned to be deployed. This location of a highly energetic EMF antenna will likely interfere with me wanting to continue shopping at this wonderful health food market. Um, you folks on, on this council are where the, the rubber meets the road. This is the place where people like myself can come here and talk to somebody. And I want you to know that you have not only the right, but the duty to uh, when some government agency, and in this case, the FCC happens to be not only uh, owned by big business, but also not really doing its job, which is to protect the people of this state. And, and the state itself has the right to say to one of these um, kind of federal agencies that we don't have to listen to them for their rules. Thank you, thank you. Our next speaker. Mayor Martine and Consul Jackie Griffith. I wish that we were given the chance to finish a sentence if, when, the, when the light comes, just to finish that sentence. Um, I'm not gonna talk about the technical part of this. I'm gonna tell you the story that for the last, oh, 25 years, I've had to bear the same sort of thing that a lot of people give towards the, the EMF, that they don't understand that people are sensitive to it. People didn't understand that I was sensitive to pesticides. But now look, after all the people laughing or pushing, putting you off, now look at what they're talking about or just for Roundup, you know? So we know that even before 5G and all the new small cells, we were not meeting what the European standards are for EMF. Just the whole blanket EMF standards for Europe. I really impel you to listen to the people who have trouble with this because you may be having trouble with this or your children or your elders and not know it until it's much later and just have to bear with the troubles that people are going through from it. So please pay attention and do not approve this new cell um, power <coughs> installation ever. Don't approve any in our public rights of way. We are all people. And you know, 
all of us who were sensitive to pesticides ended up being the canaries in the coal mine. We got it off of the streets div divides. We got it through, you know, the reductions at the city. We got it off the highways here in our county. You know, it could be saving people's lives. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, next speaker. Is there any other folks interested in speaking to this item? Okay. One more. Okay. Go ahead. Hello, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Alyssa Barnes. I'm a longtime community member here. I work at a health food store. I work with People's Health every day. And I am here to encourage you not to go forward with these more technolo technologies like the um, cell tower. I want to explain a little bit about why we're in such a problematic situation with them. The cell tower radiation and radiation from cell phones, smart meters, and um, other radio frequencies, as well as EMF frequencies, even from fluorescent lights and such, are a very different situation than we found ourselves in health-wise in the past. These are not chemicals, as we're used to chemicals creating toxic issues in our bodies. Chemicals have specific actions. The radio frequencies have a more general action on the body, and they layer and they make things worse as the layers come in. So right now we're in a situation where we have many, many layers from personal cell phones and other items. These layers of radiation actually move through the body and they create an issue. It's look, looking like the main problem factor is called the gated voltage uh, calcium channels. And this is a very small area on the cell that does work by an electrical charge. And that electrical charge is um, dysregulated through the radio frequencies. So it's very important, even if you are not now electrically sensitive, that we reduce our exposures. So I encourage you to help the community reduce their exposure by not allowing this cell tower and to look at why it needs to be there and if we can live without it. Because if we can, we will live longer without it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mayor, council members, my name is Tom Davis. I'm a founder and co-owner of, co of Pacific Edge Climbing Gym over in Seabright. Um, I am here to urge you to please take a strong stand against the rollout of all small cells. Um, this is a dangerous and harmful technology in the current rollout of millions more cell towers. So right now the FCC is pushing for 2 million more towers in the United States. We have less than 300,000 right now. Um, it is possibly the greatest threat to life that humans have ever faced if this goes into action. There are a lot of issues with this, but um, the debate is over. This is not opinion. Two thirds of non-industry funded research clearly demonstrates that, <coughs> excuse me, RF and uh, microwave transmitting technology is harmful to people and other living things. Radio frequency and microwave radiation is implicated in numerous cancers, DNA damage, tumors of the heart, which have never been seen before. It's brand new. Um, brain, diabetes, um, as well as infertility and developmental impairment. It is particularly harmful to children, not to mention birds and insects. Think pollinators. We can't live without them. These effects can take decades to appear, and this technology has only been prevalent for about 18 years. This means that the first generation of humans that grew up with this technology are barely reaching childbearing age right now. At the present level of ir irradiation, there is a looming crisis that will cost us our health, our lives, and billions of dollars in healthcare. If these microcells um, are rolled out, 40 per square mile approximately are, are proposed for Santa Cruz County right now. Um, it will be hundreds of times worse. There is no data or studies that cover the levels of radiation we are currently exposed to. We do know that it is millions and millions of times greater than what we experienced in the 1980s. Thank you, and feel free to leave the comments if you'd like to. Okay, Mr. Lanjuni, I think you'll be our last speaker. Uh, good afternoon, council members. Um, so in 1996, the Congress passed the Telecommunications Act, and that did two really negative things. One was that it allowed, it, it, it withdrew the power of the FCC to prevent mergers across media lines. And so as a result now, 22 years later, there's intense consolidation, you know, with a handful of media giants controlling 90% uh, of the media outlets. 
The second thing it did was it handcuffed local communities from, pass from being able to turn down cell tower applications based on health concerns. It just said you can't consider health. It's just like your hands are tied behind your back. So what needs to happen now, and, I, and there are people like Zoe Lofgren, uh, Congresswoman from San Jose, who've been at this for, for a while now, what needs to happen now is civil disobedience on the part of local communities saying, no, we, don't re we recognize democracy means that people in the locality have control over their lives, and we are not gonna be subjecting ourselves to the domination of, of uh, major corporations. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that concludes our last speaker. So at this time, we'll bring it back for action and deliberation. Well, I do have a couple of questions. So we have in the staff report um, a statement that the, a recent FCC ruling, and I understand FCC background and all that, but I'm just reading uh, what, what the circumstances are right now. A recent FCC ruling severely restricts the ability of public entities to regulate small cell installations, et cetera and requires a shortening of the permit approval process for small cell wireless facilities such as this to only 60 days. So what happens if we take no action? It's effectively um, a denial of the permit, which um, under the standards that are applicable would potentially give rise to a, a legal challenge. And uh, what's at Just to hand remind the council that the item before you is an encroachment permit right. for an, so that's, for an that's already issued going. permit. Yeah. So the only issue is an encroachment permit on public land. For right, so the standards for that are essentially, uh, are there adequate provisions to ensure the city against liability in the case of uh, uh, a traffic accident or something of that nature that involves the facility? Um, are there standards to essure that the free flow of pedestrian and vehicular traffic is maintained. Um, those sorts of standards are what are applicable to uh, an encroachment permit and the public works director could, could explain that more eloquently than I could. And just a follow up, if this were a proposal for an installation on private property, we'd have no jurisdiction at all. Is that a correct statement? We have regulatory jurisdiction over proposals on private property. What's unique or what's new about the, the, um, the FCC regulations is the extent to which they curb our ability to uh, regulate installations on public property. Um, so, we, mm -hmm. so we are in the process with the planning department and public works in drafting a new um, wireless facilities ordinance to make it conform to the new FCC order. Um, I imagine, or I understand that will be prepared to roll out later on this spring. We have a, also have a, uh, a limited time period within which to make our ordinance conform to the FCC regulations. And then, um, thank you. Doesn't entirely answer all my questions, but good, good start. <laughs> Cause there are still a lot of unknowns. And then, um, it was pointed out that the uh, strictly on the basis of the application, there are a lot of inaccuracies. And so maybe um, if I could get some sort of answer to that. I, I, I couldn't respond to the technical uh, aspects of it. And a, a whole bunch of inaccuracies were. Yeah, Mike Berry with the planning department. So this was approved at the zoning administrator. The plans that the company submitted were analyzed by the RFN engineer and he, he talked about those plans dated, you know, whatever the date was, July 17. We analyzed those plans and the results of his analysis was that the uh, RF exposure would be less than 1% of what the federal government allows to the general public. And uh, again, this is not on the bigger picture philosophical issues, but it just seems like the um, models of the equipment in the application didn't match up with what's being proposed. And did I hear that? Is that a correct no. reading or not? No, the, <laughs> <Okay. laughs> the plans that were submitted to us for the, that public process were referred to by the RF engineer, including the date that the plans were drawn. And his analysis is based on those plans that were submitted to us. And those are the actual elements that would in fact be installed? Correct. 
So the you're, what you're telling us is there is no inaccuracy in the application. Correct. Between the RF analysis and the plans that were submitted, there's no inaccuracy. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions? Yeah. And just really quick before you go, thank you, Mayor. Um, have you had a chance to engage or discuss the claims of uh, inconsistencies in the report with the community members that have sp very specific items that they've pointed to? Uh, I just got those emails this morning, so no. Okay, and um, is it feasible or possible for us to cross-reference the recommendations from the RF staff member that you mentioned before and the concerns brought by the community and have us re uh, reassess after your analysis? Cross-reference. So they brought up some very specific concerns that they've identified in the application process, mm -hmm. and uh, it seems like your team has not found those inconsistencies. Uh, is it feasible to say that you could then sit with or receive that from the group and then cross-reference your findings with their findings to try to see if you had potentially missed something? Sure. Great. Um, that is wonderful. And then I also just um, on the topic of 5G, want to uh, point to a article in Newsweek that was published in May of 2019 uh, titled Radiation from Cell Phones, Wi-Fi is Hurting the Birds and the Bees, 5G May Make It Worse. Um, and in that document or in that article, they cite that in a new quote, in a new analysis, Eclipse, an EU-funded review body dedicated to policy that may impact biodiversity in the ecosystem, looked over 97 studies on how electromagnetic radiation may affect the environment and concluded this radiation could indeed pose a potential risk to birds and insect orientation and health life. Uh, I think it's really important for us to take that into consideration as well as the uh, health implications that have been reported from our community members as well. Okay. Councilmember Cron and is there any Councilmember Brown? From what um, Councilmember Glover said, I would I would then make a motion that we um, delay this and put this off until our next meeting, where folks c had a chance to sit down with Mike Ferry and, as um, Councilmember Glover said, cross-reference and look at what's actually in the application um, and what they say they're going to do and what, what what's not in the application. Co Mr. Condotti. The one c concern I would have with mm -hmm. that is that I believe the staff report references that this encroachment permit application is also subject to the FCC's uh, permit shot clock. So I would um, would hope to get input from the staff on what the timing of that is. Okay, great. Uh, Council, Council Member uh, Brown. Well, I'd second the motion. Um, we can get clarification, but I'll just second it. Um, and as well, and also just say that I'm, this is, I'm not prepared to um, support, uh, you know, to approve an encroachment permit without some additional information. I mean, there's so much that could be said about that, and I have additional questions, which I won't belabor here. Um, but if you could answer um, on the on the shot clock question, um, I'm I'm not prepared to support the. Uh, we're way over the shot clock. The applicant's been working with us trying to get the um, encroachment and the entitlements. Uh, I wanted to mention one more thing. On all of these applications, after the install is completed, prior to us filing the permit, we do have an RF engineer requirement that they go back out and physically measure the site. And um, all of those have come in just to at where they were modeled. So they'll physically go out before the final of the permit once the machine is turned on and make measurements and report back to us. Okay. We have a motion by Councilmember Crone, a second by Councilmember Brown. Any more further discussion and deliberation and hopefully we can move on. Uh, yeah, I would just, um, I support the motion, first of all, but I wanna just emphasize that while it may be um, illegal or outside of the policy of the FCC for us to resist the EMF transmitters being installed in local places, we have to keep in mind that historically things that are legal or illegal are not necessarily right or wrong. And as Dr. King said, it's our moral obligation to disobey unjust laws. And if that is the case that we need to do it, I feel like it's important that we emphasize that now. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead and... I just wanna say, um, all, yeah, for the for the record that, um, re to reiterate what the, one of the folks at the microphone said, help the community reduce exposure. I think that is the job of the city council and um, can we live without another cell tower in that neighborhood? I think we can. Okay, so, the, so the, there's a motion on the floor to postpone this item and return it at a future time, seconded by 
Councilmember Brown. Question by Councilmember Yes, Matthews. it's a question. So uh, apparently we are already over the 60 day shot clock. Uh, if this were postponed to our very next meeting, simply for clarification of, to satisfy the um, discrepancies that have been brought up um, uh, about the nature on the application. Is that doable in two weeks? And does that in itself expose us to legal uh, risk? We're all ready. Mr. Kondati? I, I, I would defer to the, um, the planning department on uh, returning with the necessary information I, um, as to the exposure to the risk of legal expenses, I would say that it does, but the risk is probably not that great if it's merely a two week deferral. Under the FCC rules, um, the failure to um, meet a shot clock deadline constitutes a presumptive prohibition on the provision of wireless services. So there's not a high standard to, um, to, to overcome for a company to challenge that prohibition. I'd also just remind the council that the, the safety aspects of EMF radiation are specifically excluded from the, the factors that um, cities in employing their local zoning regulations are allowed to take into consideration, um, whatever that's worth. Okay, thanks. I understand that. Um, I'm willing to put it off for, for two weeks to our next meeting simply to clarify the accuracy of the application. And we've been told by staff that they believe it's an accurate application, but there's question in the public. So to resolve that issue specifically, I'm willing to put it off and I understand all the other limitations on our decision. So um, we have a motion to put it off for two weeks, sec by Councilmember Crone, seconded by Councilmember Brown. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. So Councilmember, um, Councilmember Crone, I believe you pulled item number 13. <coughs> That's correct. Um, I was hoping that Rosemary Renard could take mm, two minutes or less even just to show us a few slides of what our $150,000 is going to do in Loch Lomond. I just thought it'd be good for the council to see this because I don't know if we all, I, I really wanted to make a field trip up there and um, didn't get to before this meeting. Okay, we'll have a short maybe overview and... Good afternoon. Um, I just have a few really quick slides. Um, Thank you for, for coming and, and doing that, Rosemary. Um, there we go. Okay, so uh, a number of years ago, uh, I think around eight, uh, we did a, um, a study looking at how to sort of what kind of recreation opportunities and other kinds of uh, programs we wanted to provide at Loch Lomond. At the same time, we did a look at the accessibility improvement needs. So the three areas you see here, uh, this is sort of the parking area and then there's a couple of other spots here that we've done some work on that were identified for accessibility improvements. Um, this is the pre-construction area near the store and the restrooms in the par lower parking lot um, that has that have had work done. So the post uh, includes sort of striping and various kinds of access ramps uh, that you'll see here, uh, appropriate slopes and what have you. And there is a, a new, very popular, accessible sort of uh, kind of projected um, area out here with a really nice picnic table and area that is uh, accessible. So that's been used. Um, the second place is basically the uh, Glencore picnic area. So this is one of our areas that's a little bit further up the road, but has a lot of use. Um, that were some things that were identified in terms of, again, access to the pass. And this is an accessible restroom facility. And these are apparently getting a lot of use by um, people who are using the Loch Lomond facility. And then the last one is the Loch View. This is the one that's on the agenda for today. The Loch View, um, excuse me, it's this one here, upper Loch View area. This is um, gonna have some accessibility upgrades, parking, restrooms. And this is an area that's being used uh, a lot for our school program that we're doing up at there. So um, the, ex the access to the bathroom facilities and what have you in support of the school programs are a really important part of um, what's in this package for 150,000 that's on the agenda for you to take action on today. 
I have some more slides, but I think that probably will do it for you. That's great. Thank you, Rosemary. Any member of the public who would like to address the council on this item, item number 13 of our consent agenda? Okay, seeing none, I'll return to council for action. I will happily uh, move this item, um, motion to approve the plan specifications and contract uh, documents for Lock Loman uh, Recreation Area Upper Lock View accessible improvements and authorize staff to advertise for bids and award the contract in a form to be approved by the city attorney. Okay. Second. second. So we have a motion by council member uh, Crone, uh, second by council member Glover. All those, unless further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nope, that passes unanimously. Okay, um, we are now on to the um, item number 14, which is the second reading and final adoption of ordinances related to accessory dwelling units. Um, I don't believe we have any staff presentation. Is there any member of the public who would like to address the council on this item? Okay, please, uh, to my left, and we will have two minutes. <laughs> Hello, Carol Paul Hamas. Thanks for listening to me again. Um, I built an accessory dwelling unit for my parents in 2003. After their deaths, it has been a long-term rental. It's a below market rental, by the way. My son and I uh, currently have plans in the building department for a second unit at his house, which we were encouraged to submit by planning staff because they were sure that the new looser requirements would be in place a long time ago, which they're not. Um, ADUs, as you know, the city has spent two years trying to figure out how to incentivize people to build ADUs because they cost nothing for the city and they provide housing. I would like to suggest that market rate housing is better than no housing at all because it does increase supply. Insisting that uh, tying affordability to the greater incentives that were um, identified by all the community meetings and making them required to be affordable units will effectively eliminate those units because these units cost a lot to build and it will eliminate our unit. So I would just like to say, um, if affordability is a wonderful goal, maybe homeowners should not be the ones who are required to provide that because if you do require them to provide affordable units, they won't be able to afford to build them. They're just, they're just way too expensive to build. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi everybody, my name is Meryl Lewin and I'm a resident of Santa Cruz. Um, I am in the process of building an ADU. I have stood in this location before. I extended an invitation to most, if not all, of members of the council to come uh, see the dilemma that I'm having and three members of the council have taken me up on that and I really appreciate it, thank you very much. Uh, my concern right now is the parking requirement. Um, I am building a unit for ultimately for my disabled daughter. It's not going to be a money-making venture. And before she moves in, I have a senior citizen friend who is going to stay there until her senior <laughs> housing comes through. So again, not a money-making venture. This is already costing me um, something like $50,000 more than was originally projected when I started the project a year and a half ago. My problem is that current requirements um, are that I destroy the two on-street parking spaces in front of my house in order to provide two off-street parking spaces. Um, this ultimately privatizes two public parking spaces and, you know, which I think is not the goal of this ordinance. Um, it also will cost me $20,000 to $25,000 to do this and destroy my front lawn. Uh, I'm concerned about destroying it for the purposes of um, um, replenishing the underground aquifers. I mean, and it's also nice to have a lawn instead of a parking lot in front of my house. My street has plenty of parking. I know that the parking is an issue in a lot of places in Santa Cruz, but not on my street. I've lived there for 25 years and there's always been ample parking. So I'm asking that um, the parking requirement either be dropped or uh, possibly uh, looked at on a site-by-site -site basis, because that would really help me out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Speaker. Uh, Tim will be speaking for affordable housing now. Uh, as I said last time at the last meeting, affordable housing now supports these incentives. Uh, we think they're very valuable. Uh, in producing more ADUs. 
Uh, there was some confusion, I think, at the last meeting about uh, affordability and ADUs. Uh, and I think it was forgotten that the city does have an affordability plan uh, in partnership with uh, Habitat for Humanity. It's a wonderful program where uh, the senior uh, has a, f uh, a unit built uh, in conjunction with, um, with that. And then the, the house is refurbished. And so the senior gets to live there and a new family gets to move in. And so you already have a program. Uh, I believe there are three units that have been, that are in the process of being built at this time since that was approved. Uh, but in the long term, uh, having more ADUs is really important to stabilizing our rental prop our rentals um, because you're adding more rentals at a time when you may be losing them over the next decade. So these are very important. It's a very important thing to incentivize them. And so we support this. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, are you planning to speak to this item? Okay, is there any other member of the public interested in speaking to this item? Okay, um, you'll be all right. I, I don't know if you got my email, but there's a little discrepancy with the city code and the state code. State code says that any ADU within a half a mile of transit is exempt from a new parking requirement. The city has that in its code, but it, then it goes on to define what transit means. It defines transit as the Metro Center and Pacific Avenue. So for instance, this is at my house, I'm living near, near, at, near Bay and Mission, closest to the best transit in the whole county with buses about every 10 to 15 minutes. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't be exempted. I, I need to live within half a mile Metro Center. So I'd ask you to please correct that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'll return it back to uh, questions and action. Councilman Matthews. Well, this is the second reading of what we arrived at after a very long meeting and a long discussion. And um, uh, I will, be happy to make a motion to approve this, but uh, in the, as a result of that long discussion, there were some components of incentives and changes that were deferred with direction to link them to affordability or to consider linking them to affordability. So I'm just wondering from staff, what's the timeline on that if I have understood it correctly? Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Lee Butler, the Planning Director. And it, really, when we're talking about outreach and analysis, the, the fastest that we can get something back in front of the Council is about five months' time. Um, when we're talking about ADUs, we've got another legislative cycle that we'll be considering. So um, five months from now um, would put us in July, which um, you know, there's no council meetings, which puts us into August for council. The state bills are passed in August um, for the governor's signature in September. There may be some changes associated with that rather than bringing two packages back on similar items. Uh, we would likely be in the time frame of of late this year by the time we're back with a comprehensive set of information that evaluates the affordability as well as um, has conducted uh, community outreach and, and done research into the issues and also accommodated the uh, changes that we're likely to see from the state. Okay, uh, that does answer my question. So I feel strongly that we should go ahead with what we've got and we understand what the horizon is for um, considering future changes. So um, with that, I'll just go ahead and move the motion before us for the second reading. Okay, I'll second that. I just have a quick question for Mr. Condotti in regards to the public transit <coughs> definition um, as brought up by an email we received and yes, how and, we define and that. <clears throat> with apologies to Mr. Longinotti, I, I did receive his email and I didn't have a chance to re reply to it um, between yesterday and today. But uh, in, in the email, as you will recall, Mr. Longinotti makes the argument that that the the current definition of public transit that's used in your zoning code is inconsistent with the state law requirement that we not require parking spaces for an ADU if it's located within half a mile of public transit. And the last round of updates that the council did with regard to this, um, the term public transit was defined very narrowly to mean just the transit district. Um, unfortunately, Public transit was not a term that was defined in the state statute. And Mr. Longinotti cites um, some guidance that was put out by the state um, Department of Housing and Community Development that suggests that a broader interpretation should be used. Um, 
I think it's risky to use a, a state agency's interpretive guidance as a, as a means of uh, determining what the legislature's intent was. But it seems to me that a court, if this issue were brought up, would likely conclude that the term public transit doesn't really need a, a technical deficit definition. I think he's got a pretty good argument that um, our definition is too narrow. Okay. You might recall that the original draft that was brought before you would have changed that and made um, that narrow definition only apply to a second ADU uh, on, a, on an existing parcel. So. Okay. Council Member Myers. So if we made a, just maybe this is a question for uh, Director Butler, um, if there was any corrections to this existing version, uh, this, this would then become the first reading again, is that correct? I just wanna confirm that. That's right. Yes, that's correct. Okay. You could, however, direct that um, the staff bring back that particular mm -hmm. amendment for introduction at the next meeting? Yeah, I, I, I would like to, I, I think there's, um, and, and I guess uh, I have a question about, I was one of the council members that visited the site previously mentioned. Um, is there a process by which uh, not to add more uh, workload to the planning department and trying to get ADUs? Um, I'm disappointed obviously that based on some of the feedback that we received uh, last at the last meeting, that we have again delayed um, the production of a very important uh, housing supply in our in our community, uh, in my opinion, um, because we weren't able to get um, some of these changes um, ready to go. And, and I know people are waiting. I know we have a lot of, of uh, proposed ADUs sitting in the wings right now. Um, so I guess, yeah, I'd like to understand uh, if we can come up, and especially in regards to the jump bikes, which I think are a new recognized public transit opportunity now. Um, we have stations all over the city now, so I think I think there's reason to look at that definition. And I'm also just wondering your feedback on this off-street parking requirement. Is there any kind of review process or anything that we could um, accommodate so that uh, you know, we can we can look at that that affordability factor uh, of having to build parking spaces in, in the neighborhood of twenty to twenty five thousand dollars. So, if you can just give me some feedback, if that's appropriate, maybe I'll just add to the question. My understanding, because I I walked by the location of that place, is that that would be in the range of the public transit potential if that modification came up at a future time. Correct. I don't know about the specific location of the commenter's um, residence. Um, however, um, a couple points. One, um, as the council's aware, you know, staff was recommending that um, the parking not be required. Um, and right now it is only required for detached um, new ADUs and um, staff was recommending that that um, just uh, that it would only apply in the instance of a second ADU on a property. Um, and that would have addressed that potential inconsistency and um, issues uh, like the commenters. Um, as far as uh, potential options, um, there are certainly ways to um, modify the code to address issues like this and to, um, to come up with provisions, whether it's uh, distance to a bike share station or modifications to the definition of public transit um, that uh, we currently have in our code. So there's certainly things that we can do. Um, as far as a process that's in place right now, there isn't one, there, there is a process for it, but the findings for such a, a process could not be made. You know, a variance requires very specific findings. And so uh, really we would need a code amendment in order to address um, this type of situation and um, if that's the will of the council, then we can certainly look at uh, options to do that. Okay, so we have a motion by Councilmember Matthews to move the recommendation, seconded by myself. Was that a friendly amendment to return at a future time in terms of the definition of um, if that's appropriate, if that's acceptable? Seems to me there are a couple of other definitions. Um, I think what I... I understand, I understand, appreciate, and am sympathetic with this. Um, we got a lot on our plate. Uh, I think I'd rather just pass this clean, but the, those few people who are interested work on it with planning director and, and come back with a suggestion. Is that 
Tim. I, is that workable? Well, I, I, uh, you, you'd rather have direction. Yeah, I, 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 have, a uh, I have a suggestion. I, I don't know, Bonnie, could you uh, maybe put that up if you get a chance? Um, Mr. Just Mr. in talking. If I could, I just didn't know. I think, were you, were you trying to intervene there? Well, just to reiterate, um, the, Sorry. the removal of the requirement that, that um, the ADU be within a certain proximity of the Metro Center mm -hmm. was proposed in the language that was brought to you at the last meeting. It's not here because the council didn't adopt it, but for purposes of moving forward with it, since it has already been reviewed on, uh, and recommended recommendations um, thereon have been made by the Planning Commission. We would not need okay. to go back to the Planning Commission for that for that particular modification. So essentially, that you're saying that would be the path of least resistance, if I hear you, in terms of moving forward, if we wanted to make that change today. For sure, and if the council doesn't want to delay the implementation of these ordinances, you could move forward and direct staff to return with that amendment at. A future meeting. I'm happy to incorporate that in the motion. Okay, so the motion is That's, okay, uh, and I'll accept yes. that, and that encompasses yours. Okay, Mr. Uh, Councilmember Crone. Thank you. Uh, just listening to everybody and having extensive conversations with staff and with m members of the community, that the parking issue is a really big issue um, and an impediment against uh, building ADUs, uh, even for people who are very wary of. Of, of going without parking um, and not requiring parking for the ADU, they um, may be in favor of what I've, what I've outlined here. And I'm, I'm asking for a one year uh, to look at this. Uh, I move to amend the ordinances 2019-03, 2019-04 to remove the parking requirement for a new construction detached accessory dwelling units. Additionally, direct staff to return to city council in one year with a report on the status of the ADU program, including statistics on the number of ADUs produced over the next 12 months and the number of those ADUs that are uh, new construction detached units and the number of parking complaints received from neighbors of the new ADUs. The report should also consider the potential for requiring on-street parking for particular zoned areas. Following that report, council could elect to either continue the parking exemption or return the municipal, to, uh, the municipal code to its current wording requir requiring off-street parking for these units. That would be a, um, an, a friendly amendment if it's a friendly, but um, if it's not, I... Uh, because this has just gone on so long and I, I think we've all sort of like wrangled with it and you know, requiring parking, not requiring parking, but I just thought maybe um, a middle ground would be to really scrupulously chart what happens over the next year. Do we get hundreds of applications? Do we get, we, right now I think we're at 50 or something a, a year, 40, 50. Um, and if we get lots of complaints and, and there's areas of the city that you can actually park in, in um, where there's lots of on-street parking and there's some that are really impacted, like say Seabright neighborhood, for example. Um, so I would like to see, you know, a, a trial period and how, you know, how many ADUs actually get built and can we relieve um, the woman who's, who came to the microphone, Ms. Lewin, I mean, an extra $22,000 for two parking spaces um, it, it, and she's got to rip up her yard. So I'm just putting this out there. I'm looking for a second. I'll second that. Okay, I'll just go ahead. Was that a friendly amendment or a second? No. Well, it's a friendly, friendly amendment. Is it a friendly amendment? No. no. So we have a motion on the floor um, <coughs> by Councilmember Crone, seconded by uh, Vice Mayor Cummings to add this additional language um, as, as presented here. Okay. If you have a question, Mr. Kondati, did you want to add? I'm wondering if The only concern I have is that the language is not in front of you. Mm -hmm. But it hasn't so been published. Of the municipal code provision. Mm. Um, I mean, that's clear direction, but for, for, but for purposes of introducing the ordinance at, at today's meeting, that language isn't in front of you. So a potential next step could be for Council Member Crone to work with another Council Member essentially to bring that forward at a future time? Is that it's always, um, it's always risky when I do this, but I was hoping that I could try to come up with some language if that's the, the direction. Oh, if I, can I make a, just ask a question to try to clarify okay. this while you're attempting to. And then Council Member um, 
Matthew's after. So I, what I'm getting here is I mean, there are a couple of um, potential changes that would require um, co coming back, uh, one around the um, transit um, transit center versus transit corridor language, and then Council Member Crone's um, proposal here. And my understanding is the cleanest way to do that would be to direct staff to come back to us with those, potentially those two changes if we have a council member majority agreement about that. Um, so I don't know if it might be worth rec suggesting we split the two and just move the, the ordinance and then do the other work separately to just kind of get through this. Uh, okay. Great. Yeah. So we, so we have, uh, the next step then for him to withdraw his motion temporarily while we address the original. That could be uh, a friendly amendment if it's acceptable to the maker and the maker of the second. Is that acceptable? No, no I mean, I, w I would like to vote on this today. I mean, what's, what, why, why shouldn't we move? You know, we've, we've, this has been part of the conversation. It's not that we're not, um, we're doing something different. I mean, it's, we've, I'll we've have been Council dealing. Brown explain I, just, to, just to clarify, I'm not suggesting that we not do it today. I'm just suggesting that we, um, I mean, we could we could vote on this now. I'll vote on it now and then vote on the other one. But I'm just suggesting splitting them so that we can just get through it as without having a whole bunch of, well, maybe we will still have discussion, but I'm just trying to be efficient here. Councilmember Matthews. It would seem to me the cleanest thing if people are agreeable is to vote on the second reading and then consider future direction. Regarding the future direction, it's true that we've hashed over a lot of this and it has resulted in punting. Uh, I also wanna ask, it, th this, this is a pretty, um, has a lot of elements to it. I believe we've already asked for, for a report in about a year on the um, experience with the new ADU ordinance. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, uh, Sarah Noisy with the yeah. planning department. Um, we are planning to come back in about a year to report back on um, any changes in production that we've seen and sort it's of what- a result of our yes. new- Yes, yeah, exactly. And, and tracking the interventions. I remember right, yeah, tracking try, the trying to track, you know, if there was a, uh, you know, a, yeah. a key change that sort of tipped people over the edge to being able to build. Okay, okay so okay. that's already in place, just to say that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think the um, the, if we give direction to come back with a, um, change in the definition of proximity to transit, um, and we do that at our next meeting. That is a game changer, and that that can all be folded into our experience. Um, that may be significant, but and also we are about to launch uh, apparently a rental task force, which we're looking at a variety of issues related to rental housing, and certainly the incentives disincentives for. Uh, ADUs is a big part of rental housing supply. So it, um, it just seems to me that a lot of this is, is really implicit in what we already have moving forward. Okay. Councilmember Glover. I think um, I'm just, from what I'm hearing, it seems like we, I don't know if this is a middle ground or, or something that can appease both of the people, you know, all the people, but <clears throat> so that we can move forward and adopt the things for the second reading, could, um, uh, to ask Councilman Crone, would you be okay with changing your motion to move to adopt the second reading of the ordinances and then instruct staff to come back with analysis of, or a uh, first reading of the removing of parking requirements and the re, uh, definition or the redefining of transit corridors and some of the other things that we've been talking about? Yes. I'll just say that we already have, we have two motions on the floor essentially. So one is to do, and but first motion was made by, by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Councilmember Myers to essentially move the recommendation right. and add a direction around uh, the transit, transit uh, potential uh, yes. coming back. We can, that's the motion on the floor. Then we had a second motion by Council Member Crone with these additional direct directives seconded by by Council Member Brown. Vice Mayor Cummings. Vice Mayor Cummings. I'm sorry, Vice Mayor Cummings. Okay, so um, that motion, I think um, we could vote on that and then just go to the original motion because that's how the, the order of process is, correct, Tony? So this is gonna be an amendment? No, this will oh, be a separate, separate motion, motion that we'll motion. vote on first and then the original motion, let's, Aren't you supposed to vote with the original motion first? Is it or is it there? No, if there's an amend, uh, if there's a motion to amend, then vote you need to vote on the, 
There's, a, there's an amendment. Right. This but is a, this is a second motion. No. It's as a substitute motion. Yeah. So we vote on the substitute motion, correct? Okay. Okay, so we'll vote on the substitute motion, which is essentially. Okay. I, I do, Emily, did you have a comment? Sure, go ahead. I, I do just want to emphasize that I, there is a, a distinction between the original motion and what Councilmember Crone is bringing forward because this adds some very specific analysis in what we'll be looking for. I appreciate that staff is already planning on doing a, an annual report, but I'm not sure if all of the things laid out in Councilmember Crone's motion are included in that report. Can, do you know if they are or? Uh, yeah, Specifically? So at, at this point, we weren't going to be looking at parking, and so this motion would add to that charge, that report back, um, to look specifically at parking and parking complaints and parking impacts. And that's why it's important, I feel, that, I, that we find a way to m mesh them so that we get the definitions, we pass the existing language, and we have the instructions for staff for these very specific analysis around parking. So that's what I'm trying to get to, is bringing everything together so we can all accomplish what we want at the same time. Vice Mayor Cummings, and then Councilmember Matthews. And then I agree. I think that, you know, ultimately, if we can pass the first piece of this ordinance and then direct staff to include these data metrics for measuring impact and then come back to this in a year with a report back on that, I think that that would be um, something that I'd be interested in, in doing. So are you proposing that modification to the substitute motion that you seconded on behalf of Councilmember that, Yes. But are, are you saying that um, you, I'm confused, um, you do want to lift the parking requirement uh, for ADUs? Yes. Okay, so that, I mean, that, I, I would just say that we should vote on the amendment and then vote on the main motion um, and, and a, as a package. Matthews. Talk about confusion. Yeah. I am confused. So this is a motion to amend ordinances to remove parking requirements for new construction, detached accessory dwelling units, not all ADUs. Um, and it would be to bring back for consideration that, but the motion also includes additional study, directing staff to study the effects of the following and report back in four months, a whole business about doing renovations under the code under which the, the um, original ADU was built. And I mean, think what we're asking our parking, our planning staff to do. And we, they spent a year and a half working on ADUs. They brought us a very complete package as existing prior council members know that got punted to three separate yeah. meetings. Yeah. And we got a lot of stuff on our plate. Um, this is adding yet more study on yet more issues. I just put that out there. So I'm going to vote against it. I mean, I'm, we could go ahead and move forward. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm only, we're only voting on the motion to amend the city. But, you know, the rest, I think, what she was referring to, that's another part of Do you want to restate this. your motion then? I don't know. If you're, are, you are you changing your motion then? No. I, the motion I, I, is the full document, correct? No, the motion is, uh, it's. First paragraph. The motion is right here, and then we're, well, the additional study will come to, from direction to staff. When? Well, right after we pass the, this before we vote on the main motion. I, I, I did not, um, this is a whole discussion here on AB 20, 1226, which I wanted to ask staff about. Mr. Condotti. I was going to say at the risk of testing everyone's patience, could we get the motion restated? Is it verbatim of what's printed up there? Um, the first paragraph? If we want to like just have the motion that we're making to um, uh, lift the parking requirement for accessory dwelling units, then it's just that first paragraph. If I may offer, there's Additional one. Additional study, no. There's one typo in there. It's so at the third line from the bottom, it says potential for requiring on-street parking, and that should say off-street parking. I, I think that's not what's. Oh. Is that is that correct? Councilmember Crone. Report should also consider the potential for requiring off-street parking in particular zoned areas. Because we don't typically, the city doesn't require any on-street street parking. parking. We don't right. require that. that, that uh, yes, okay. it, would, it would just follow the parking program that we already have in place, uh, the permit parking. Okay. 
So that's I'm lost. a motion by Councilmember uh, Crone, seconded by off street, yeah. Vice Mayor and, uh, Cummings. I'm, I'm changing it to off street to, on recommendation With the modification staff, yes. of changing it to off street parking. Bonnie. Before you vote, I just have a question. Um, this addresses two ordinances, and there were three introduced. So are the, you the third ordinance does not cover parking. So this but would be the, his motion should include the third ordinance, right? No, because it wouldn't amend that any further. So this would then, I thought this was a substitute motion. This is the substitute motion. Well, that's what I was trying to get clarity on, but I, I, I would interpret the motion as the council voting to amend these ordinances by today's action, which would mean we bring second them back right. for a second reading at the next meeting, uh, as opposed to directing staff to bring just the parking amendments back for introduction at, at the, the second meeting, meeting, which would postpone the item further. Okay, so uh, I think we have clarity at this point. All those in favor of the substitute motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. 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 So that passes with uh, Council Member Crone, Glover, uh, Brown, and Cummings in support of the motion presented with Council Member Matthews, Myers, and myself voting against. Do you have a question? 2019 is adopted. And that would leave 2019 adopted essentially by, well, no, we would make the motion. You now go back to the original motion. motion. Yeah. Which would now only apply to, to. No, it would apply to all three. all three. You have a lot of stuff to adapt. This is one amendment that was made to two of the ordinances that addresses parking. So we and you need to adopt the other three. Okay. So the. So do you want to restate your motion, David? Uh, it's not the motion I intended, but I think it would be that we um, uh, give direction to bring back for a second reading the language proposed at this meeting plus changes, uh, additional changes to the ordinance that would remove the parking requirement for new construction detached accessory dwelling units. Period. Um, in terms of an ordinance, that's what it is. Second. Okay. So just for clarity. Yeah. Bring back for second reading um, Amendment to section 2416.142, which is section six of ordinance 2019-04, which currently spells out the parking requirements for uh, each accessory dwelling unit. Um, that would be revised from the reference to historic districts and location to, or proximity to Metro Center, et cetera and it would be revised to say no parking is required for accessory dwelling units. I'm gonna vote against the motion. I'm, I'm gonna withdraw my motion. It's just going in a direction I feel is way too messy. So I'll let someone else take a crack at it. Okay. Okay, so. I, I will move the motion. And your motion is to? <laughs> move the, um, what was the second reading, which will now be the first reading, in addition to um, the motion not requiring parking um, on ADUs. At Excuse all. me. Ado uh, adopt ordinance number 201903 pertaining to locations permitting ADUs and parking standards. Uh, adopt ordinance number 201904 pertaining to ADU permit procedures, occupancy requirements, and definitions. And adopt ordinance number 2019 05 pertaining to ADU site standards and building requirements. Uh, so Councilmember Brown, just a quick um, clarification, and that are you including the? So we already have included the one-year review, so yes. that's already covered. Yeah, we don't have to it. cover yes. it again. Okay. There's a motion. So again, just not to beat a dead horse, but we're introducing ordinances numbers uh, 2019-03 and 04, and adopting final adopting or finally adopting ordinance 2019-05. My understanding is that we so already moved. made the amendment based on the prior vote. That's what I thought too. So, the, yeah. so this is now, so that has been, that action has been taken in that past as a 4-3 vote. So now the next motion, the mo next action needed to be taken includes what? <laughs> just the other 2019-05. Prove what I just read. We already, we already. 
So there should be one more. Second part of it. So that covered. So why don't, um, would it work to say that we will do a new first reading Today. incorporating the amendments we've discussed about parking? Right. Um, and we will bring those back, all three ordinances back for a second reading at the next meeting. Is that an accurate motion? If that's complicated by having three that's ordinances. that's the pleasure, pleasure of the council. The, the action uh, contemplated by the motion does not require an amendment to ordinance 2019-05. Right, because it parking isn't covered in 05. Today, today. Yeah. Okay, so the, okay, the motion so, that we okay, speak so is we, to ha adopt. So how I interpreted the action was <laughs> to introduce 03 and 04 today with the modifications proposed and to finally adopt 05. So the 03 and 04 has already been adopted based on the prior action? No. The substitute action? They no. were amended okay. by gotcha. the prior action. Okay, got it. Okay, is that the motion you're making, Ms. Councilmember Cohn? So is this um, lifting the parking requirement is gonna come back to us next time, but... For a second reading. But the main motion is going to be approved today. Just of 05. Or the whole thing is gonna come back. Five. Five. No, because you're amending 03 and 04 today. No. That's oh, what the motion okay. proposes to do. And, and there's so a lot of other stuff in those two ordinances. I mean, I think overall the end result is we will have one unified ordinance in about six weeks. Okay, so and is that, is that okay. okay? Yeah. Okay, so we have a motion by Councilmember Crone. Second. I will, okay. seconded by Councilmember Glover. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. That passes. Yes. Okay, so that passes <laughs> with Brown, Vice Mayor Cummings, uh, Crone, Glover, Myers, and myself in support of with Councilmember Matthews voting again. Okay. All right. So we have our downtown employee commute survey results and transportation item. Maybe we'll just take maybe a two minute, three take minute break. Yeah. And I have no idea what motion we just have. Could you log me on? Do you want to know? Um, yeah, please. You need a log. Or chamber staff, you don't? Password is incorrect, try again. Oh. Just, just when it comes back up, you should log off. <laughs> good job, Johnny. That was good. I knew what everyone was trying to say. Then they are like, here, okay, this, we amended these, we're just going to adopt this, vote on it. <laughs>
Good afternoon. My name is Jim Byrne. I'm the transportation manager, and Claire Fleeser is here, a transportation planner for the city. Okay, we're going to go ahead and start the meeting again. We're back in session, and we'll go ahead and thank you. We have our staff presentation at this time. Go ahead. We are really excited to be here to present and to actually move forward with uh, uh, this next piece of Go Santa Cruz, uh, which is a fancy way of saying transportation demand management or TDM. Those are all interchangeable throughout this. Uh, the, what you'll see today is a direct result of the action taken on June 19th, where a, a parking rate strategy was adopted that identified dedicated funding for TDM for, the, for at least the next five years and hopefully beyond. Um, so we're just really excited to move forward on this. When we presented it at the commission, one of the commissioners thought it was like Christmas. Uh, this should be a really great item. And um, here we go. So good afternoon. As Jim mentioned, I'm Claire Fleisler, Transportation Planner. Brief overview. I know you have a packed agenda, so I'll try to make it um, quick for you. Um, we're going to go through what transportation demand management is, just high level, the background of our approach and how we came to the proposed program we're presenting to you today, a review of our second annual downtown employee commute survey, and finally get to our staff recommendations and hopefully implementation of a really, really amazing program. So transportation demand management broadly is just using our transportation system more efficiently, using both our roadway capacity and our parking capacity more efficiently. Our whole goals around this are to maximize the utilization of our existing parking supply to save as many parking spaces as possible by offering alternatives, to maximize mobility for our downtown employees, to maximize options for them to get downtown while minimizing congestion and minimizing greenhouse gas emissions. Our approach to TDM in Santa Cruz is we call it meet people where they are, recognizing that there's no one size fits all or silver bullet solution that's going to be the right answer to all employees at all times. We really want to support our downtown employees with options and incentives that work for their lifestyles, recognizing that we have everyone from office workers to administrators and from baristas to bartenders, a whole wide variety of individuals who make up our downtown workforce. Um, our goal around this and the the focus of our commute survey recommendations are to focus on where we can move the needle. And the big thing here is focusing on our office employees and our drive alone employees. The second one, the people who are driving, those are the people who we want to encourage to switch modes. They're the ones who are coming downtown and we want to offer them an alternative. Um, and then focusing on office employees, and this is a, a generalized term for those folks that have a regular Monday through Friday nine to five schedule. It's a lot easier to encourage habit building changes when you have a regular schedule that you can build around. If every morning you can take the 8 a.m. bus and you can take the 6 p.m. bus home, that's a lot easier than having shift work where uh, some weekdays you have to take a different one and some weekends you take a different one. It's much harder to build a habit around that. Also, focusing on the modes that have the most interest. Rather than tell folks that there's only one solution that's gonna work for them and we're dictating that this is the right answer, we wanna offer a wide variety of solutions that some people may say, biking is a thing that interests me and I wanna try that, and others may say, carpooling with someone that lives near me and works near me might be the right solution for me. And finally, focusing on the top motivations, thinking about what is going to be the thing that's going to encourage and incentivize people to change modes and focusing on those behavioral-based incentives. We did a second annual downtown employee survey this past fall, and the results of it are really exciting. We'd done the first one in 2017, and after we got council direction in September of 2018, we moved forward in November and December with our second annual downtown employee commute survey. What we found was that 61% of downtown employees drive alone. This is significantly lower than the national average. And the next two things that are in a yellow box were the most exciting to me. Um, you may have gotten the press release we put out last week that the city of Santa Cruz has the second highest rate of bicycle commuting in the United States of America. This is huge, we're excited about it, and citywide we're at 13.2%. In our downtown, we're at 16 and percent of people who bike, and this statistic is just astronomical, and we really wanna make sure that we're focusing on where we've seen success and where we can continue to build. Um, overall, you can see the rest of our mode splits here, but our overall program goal is to reduce our drive alone mode split to 50% or below. This would be resounding success for us, and it's something that we're gonna continue to working towards, and it's what this program is built around. When we did our downtown employee commute survey, we asked people um, 
a lot of questions about their commutes. Um, some of them were, how do you currently get downtown now? So this is just a summary of the top three modes. It's driving alone, biking, and then walking. And then we also ask questions about when and how they travel and what their work schedules look like so that we can really build our program around that. So on average, 68% of our survey respondents work full time. This is, again, that regular repeated schedule that we're able to build around. 50% start work in that AM peak period of transportation, where we do have higher levels of transit service, and knowing that we have 50% of people coming downtown at the same time, that enables programs like carpooling. And finally, 47% of our downtown employees commute three miles or less. And what this means is a 20 minute bike ride. It means that we're looking at what programs are actually feasible for our downtown employees and really getting to know what that workforce looks like so we can build our TDM program around that. In our opportunities groups that we identified, the first was drive alone and the second was office. This first snapshot, again, 68% work in, um, work in offices. Um, they start work between uh, 6 and 9 a.m., again, a high percentage that's in that a.m. peak, and half live within five miles. It's a little bit of a further bike ride, more like a 40-minute bike ride, but still achievable if you feel like doing it. Um, and the top alternatives, when we ask people, how would you think about getting downtown? What mode would you be interested in trying? The top was biking, the second was carpooling, and the third was motorcycle, and that third one was surprising to me. Looking at all office employees, 81% um, of our office employees work full time. Again, regular, repeated schedule, habit building. 65% um, start in that AM peak commute period. Carpooling becomes a, a big choice that you can make. And 71% live within that five miles. Top alternatives um, for our all office employees that they were interested in trying, again, biking was the top choice. Carpooling was the second choice. And walking was the third choice here. So looking at matching programs to what people are willing to try. We ask people, when you drive to work, why do you do it? What are, what are the most important reasons? And so we could start to get around motivations that we could look at behavior change. And we asked them to ranked choice. They had a bunch of choices in front of them. And the top choice that we heard um, in both the top choice, the second choice, and the third choice was that riding the bus is inconvenient or takes too long. Um, people were identifying that transit didn't feel like a choice to them. Um, at the same time, there were people who identified that transit was a choice for them. And so recognizing that there's this variety of experiences, but being sensitive that um, many people feel like transit is not an alternative for them. I'll get into this more later, but um, just to preface, none of the scenarios that will be before you today include any increase in transit service. So identification here that riding the bus is inconvenient or takes too long, that it doesn't come frequently enough or run late enough or go where they need to go is not addressed in any of the scenarios we're gonna present to you and is the largest barrier that was identified to people taking transit. Claire, excuse me, Claire, it was were students a category excuse, that were Council that Council was- Crone, um, Excuse me, Councilmember Crone. I'd like to have a council, the presentation and then hold for questions by all council. And if you can, please address me directly. I'm just wondering if students were a category. I, I realize that you have a question, but if, if we can, we'll finish up her presentation and then you can ask your questions and you can go through me for your questions, okay? Thank you. I appreciate your respect in that way. Um, continuing on, we also asked people what, and this is for the entire universe of survey respondents, what alternative mode would you be interested in trying? If driving became prohibitively expensive or inconvenient, what would you switch to? And over 50% of survey respondents said that biking was the thing that they would try. Um, the next most popular option was walking, followed by carpooling and van pooling. Again, asking people what are the options that you would try and matching the proposed program to that. We also ask people, what would encourage you to use alternative transportation? What are the things that we can do to incentivize this mode shift and make it worth it to you? We know that as long as driving is the fastest, most convenient, most affordable option, with, with the least amount of barriers, people are gonna continue to do that. So what would be the thing that would change your mind, change your behavior? And by and large, what we heard was financial incentives um, and saving time. And so being able to show that alternative transportation is time competitive with other modes, all things considered, including the time spent parking, as well as what financial incentives could we give people that would make it so that they're not paying for parking. Instead, maybe they have a bike share membership or a transit pass. So looking at those things that would really meet their needs and encourage them to try something new. Now we get into our staff recommendations. Um, so to recap, on September 11th was when council uh, made the recommendation to approve the updated parking rates strategy, which established a recommended program budget of $300,000. 
um, staff took this number, $300,000, and we deployed our second annual downtown employee commute survey. We took the results of that and we developed three scenarios, um, which this should read scenario one, two, three, and four. I translated this from Google Slides to PowerPoint. Um, so scenarios, scenario one is bike focused, scenario two is bus only, scenario three is multimodal, and scenario four is a downtown commission recommendation. Um, the first three scenarios, bike, bus, and multimodal, were the staff generated scenarios that we presented to the downtown commission. All three of those are more or less within that $300,000 identified budget that we were working within. The fourth scenario, the downtown commission recommendation, is um, essentially a combination of scenarios two and three, and it um, recommends a program budget of $585,000. And uh, before I get into the scenarios to reiterate, because transit will likely be the thing that we spend the most time talking about today, none of these scenarios include any increase in transit service, frequency, or coverage. Scenario one, invest in biking. This was um, not our staff recommendation, but is the most heavily aligned with what the survey results said, that biking was the most popular mode that people would be willing to try and that uh, biking would work for many, many people. The specifics of this scenario are included in your staff report, but recognizing that we have a packed agenda, I'll move past this to the ones I think we're gonna spend more time talking about. Scenario two is uh, investing wholly in transit. Um, this was based upon a staff level proposal worked on by City of Santa Cruz and Santa Cruz Metro staff. It would provide transit passes for the approximately 4,000 downtown employees under a program commonly referred to as an EcoPass. An EcoPass is very, very similar to an insurance pool where you cover the entirety of the group recognizing that only a portion of that group are going to utilize the services. Um, within this, it um, is approximately $35,000 above the budget that we had established, but does provide for just transit passes and marketing. There is no budget in this scenario for any other programs, biking, carpooling, walking, incentives, um, but it does provide transit passes to all 4,000 downtown employees. It is the least responsive to the downtown surveys of both 2017 and 2018. Scenario three, is our proposed staff recommendation um, and is one of the two recommendations before you today. Um, this is our staff recommendation. It's within the $300,000 that we had established and we think it has the greatest chance of moving the needle towards achieving that 50% drive alone mode, mode split. There are some real, real high points in here and there, um, the components of this program are covered in detail in your staff report. This would include uh, the purchase of bike link cards to give downtown employees to utilize our bike lockers. It would uh, develop the first of its kind jump subscription membership service. Um, it's something we've been working on with our partners at Jump to be able to provide jump memberships to our downtown employees. It would have bike commute challenges in May and October through partnership with Ecology Action, um, our, our great partners who already do this type of work. It would also fund a 3X increase in our transit mode split. Uh, right now, as you could see in the downtown employee commute survey, approximately 3% of our downtown employees utilize transit to get to work. This would provide enough budget, this, um, this identified budget here under transit, $94,000, would purchase monthly transit passes to cover 9% of our downtown employees. This is a dramatic, increase in the number of employees who are able to get downtown for free with a free transit pass in their pocket um, over what is there now. This also funds a commute management platform and carpool incentives, education and encouragement, uh, really focused on bringing that education to downtown employers and offering lunch and learns on at different sites rather than expecting people to come to us. Um, marketing and incentives, so really getting the word out about the program and letting people know about all the great programs we have to offer, as well as purchasing incentives from many of our downtown businesses uh, to offer as prizes. So say you, um, we offer a, a campaign that if you walk to work 10 days this month, you're entered to win dinner for two at 
lately downtown. Or if you sign up a buddy to tra take transit for the first time, you're entered to win a cup of coffee at one of our downtown businesses. So we think that scenario three is a really, really well-rounded program that has a huge opportunity to be able to encourage and incentivize employee mode shift, meet people where they are, and offer that wide variety of programs that really will make an impact on our, on our downtown employees. Scenario four is our downtown commission recommendation. And I'll preface this with saying, I think there's a couple things that we didn't do a good job covering at the downtown commission. Um, one of the big areas of discussion that came up was the difference between offering monthly transit passes and offering an eco pass. Uh, the recommendation that came out of um, scenario four, four as a downtown commission was to take scenario three and add scenario two to it. So all of the benefits that I described in scenario three and also add over $200,000 to fully fund an EcoPass program. The discussion that came around that was um, the idea that the provision of everyone having a transit pass in their pocket automatically would make transit more accessible and easier to use for people. And the piece that um, I did not do a good job communicating is that the method of delivery for getting transit passes to people would be no different in scenario three or scenario four. We do not have a contact list of all 4,000 plus downtown employees. We do not have um, you know, the, the mailing address to just drop these in the mail and get them to people. There would have to be, as with all EcoPass programs or transit pass programs, a verification that you are a downtown employee and then you have to come in and get a pass. Um, so that there is a step in between that is exactly the same between uh, scenario three and scenario four. Um, additionally, in my professional judgment, the money we have budgeted in scenario three to provide for a 9% transit mode split will be more than enough in year one to measure and analyze and see the impact of transit investment. And I do not believe that we would achieve a higher mode split than that would we invest in scenario four. That being said, the recommendation that came out of the downtown commission was to combine scenarios two and three into scenario four for an annual reoccurring budget of um, $585,000, which is about $285,000 over our recommended budget. Um, scenario four also does provide all the benefits that I identified in scenario three and would be a path that we could take to move forward. So to reiterate, our staff recommendation is still scenario three. It is within the established program budget and the direction that we were given from you on September 11th. It really does achieve our goals to meet people where they are in a fiscally prudent way that does provide alternatives and options to all downtown employees. It really does address the survey data that we heard in both 2017 and 2018 that people have a wide variety of interests and needs in how they travel. And it responds to the high interest that we heard in biking, the most popular program component, and also the tripling of transit ridership. It can be implemented in phases and rolled out ASAP. Um, moving forward with scenario three, we can go out next week and buy transit passes. Moving forward with scenario four, we'll take probably a minimum six months to establish an EcoPass program with Metro, with board approval, et cetera, um, and re really just figuring out the back end data. And finally, I think scenario three is a really smart year one investment. It will allow us to track the data, track the effectiveness, track the utilization, and then come back to you in year two with recommended changes based upon how our downtown employees are actually traveling and really does recognize the changing nature of our downtown employment and residents, as well as the changing nature of transportation. So that, thank you, and I'm here for any questions you have. Thank you, Claire. Thank you both for your presentation. Now's the time for council questions. Councilmember Cohn, if you have a question. Thank you, Mayor. Um, when you did your surveys, was there any category for students when you asked them about how, how they got around? And the, and the I mean, because the community that I'm part of is the bus is pretty popular and it does go where people want to go generally. We did not have a student question, but um, I think getting- A category for students, they said, would you work downtown? Are you, are you a student or- We did not ask if people are students. Yeah, one, one thing that may be helpful to what you're getting at, um, in many EcoPass programs, and I think what we would propose if we move that way, was that people who are otherwise covered by a transit pass, so all UCSC students as well as Cabrillo students, would not be eligible for this program. It's modeled off of what Boulder does. You have to verify that you're not a student and you don't already have a pass. 
yeah, I just want to get out of how popular the bus is for some people. Um, the, the survey, 4,000 on page 15.4, there's 4,054 and then 248. How does that match up with uh, the numbers that's, that survey people say you really need to do to get a, you know, adequate survey? Is it 5%, 10%, 3%? I don't know offhand. It just seemed like a low number of, of respondents for 4,000. Um, yeah, it, it was a lower number of respondents than we had in the first round of our downtown employee commute survey. That is likely because we got direction in September and wanted to deploy this as soon as possible. So our survey was slam in the middle of holiday time, which as we know in downtown is a really difficult time, especially to reach retail and restaurant workers. Um, so our second annual survey was lower than our first survey, although the results were incredibly consistent between the two, lending me a, a high degree of um, confidence in what the results say. The, the scenario four said doing business flex 50,000, what is that? Oh yeah, I like that one. Um, so one of the recommendations from the downtown commission was um, a recognition that, as I really bluntly and ungracefully put it, we're probably gonna get this program wrong. We're, we're making these um, projections on what people are gonna try to use, and there's gonna be an area that we budgeted too much and an area that we probably budgeted too little, and that $50,000 flex fee is, uh, they refer to it as like the cost of doing, the speed of doing business fee. So if we are oversubscribed the number of people who want bike locker cards, we can use part of that fee to just purchase more cards out of that budget. Um, or if, you know, we, um, more people want a carpool, we can uh, allocate more funding to that as well. And that's only for, Scenario four, but not the other three scenarios, or is it in every scenario? It's only in scenario four, although um, it, it could be an addition that you could add to any of the scenarios. And the last question, six months to get the program up and running, that seems like a lot, but what, what what's what's the obstacle for that? What are the hurdles? Yeah, so the um, between us and Metro staff, we had come up with this staff level proposal. Um, the steps that it would take in order to get it set up and running is that we would then have to meet with Metro staff and negotiate a, a firm proposal, which we would have to ground truth of the, you know, figure out a lot of the details. How do you deploy cards? How do you track those cards? How are you monitoring and reporting? How are, and really flesh out those details of a firm scope. We would have to then take that to the Metro board for approval. And then because that contract value is over $100,000, we would have to come back to council for approval as well. And then subsequent to that, launch a marketing campaign and then get um, fair media into people's cards. So it wouldn't be an immediate thing that we could, that we could launch. Councilmember Myers. I just have a couple questions. Um, so my understanding right now is our transit ridership for downtown employees is around 3%. Correct. And your projection if under scenario three, um, is that it would, would triple. <laughs> that we would provide su uh, sufficient budget for it to triple, yes. And with um, providing the 4,000 employees with the EcoPass, do we see a difference in that predictive um, accomplishment or not? I, through all my research, have not found any other transit systems that have increased their ridership significantly solely based on the provision of free transit passes. I, uh, the largest areas that you see increases in transit ridership are when you provide more frequent transit service and more um, make transit easier to use. I, in my professional opinion, do not think that we would get a larger number of people riding transit in scenario four than we would get in scenario three. And under scenario three, if uh, based on your calculations um, and if we made adjustments, if we, for example, ran out of the budget to purchase the monthly passes, we could put a contingency in number three, say of $50,000 that was specific to just bus passes, monthly bus passes. So if we got a high demand, um, we could certainly accommodate people by, by <coughs> adjusting the budget on scenario three, but maybe not to the extent of scenario four. Correct, if you were to make a motion today that included the provision of an extra $50,000 or just added $50,000 to the transit line item, that would accommodate that. Okay, um, two, more, two more quick, well, one quick question and then just a comment. Um, what, is there, a, is there a set of metrics that you sort of have in mind as you, you know, that are maybe best practice to sort of look at, at how these different modes um, are going to be able to be delivered and then the data presented to us 
you know, sort of after our first year, I guess. Is yeah, I am really looking forward to coming back to you and presenting the effectiveness of this program and the reach that we have. One of the elements that's included in scenarios one, three, and four is a commute management platform. Okay. Um, and there's also a, um, a line item for uh, a small contract with Ecology Action to sign people up for that commute management platform to go out and do targeted outreach to make people aware of this program that we have. Through that commute management platform, it's essentially, it'd be a partnership with the RTC. It's essentially a one-stop shop where you can go on and you can see, here's the benefits that the city of Santa Cruz is offering and here's all the things I can try and one place I can figure out how to access them. It's also the place that we would have a um, contact management tool so we could send out surveys. We could ask people, what would you be interested in trying and how can we match you up with those resources? And then we can have people track the trips that they actually take to be entered, to, to gamify the system essentially, to be entered for those you know, dinners out incentives or bike lights or helmets or sign up for different programs. So we're gonna be able to monitor it in that way and we're also gonna be able to monitor in anyone that comes in, we're gonna ask for their contact information and tally up how many people are using that. So really looking to monitor this program to be able to make those year two program recommendations to you that are reflective of how effective it was. Yeah, um, yeah I'll just close with, I think the most important thing that we need to keep in mind um, is that we need to have a robust uh, program to uh, you know, lower our GHGs. And I think that, um, uh, I think that based on the survey data and others that um, you've presented us with a solid recommendation. And uh, I think that people want to choose how they want to uh, reduce their greenhouse gases at this point. And I appreciate you um, giving us that full picture. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Councilmember Glover, and then any other questions before public comment? Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, for all of this wonderful information and for putting it together and looking at all the different <laughs> angles. Um, I was curious if you know, or if any of uh, my colleagues that sit on the Metro Committee know, what is being done currently to improve bus transit in the Santa Cruz and specifically <coughs> downtown area? Do you happen to know if there's a timeline or any kind of plan associated with improving I'll, service? I'll defer to Council Member Matthews. Yes, we got someone <laughs> from Metro in the audience, yeah, so exactly. can correct me. Uh, and, uh, 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 refresh the rolling stock, the buses, uh, the uh, addition of articulated buses has been a big goal in that. Um, uh, get new buses to replace the older ones, uh, adding technology that provides for uh, knowing when your bus is coming, which is really important for making um, uh, electronic payment uh, easier, uh, feasible, and so, a whole package of electronic upgrades that make um, operation quicker and more convenient um, for over the hill and in town. Um, um, public safety on the buses and for drivers. Um, I should say that the big cost is in personnel and routes. And I think most of you were paying attention a few years ago when the Metro went through its um, uh, real economic crisis and had to make some very hard decisions on routes and frequency. And there's an ongoing discussion about how do you balance those two issues? How far out do you go remotely or how do you concentrate on the most uh, well-traveled routes? So I'll just say in reference to earlier discussions about access to transit, that's to some extent fluid. Uh, and there are a whole lot of other forces. Um, but I would say there's a, a range of both operational and um, uh, capital steps Every meeting, <laughs> we deal with those. Um, um, but I honestly don't see addition of roots and frequency as um, a silver bullet here. Barrow, you wanna correct me if I have misrepresented that? Okay. Okay. And, um, <laughs> More additional th questions? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and then you had mentioned earlier, um, Claire, that we don't have a list of all of the businesses and employees in downtown, right? We don't have contact information for every single employee downtown. Totally, um, employee, employee, right. So is there, um, is there not a system that we could develop that would either catalog how many employees are at each business and then submit the cards to the business to be distributed by the employer or to uh, ask for the contact information of their employees so that then we can send them bus passes directly? Is there something impeding us from being able to do that? 
Um, we could, there are a couple different models. That's not the typical model that's been used. Usually, um, especially for larger businesses, uh, we have many, many businesses downtown who are five employees or less, but especially for larger businesses, usually an HR person is the point of contact mm -hmm. who verifies their employee roles. Typically, EcoPass Eco are only available to full-time, non-temporary employees who do not have another transit pass, such as from a university. So someone at each of those employers is verifying and saying, here are our eligible employees, and then typically send those employees in to pick up their pass. Um, there is always the possibility of having a different method of program delivery for then distributing those passes in that way, um, giving them to each of these employers instead. That would be an alternative. Okay, um, okay, thank you. And then a question from Vice Mayor Cummings. Any additional questions or, or we'll open it up to the public after that. Oh, you have a question? I may have a question. If you have a question, you can let me know. I had a follow up on the question that um, Councilman uh, Glover just asked. And did I hear correctly that the eco pass, the, that the bus passes would only be available to full-time employees and not to any part-time employees that work downtown? Typically, and we could always change it. Many other programs are that are that this would be based on EcoPass programs are only available to full-time, non-temporary employees. And is this also the same for the other bus pass options? No. But you could always provide different direction on that. Then um, another question I had, looking at um, uh, scenario four under the marketing and incentives. Sorry. Um, it says that there'd be an additional $20,000 for transit specific marketing. And I'm just curious why, like where that comes from, because in scenario three, um, it's just the 55,000. It doesn't really explain why there would be a $20,000 increase under scenario four. If we're going to invest over $300,000 in a transit component of this program, my feeling based on conversations with the other EcoPass programs is that that investment should have our full weight behind it and should have additional specialized marketing behind it. Um, it's a significant increase in cost over what's identified in scenario three. And I think that if, if we decide to move forward with it, we should have our best foot forward and add to the marketing budget there. Um, and just for clarification, is there any information on what the current use of bike lockers is? Because I know that's proposed as something that we would be. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I can get back to you on that information. We're actually uh, preparing the next update on that report right now, and it'll be going to our downtown commission at their next meeting. Um, so I don't have that off the top of my head, I'm sorry. Okay, and then I have just one more question. Is the, if the programs are successful, what is the anticipated or estimated reduction in the number of vehicles that would we would be able to anticipate being downtown? Yeah, do you want to take this one? This is this is a good, complicated question. On yeah. So if if you just use rough numbers, if we get to that fifty percent goal, and you ignore any increases in car share, because we're figuring all those people now either bike or bus or ride. Um, then uh, the percentage difference equals about 440 people. However, I just want to point out that's not 440 saved parking spaces. It is 440 less trips, but we turn over um, most of our parking spaces at least twice and some of the more popular lots, you know, up to four times a day. So um, it takes, uh, you know, four, four less trips to replace one parking space. So because we have a shared parking model in downtown and we have, uh, we're essentially like a 23 hour downtown. Many of our coffee shops open at you know 4.35 a.m. and many of our bars close around two. So we have people who are downtown being employed at almost all hours. Um, those people who are coming downtown, it's not necessarily n not an, a seven day stretch of the week. So some people are Monday through Friday, some are late night, some are early morning. So as Jim said, about 440 cars would not be coming downtown, but that wouldn't be a direct one-to-one -one relationship between uh, 440 spaces automatically saved each and every day as part of this program. Complicated answer to a direct question. Okay, Councilmember Matthews and then Councilmember Cook. Yeah, just to point out that what we're talking about here is a reduction in um, or more efficient transportation um, modes for employees. It doesn't count residents or people visiting downtown for any number of reasons. So 
Correct. Focus on employees. Um, and then I, I too was interested in the um, issue of part-time employees for EcoPass. And describe to me how an EcoPass works. Is it for a year or? Yeah, typically EcoPass, EcoPasses are a form of bare media. So right now, if you're familiar, UCSC students have their student ID cards. And this identifies them as a student and they get a sticker when they go in. And it says, this is now good to use the bus for one year. Well, without getting into a whole lot of detail, I'll just say I, I would support exploration of some variety of bus pass for part-time that could maybe be, because a whole lot of our downtown employees are students, um, that could be for a half year or part-time or something. So I think that's maybe a program detail. It seems to me that the uh, target for uh, users of EcoPasses is, is ambitious and by um, expanding some possibilities for part-time employees, it could actually have a higher usage. Yeah, the direction could. I'm understanding mm -hmm. the students have the student pass, but you know. Yeah, the direction could be to cover all downtown employees regardless of how frequently they're employed. Anyway, something to look at, yeah. Any additional questions on this side? Member Brown, and then was there, was there a question here? I'm having a bit of a challenge making the numbers add up um, of the, for scenarios two and three. So I just wanna be clear here. Um, I've, I've added them up and they don't seem to match up with the, um, the narrative. So I just, I wanna make sure that I'm clear here. So scenario three, we're at 200, and it says 291, but when I added up it was 290K, um, including bike transit, commute carpool, education, and then the marketing and incentives and a contingency fund under scenario three. With scenario four, including full uh, funding for the EcoPass program, um, <coughs> I'm adding up the addition uh, is $224,000 increase in the transit column. I've, I've created columns here mm -hmm. for, for full funding of EcoPass and then additional $20,000 um, for marketing and incentives. So how, so that, that adds up to, um, 525K, which would actually cover the, the 9K to 10K contingency plus the 50K contingency recommended by the Downtown Commission. So, so I'm not clear how there's no contingency. So the, um, it was the 225K that you got to as well as the $50,000 cost of doing business. That gets you to the two. Oh, the okay, thank you. Speed of doing business, I'm sorry. Speed, um, of, doing speed of doing business, yeah, and that's identified in, um, my pages aren't numbered the same as you are, but on the top of the page above the recommendation. Um, While the program budget was established at $300,000 per year, the Downtown Commission recommended to increase this budget by $50,000 to address any emerging needs. So it's got it, so it's not like in an italicized. No, it's part. included That's in one of the paragraphs. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Is there an additional question before we open it up? Yeah. Um, so there's 4,000 full time employees downtown. Plus or minus, which changes seasonally. Yeah, and would you ha you probably have no any idea like twenty hour, thirty hour uh, employees? Um, we do have that information that's in the uh, survey attachment, and um, one of the slides did present the percentages of those that were full time employees. No, but um, but also twenty and thirty hour employees is it covered that? Um, I believe so. I'd have to look back in. Yeah. Um, the last question is jump bike. Uh, was that in scenario four as well? How, how does that play itself out? How do I, how would I get a jump bike subscription? Is it free? Do I pay something for it? Um, so right now the, the program that we're working on with Jump and they've never done a program like this before. So we're volunteering to be the guinea pig here because we think this is a worthwhile program that they're building for us. Um, it would be something um, very similar to the monthly plan that we have available through Jump right now, but it would be for downtown employees and you would get, the city would pay, um, for 15 minutes of ride time a day at a reduced rate, and then anything over that the user would pay. 15 minutes of ride time a day is likely enough for at least your one-way commute, being that the service area of Jump right now is within the city of Santa Cruz. So it's about, on an on a e-bike, it's about that three-mile radius we have from downtown. All right, at this time, it, it we'll open it up to public comment. If you're interested in speaking to this item, this is item number... 15, please uh, stand up to my left and you will have two minutes to uh, address. 
Okay. Go ahead. Um, Rick Longinati from the Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. I'm glad to be here with you all this afternoon. It's really a, a nice uh, event to be uh, voting on, on uh, transportation demand management. I um, just want to reiterate that the students at Cabrillo College are really a, an inspire, inspiration to me. So a couple years ago, they voted to tax themselves $40 a semester. Everybody, every student, $40 a semester in return for a bus pass for everybody. And when we were on campus campaigning for that, we were running across students that would never use the bus. That's not how they got to school. But they thought that they you know, were doing the right thing. They voted on it again about a year later, and, and it was an overwhelming majority of, of students voted for, for that. Um, so that model of, of, you know, that sort of insurance model where, you know, we all contribute and everybody gets covered even though there's a smaller number that would take advantage of it. Actually, in this poll that the staff took, 62% of the people who responded to that poll indicated that free bus passes may be an incentive to switch modes. So there is substantial support. There may be more support for, uh, uh, bicycling and carpooling, but there's substantial support for riding the bus. And lastly, I just want to say that there's something that's going on here today that we haven't even talked about, and that's really the social equity piece. If you wanted to do something to affect a household's transportation and housing costs put together, this would be the thing to do. It would be a, a, the downtown commission's option four. Um, and that, on this chart, we see Housing and transportation costs, cities like Riverside have the highest at 69% of a household's income. San Francisco, 54%. And we know how astronomical housing is in San Francisco, but the difference is people, people can get around without owning a car. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, next speaker. Hi, I'm Brett Garrett. I'm on the Downtown Commission, thank you. I'm also part of uh, Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. Um, and I'm speaking for myself um, about why I think it's very important to fund the very full EcoPass program where all downtown employees have access to those bus passes. Um, one reason is on pages uh, 20 and 21 of those SurveyMonkey results that, that you all got, um, the question that was asked was, what would encourage you, Mr. Employee or Ms. Employee, to take the bus downtown? Subsidized bus fare or free bus passes? So they're answering, would a subsidized, would a free bus pass encourage them to take the bus downtown? 36% said yes, strongly agree. Another 26% said, yeah, I agree. So 62% agreed or strongly agreed that a free bus pass would, would encourage them to take the bus downtown. I, I think that's profound. Um, also, the, uh, I just want to point out the Downtown Commission did unanimously vote to, um, to include the full eco pass and those extra money. Um, it's a wonderful discount. It's a 90% discount on what it would be to provide a pass for all those employees. On the other hand, the, the staff recommendation is about a 16% discount. It's $54.5 per bus pass that the city would be paying under the staff recommendation. Um, one thing I want to say about the staff recommendation, I, I don't agree with the prediction that it will triple the bus ridership. Um, it's 1728 transit passes, that's 144 per month, um, which is not much more than the people that are riding the bus anyway. So who's gonna be first in line for those bus passes is the people that are already riding the bus. It doesn't meet the TDM goal. I'm all for those people having free bus. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next speaker. Are there any other members of the public interested in speaking on this item? Good afternoon, council members. My name is Piet Cannon from Ecology Action. I'd like to thank the staff and city council for taking on this item. Um, I think it's important to enact programs that have a direct climate change impact, and this program would do so. 50% of the greenhouse gases emission emitted locally are from the cars that we drive around. And also, I want to state in terms of programs versus projects, the city's taking on a lot of good projects to reduce our drive alone trips. But this is a program, and this is a program that can be enacted quickly and gives people you know, who already have the tools, they live within distances to bike and walk, take the bus or carpool to be able to utilize. And so 
I think it's important this as a pilot program that it, it goes off as well as possible. But it also, I think it'd be viewed in the lens of being iterative, that you do it the first year and then you make changes. You don't get stuck in one mode and one direction that you say the overall goal is to increase sustainable transportation. There's a variety of modes that people can take besides driving alone to downtown to work. So whether it be the bus, bike, walk, or carpool, or you know, scooter, that you look at all those modes. And I think, you know, in terms of the original staff amount of 300,000, you know, if we can put in more towards the, you know, 585,000 in EcoPass and look at, look at the totality of all the programs that we're serving or forms of transportation, I think, you know, that, that's a good investment. Um, putting most of it towards one mode of transportation, sustainable transportation, seems like it maybe is not the best use of resources. Um, but I think whatever program you move forward with it, making sure there's enough resources. And also remembering that it is a program that giving pr someone a free bus pass and then expecting them somehow to just wake up and say, okay, I'm gonna take the bus today is, is not the course. You need to have a follow-up campaign you. to give them the edu ed education Thank support you. to Thank move to that forward. Much. Thank you. Okay, next speaker, please. My name is Susan Cavalieri. I'm also with the Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. Um, I am concerned that only 248 uh, people responded to the survey out of the 4,000 uh, possible uh, uh, downtown employees. And I suspect that many of uh, the people tr uh, commute from places like Watsonville where the cost of living and owning a house or rents are much less. Um, so if a person uh, can't uh, ride the bike from Watsonville, um, it becomes necessary to provide them with bus passes. Um, they, um, the, the cost of, of parking it has increased and many of these people may not have the funds to pay for these extra uh, parking fees. Um, the problem is that we can't continue uh, business as usual. Um, the planet will not sustain our children if we don't do something very, very dramatic. So I believe that going uh, with option four is, is the best way to go. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, next speaker. Mayor, Council, Jackie Griffith. <sighs> I'm getting tired. I hope I can think of the things I wanted to say to you. Um, there's some tweaks to this. I would support number four. I think we need to do Excuse everything. Excuse me, I'm just pause you. Did we start there? I just want, thank you. Go ahead. I, I just wanted to make sure that your time was started. So you'll oh. have your full two minutes. Yeah, but am I losing it because you've nope. cut it? No, okay. we, we. Okay. Um, let's see if I can rattle here. Um, there are some tweaks that I would do to that. I'm not sure about offering somebody a cup of, a chance to win a cup of coffee or a meal if that costs us on our staff time, I think that might be a place where you could adapt that. And if you get some um, freebies offered by a company, uh, great, you can you know, come up with some easy way to pass those out. But uh, it seems to me that if you're trying to trim this in some way, that there might be ways that we could look at. You know, because like Rick was saying, um, People need to do this, people want to do this, people. I would offer, or if I were offering an incentive, I would say anyone who's involved in any of these programs can come to this event and have a big group picture taken and put that in the paper to acknowledge people for their having taken a step in the right direction towards uh, caring about our climate, rather than giving you know little things and having to administrate that is all. Um, Oh, the other thing that comes to mind, yeah, I support, it should, shouldn't just be for people who live in the city. There should be a way for people in less, um, uh, in unincorporated areas, areas that cost less to live in to get here if they work here. 
Um, I think it should include temporary employees. Uh, and I think that bicyclers uh, should have the option of having a freebie a few times, uh, so many times a year, because there are times when um, it's raining or the kids are blah, blah, you know, there's all kinds of reasons why people can't ra uh, ride their bikes at a particular time. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay, next speaker. Hello, I'm Dana Bagshaw, and I was founding member of Bus by Choice that's been going on in the, the city for a um, few years now. Um, yes, bus is not the most popular way to, to get to town, <laughs> and yet it can, public transit is a way that we can dramatically decrease our greenhouse emissions. So we just need to give it a big push. Uh, we've we've had a lot of people who support biking and and it's very visible and I think it's a good thing There's a lot of people who can't ride bikes and there's a lot of people who may want to try Public transit. It's just the spontaneity of having that Pass in your pocket and being able to just try it for a year and see how it works um I think that marketing is very important. I also would like to volunteer our services, the Bus by Choice. We'd like to go out, so, so, collaborate with the city, and go out. We're the ones who know how to ride the buses and encourage people to ride the buses. Um, we've gone to businesses with the Keep It Cool campaign. We can do it again. And we just really want to get behind this. And I would ask you to rethink meeting people where they are and challenging them. We know now more and more people are getting on board the Green New Deal. Everyone knows we've got to do something and this is a way we can do it. So I strongly encourage you to vote for the one that, um, for number four and the downtown commission, the voice of the people, maybe we can work through the downtown association as well to get out to the to the businesses so there are possibilities here and i'm very excited about it thank you thank you okay is there any other uh, member in the audience here aside from you who is interested in speaking on this topic okay you'll be our last speaker okay my name is becky i'm a manager of a downtown um, restaurant cafe um i just wanted to speak up for my staff it's 90 percent part-time um, they have bus passes because they're students, but we open at 530 and we close at midnight. So the buses aren't running at that time. Um, most of them live without out of your range. Um, so biking is a possibility, but I wonder about the safety when the average age is about 20 to 21 years old. So, you know, that's something I'd like for you to consider here because right now they're paying $8, which is for a minimum age wage worker that's, you know, the majority of an hour's worth of work that they are paying to be at work. So, you know, I would like for you guys to consider adding something for them, if they can get a discount parking, if they live without a range or something along those lines. That's it, otherwise I think it's a great idea. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, well then we'll close uh, public comment and return to council for deliberation and action. Council Member Matthews. Yeah, I wanna first of all thank our staff for several years of good work <laughs> on this topic. And um, um, it's true that um, not every single downtown employee was uh, surveyed, but I think these surveys uh, represented a good effort and give us really good useful information. I very much support the idea of a multimodal approach to this. Um, um, just to back up the uh, components of the multimodal, I think are based on best practices. We say, what are the best practices? Best practices include incentives, best practices include asking people what will be most appealing to them. And um, so I am prepared to move um, option three with the following changes that we, um, under the transit, uh, give direction to explore um, eco passes or similar bus um, incentives for part-time downtown employees. And that we take $10,000 from the marketing and incentives and put it into contingency, which would then create $20,000 in, in contingency. My thought there is that um, 
that could, uh, as the popularity uh, of any given option manifests itself, that we can then adjust the funding. And if it turns out that the eco passes are wildly popular, that's $20,000 to, to um, direct as needed. Um, but to me, that um, <coughs> acknowledges the fact that biking has been our most significant alternative. It's what people want to do. Um, it incorporates support for transit, um, for carpooling. It, it plugs into so many different options um, within the budget that has been established. And I think this is really important too. We just voted on our restructuring of our parking fees and permits. Um, the new structure accommodates a steady cash flow at this point of $300,000 to support DDM. And I think our staff's done a really good job to look at demand, options, costs, and so forth within that budget. Um, I think we can, we can make enormous gains. It's impressive the changes that were made in what, two years in uh, alternative uh, modes downtown. I think everyone who spoke is correct. People, are, people know and they wanna do things. And so we're trying to offer the biggest spectrum to improve those numbers dramatically. So um, I also agree with um, Piet's comments. It has to be iterative. We expect to be, even throughout the year, analyzing, adapting, coming up with uh, a more effective, more impactful program in the coming year. Um, so with all those statements, I'm going to move uh, option three with those two comments that I made. Can I ask you for clarification yes. on those? Um, the intention behind scenario three was that those monthly transit passes that we would purchase would be available to part-time employees, which I think addresses yes. one of yeah. the things. Yeah. And then a clarification, the $10,000 from marketing um, and incentives, do you want that moved to the transit line item budget? Okay. Contingency. To contingency. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Which is gonna be used for transit. So we have a motion by Council Member Matthews. Uh, yeah, I'll second that. I'm uh, curious if you would uh, entertain a friendly amendment to increase potentially add an additional 30,000 that could be um, designated specifically to additional, if we get it, if we get the demand for additional bus passes that we make sure we have, we have enough in this year's budget that we could accommodate that. 30,000 is not gonna break the bank. I'm not willing to double the budget <laughs> on the TDM. <laughs> You'll accept the friendly amendment, yeah. is that mm -hmm. correct? Okay, and, so. And just to state the obvious, if it doesn't get used, it doesn't get spent. Yeah, so the next year. <laughs> okay. yeah. We have a motion by Councilmember Matthews and a second by Councilmember Myers. Any further discussion, Councilmember Carl? Thank you. I, I, yeah, I just think that scenario four is far superior, and it really gives every people a chance to um, who wouldn't normally take the bus to consider taking the bus. Um, I think that's such a step in the right direction. I think that the Boulder experience um, portrays that, and also. You know, they got into those other, you know, kinds of buses that would go skip and hop. And um, and I see, uh, well, my vision for Metro would be that they do similar things to that. Um, I think the infusion of this capital too into the, the Metro system is a, is a really positive thing. And it helps uh, the whole system and it helps maybe them contemplate um, adding routes. Uh, so I just think that you know, we might I, we should go for for scenario four. It's it's really comprehensive and it's and it's doing the best job. I I, I it just in seeing it and hearing from the downtown commission, unanimously approving it. Um, I was kind of surprised, but but they got it. Thanks, Councilmember Brown. Yeah. Um, so I I just want to say I support the the proposal developed by staff um, and for its multimodal um, approach and a significant um, uh, uh, effort to uh, collect data um, to, to back up the, the recommendations for our investments. However, I also believe it's time that we take a leap and make a significant investment um, to encourage public transit uh, and make its use more affordable for downtown workers. Um, 
I appreciate the efforts of staff in developing and conducting the survey. I also share concerns raised by Ms. Cavalieri uh, regarding self-selection bias in the survey responses and wonder about um, many downtown workers who aren't represented who may actually, if bus passes were made affordable to them, uh, switch their um, decision making around commuting from distances further afield than um, the, the three mile radius that um, is reflected in the in the survey results. So I, I understand this is a significant investment. Um, in uh, the grand scheme of things, an additional um, $285,000 seems to me a good investment to encourage public transit. Um, another uh, uh, speaker, uh, Mr. Longinati, suggested that this is really about social equity. And um, uh, so I, I would support um, uh, the recommendation number four, the recommendation made by the downtown commission. So I'm not prepared to support the motion at this time. I also wanna say that I would like to see future consideration of uh, extension to um, part-time workers and future consideration of, um, for um, folks who live outside the, the, so not just for downtown workers, but folks who live around around transit corridors. And I understand that's you know obviously uh, gonna take some more time, but I just wanna put it out there that I'm um, very much interested in hearing more about that um, from, from staff in the future. Okay. Council Member Glover, and then Vice Mayor Cummings. Yeah, I was struck by the figure that was presented by one of the speakers about the approximately, I think it was um, Mr. Garrett, who, Commissioner Garrett, who mentioned the sheer volume of people that said that they would be consider, they would consider using a bus pass if it was made available to them. Over 60%, I mean, that's a pretty considerable number of people that would be considered, consider using it. Um, and I do agree with Council Member Brown that uh, it is a significant investment, but I'll call us back to, for those of you that weren't here this morning or this, this afternoon, I guess, uh, we just spent $925,000 to renovate a restaurant at the De La Vega golf, uh, golf course, which does not nearly serve as many people and does nothing to mitigate climate change. So I think that it's within our responsibility to do everything that we can to move forward as expeditiously as possible. So I'll be supporting number four. Okay, um, Vice Mayor Cummings and then I have a few comments. First of all, I'd just like to thank staff for all the hard work you all have done. I think it's something that we can all celebrate knowing that um, Santa Cruz is now, um, in terms of bike riderships among the employees, the second um, highest bike ridership in the country. And I really hope that we can continue moving forward to be um, not only the, the highest in terms of bike ridership, but also um, one of the lowest carbon emitting, emitting communities in the country as well. Um, <clears throat> so I just wanna thank you for the studies and the surveys that you all have done. Um, to bring us to where we are now. And um, moving forward, I just wanna um, also support um, the recommendations that came from the Downtown Commission. I think that right now, we are in an opportunity when we can invest and see how well, um, if we invest heavily into our sustainable modes of transportation, what can come of that. And I think that um, the one piece of that too would also be, you know, as it was mentioned earlier, that we extend this to part-time employees because not all of them are students and many of them face financial hardships that this would actually help to alleviate a lot of that if they had this as an option. Um, I'm very much hoping that we can track data over time so we can understand whether or not um, we do have, like what is, what is the increase in ridership how much our jump bikes are being used, how much biking, because if we can then scale down, I think that um, it will at least give us an opportunity to see what would happen if we gave this our full potential. And so um, I'm gonna be supporting the downtown um, commission's recommendation today. Okay, I just have a brief, um, I have a brief question or kind of comment, but in terms of the social equity lens, how, it sounds to me like both, all, pretty a lot of the scenarios and a lot of the efforts are actually sort of oriented around that. Do you have any response to that? Yeah. Functionally, they're equivalent. In scenario three or scenario four, if you want a transit pass, I'm gonna get you a transit pass. Meet your needs, okay, thank you. Okay, so I think um, what we'll do is we'll take the vote on the motion on the floor, and if that fails, then we'll have a, an additional uh, motion made. So all those in favor? Well, oh. I, I would like to make one more comment Something relative to that, because I can see where it's going, but um, the um, item uh, option four, which I expect to be coming at us next, um, basically, by purchasing an EcoPass for every single downtown employee, doubling the allowable, the amount of funding that's been 
allocated for this, I think is an irresponsible use of public funds. Option three, in my mind, has a generous allowance for provision of eco passes to those downtown employees who want them with a contingency that can cover substantially more than anticipated and the ability to change mid-year. But to, to, to spend $300,000 on eco passes for everyone not knowing if they want them or not, I just can't understand that. It, it does seem to me like an irresponsible approach. I'm just going to put that on the on the floor. Okay. You guys. So we have a vote <laughs> by. Let, let's go ahead and yeah. move the the. There's a motion by Councilmember Matthews to move Scenario Three with a few modifications, which included uh, uh, taking ten thousand out of marketing and incentives and adding that to contingency, with a friendly amendment by Councilmember Myers to increase that to fifty thousand additional uh, contingency funds for support. So we'll go ahead and vote on that motion and then further discussion. It, go for the additional motion. I mean, with all due respect, if Councilmember Matthews wants to withdraw her motion after going around for comments, we can, you know, oh, vote it down. We can vote on it. Yeah. Okay. All those in favor of the motion on the floor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Aye. No. Okay. So that fails with Councilmember Brown, uh, Count Vice Mayor Cummings, Councilmember Crone, Councilmember Clover, Glover voting no, Councilmember Matthews, uh, Councilmember Myers, and myself voting in support. Councilmember Crone. No. Go, go ahead. Excuse me. Okay, so now we're reopening the discussion and somebody can make a motion moving a different type of direction at this time. Okay. Oh, I mean, I, I would move the, um, the, the council, um, I'd, I'd move the downtown, recommend, downtown commission's recommendation, I, I think as um, stated in the staff report. So there's a motion by Councilmember Brown to move the scenario four, which is the Downtown Transportation Commission's recommendation. Is there a second? Second, yeah, and I'd like to second that just with the response to Councilmember Matthews, uh, that it is really interesting just to look at the way that we prioritize our funds and when we talk about a misuse of public funding, because I'll bring it up again, uh, we heard from the Public Works Director earlier th this afternoon that we spent 25% of our overall maintenance budget on one building, which serves a very small population of the community. So this is something that could appeal to and support the entire population of downtown employees. Um, so if I, I would question the definition of misuse of public funds. Okay, so I, I, it's okay, it's okay. So this is a time for us to continue to move in a direction that's gonna lead to policy action and everybody can have their opinion on how and you can have your moment as well. Uh, but I hope that we can maybe take a moment to remember when we can use our discretion of language as needed. And if it's the interest of moving things along in the direction of the majority of the council, we can go ahead and do that. So at this time, I will acknowledge Councilmember Matthews and then Councilmember Crone, and then hopefully we can move the, the item as uh, the council desires. Just for the uh, purposes of those who were not present at our earlier discussion, the expenditure for capital improvement at the De La Viega Lodge and uh, shop was a capital improvement which will result in increased income which anticipated a payback of those expenditures in five years or less. This is an ongoing operational expense. They're, they're apples and oranges. Okay, so uh, we have a motion by council. I have a friendly Member. amendment. Uh, one, one second, thank you. Okay, we have a motion by Councilmember Brown. We have a second, for scenario number four, we have a second by Councilmember Glover. Councilmember Crone, you'd like to be recognized by me to- Friendly amendment um, to actually direct staff to come back with us and figure out how many of 20 and 30 hour a week uh, part-time employees there are and you know what, what does that scenario look like as far as if we were to cover them, how much that would be as well. If I may, uh, staff, covered. go ahead. The, the EcoPass proposal that's before you would be to cover the universe of 4,000 employees. So we use the high number for the budget calculation. So any of them would already be included in that budget number. Um, it could potentially go lower. After. Oh, I thought you said there was 4,000 40 hour a week full-time employees. No, there's no, about 4,000 okay. plus or minus right, employees cool. in the downtown workforce. A portion of them are part-time. That's that's really good to hear. Okay, so you remove your friendly amendment because it's encompassing. Um, but think of the greenhouse gases we're saving too, and that's an unwritten thing here. So I think that's you know part of this whole scenario is that we are actually going to save money, and it's going to 
be a great payback. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, please say no. 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 So that passes with Councilmember Brown, Vice Mayor Cummings, Councilmember Crone, Councilmember Glover in support with Councilmember Matthews, Councilmember Myers and myself voting against it. Okay, the next agenda item. Second, I have a motion that I wanted to make related to transportation. Okay, um, does, okay. Um, so, a number of members of the community have come forward and have expressed that given the changes in transportation demand and um, different options for transportation in the future, um, a number of the members of the community came forward and wanted to have a study session on transportation demand management, um, focusing on um, parking pricing downtown, um, these alternative uh, forms of transportation, including the, the, um, the EcoPass, um, reform of parking requirements and leveraging affordable housing downtown. Um, it's proposed to be on March 9th at 7 p.m. And the people who would be presenting would be Adam Miller Ball, professor from environmental studies at UCSC, Barrow Emerson, chief planner at the Santa Cruz Metro, Patrick Siegman, transportation and parking consultant who worked for 15 years for Nelson Nygaard, and Sibley Simon, who is president of the New Way Homes. I'm gonna second that. So we have a motion by Council Member, uh, I'm sorry, Vice Mayor Cummings, second by Council Member Crone. Tony, Mr. Condotti. Um, Mike suggests that <clears throat> that be brought back at your February 26th um, meeting for action. Okay. So the motion could be to agendize it for action at the February 26th meeting. Would you like to make your motion to agendize it for yes. action? On, okay. Second. So the motion now is to agendize that for action on the 26th um, by Council Member, I, I'm sorry, Vice Mayor Cummings, seconded by Council Member Crone. Brown, then Matthews. If we're agendizing for action in a future meeting, I can make my comments then. <laughs> that would be the appropriate time to do it because you can't have a discussion about it here. Yeah. <laughs> Does the motion um, to set a, a TDM study session um, include the specific presenters called out or does it ask, is it to direct staff to develop a study session um, for the education of council? It's to include the presenters who were announced. Okay. No, only those presenters? Vice Mayor Cummings, sorry. If there were other presenters from staff who want to be included, I think that, I don't see why we couldn't have them in the conversation. Okay. I think I'm gonna go ahead and stop the conversation. We'll have um, more conversations. So this is the motion to agendize an item um, presented by Vice Mayor Cummings um, to have a study session. I will be voting against this because I feel that there has been already a plan laid out in terms of expectations and various types of study, study sessions, but if the will of the council is to go in favor, we can do that. So all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. 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 So that passes with Councilmember Brown, Vice Mayor Cummings, Crone, and Glover to agendize this for the 26th for discussion. Um, uh, Councilmember Myers, Councilmember uh, Matthews and, my, and myself voting against it. Okay, so now we'll move on to the tenant protection item, which is item number 16 in our agenda. And we'll uh, go ahead and start it with a staff presentation. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Good Lee afternoon. Butler, I'm the Planning Director. Yeah. And Let me go ahead and correct the title of it. <laughs> I apologize for that. That's okay. So the item before us is the proposal for the establishment of a rental housing task force. I should have read my script. I apologize <laughs> for that. And we'll go ahead and kick off the presentation on that. Thank you for the correction. Sure, thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Lee Butler, the Planning Director. And uh, this topic really doesn't need uh, much of an introduction, but I'll, I'll give it a quick one uh, for the benefit of the audience. Um, <clears throat> back in, uh, it, well, really for quite some time now, um, tenant protections um, have been um, a, a topic of discussion with the community and the council. It was certainly a uh, point that was raised many times as part of the housing outreach in late 2017. And then almost a year ago uh, to the day, the council passed some interim protections with the rent control and just cause eviction interim ordinances that um, ultimately expired following the failure of measure M um, at the November ballot. 
Um, and then we received some direction from the council to establish a task force that um, would look into rental housing issues. And um, we have um, provided some options for the council to consider and how that task force could be uh, formed. And uh, then we have also uh, provided some information in response to council direction on a number of other topics regarding um, an application for a task force and community polling and uh, data that can be used to evaluate um, both the policies that are developed and the, um, the repercussions or the uh, benefits that the uh, policies bring to the community. And with that, I will turn it over to uh, Sarah Fleming and Sarah Noisy, who prepared the agenda report, and um, you two can take it away. Thank you. I'll also give a little shout out to Amanda Rotella from Economic Development. There's only two seats here, so she's back here. <laughs> Thank you, Amanda. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, council members. Thank you for having us. Uh, I'm gonna give you a little bit of background here. Um, as you can see, and as Director Butler indicated, uh, we have come before you on a number of occasions related to this topic, most recently being January 22nd of this year. Uh, and at that meeting, there was direction for staff to return uh, at this meeting with a proposal for a task force establishment and with information on several other items um, as Director Butler indicated. So I'm gonna walk you through three options that staff has put together uh, under council direction for your consideration. So option one, uh, this is the option that staff is recommending in your staff report. And this would be to secure professional services in a task force planning stage. And so that would be securing professional services now. Uh, what our recommendation is, is that you would direct staff to contract with the Sacramento State Consensus and Collaboration Program. Uh, that program is a neutral nonprofit unit of California State University uh, that has a mission to build the capacity of public agencies, stakeholder groups, and the public to use collaborative strategies to improve policy outcomes. The CCP approach requires stakeholder engagement that supports constructive and open dialogue, mediating disagreements, and encouraging stakeholders to develop durable recommendations and solutions through a variety of collaborative methods. Managing senior mediator Dave Seppos have, has over 34 years of collaboration and mediation experience and a comprehensive background in developing consensus-based stakeholder-driven processes. And we do have Mr. Seppos here today. So um, during your uh, deliberation process, he will be here to answer any questions you might have about his proposal, as well as any questions you might have about the collaboration and consensus building process in general. So some of the pros of bringing uh, this organization on at this time is they're experienced, well-respected collaboration experts. Uh, we heard from council that you really were looking for a data-driven approach and we feel strongly as staff that bringing in uh, someone from the academic bent would really be able to provide that potentially in a way that a uh, maybe for-profit private firm might not be able to do. Uh, they're a neutral, a neutral third party, so um, that objectivity would be, I think, very welcome and needed in, given the um, current state of the conversations and debate. And uh, they would be able to provide objective analysis and recommendations on how to form our task force and make sure that we're ensuring all voices are at the table and that we're considering everything moving forward. Uh, the cons of taking this particular approach is that um, by bringing someone on right away, there may be a uh, situation where when we put out a RFP or decide to go uh, through the larger task force process, we might end up selecting another firm so it may not it may be CCP it may be a different firm depending on what council's preference is so that could create just a little bit of a break there um, the likelihood of the success of this particular scenario is is very high so option two um, is to go ahead and pause everything and have staff put together and issue an RFP now for the full process so uh, what this would mean is that one consultant firm would work on this from initiation to completion. Uh, council could do it a number of ways. It could be a RFP, it could be a sole source. Um, it, it really depends on how you wanna move forward with that. Um, the cons of this is that the staff, we would be responsible for developing the full scope for the task force and uh, we wouldn't have that professional guidance. And not being mediation and conflict experts, there is a chance that there may be some missteps in developing the scope and putting together um, the request for those proposals. Uh, the additional con here is that the start could be delayed by eight to 10 weeks for staff to put together the proposal, get it out on the market, um, get 
all the uh, proposals back or put out the request for proposals, get the proposals back, rank them, interview them, and then come back to council with a contract. So that takes some time. And uh, it is the most costly when you add the cost, the estimated cost of what the work uh, might be for a consultant as well as staff time, this would be the most costly option. That said, uh, the likelihood, did I spell that wrong? That's a misspelling. Likelihood of success uh, is moderate to high on this one. So option three would be a staff managed initiation and then a facilitated task force. So what this would look like is uh, council would direct staff to proceed with the task force development and scoping and then issue an RFP for uh, facilitation services only. How this differs from the last process is that the last process we would bring on a firm who would do what we're recommending CCP does right now, this kind of situation assessment analysis, interviewing, uh, coming up with a, uh, More a work plan for the task force, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, this would, staff would create that work plan and then hire a consultant who then would come on and simply facilitate. <laughs> this is pros, immediate start, and it does have the lowest financial cost. Uh, the cons, again, are the expertise concerns of staff. Uh, there, I think, are some concerns that the neutral role that the staff and city does have might not be trusted by all the stakeholders, and I think that's an important thing to note. And then uh, it has the highest opportunity cost because there is such a, and what I mean by that is there is such an intensive role of staff that when we look at the resources that we have, uh, there could be some concerns about what, depending on what department that falls in, what gets dropped or gets delayed in order for the staff to be able to take that on. Whereas if we had a consultant on board to kind of manage that process more, that would uh, free up staff to work on some other things. And then the likelihood of success for this one is um, low to moderate. So now I'll turn it over to Sarah Noisy, and she's going to give some information on some of the additional direction that we received, we, excuse me, received from council recently and um, the information request we received and some feedback on that for you guys. Good afternoon. So um, in this section, we're primarily responding to the direction that we received at the meeting on um, January 22nd. It was a motion made by Vice Mayor Cummings and um, included a whole um, sort of list of uh, data requests and, and other things of that nature for staff to return with. So um, here we're quoting the direction that we received. Um, this is about bringing back uh, a proposal um, for an application for membership on this task force. Um, sort of identifying the charge of the task force and then um, coming up with a list of proposed members that would be on um, on the task force. And um, we have, we did include a draft application. I think the, the staff report erroneously referred to that as um, being the WASAC application. It was based on the WASAC application, but wasn't, we did do some editing to that and tailor it to the housing task force. Uh, I'm sorry, rental housing task force. Um, and again, um, this is a draft, it is by no means final, um, you know, any, uh, whatever that application may look like at some point in the future will be determined by council or through guidance, perhaps from um, a professional. In this case, we're recommending that this, uh, this document be further developed with the help of CCP um, in terms of developing both the application and then the membership and charge of the committee. So, um, but that said, based on prior council direction, we did understand that where we are now at least, the, the sort of draft charge to this housing, Rental Housing Task Force Committee um, is stated here, the Rental Housing Task Force Committee will use a data-driven approach to policy development with the aim of developing policy proposals that address the needs of both tenants and property owners. That could get more specific over time, that could be broadened over time. Um, so uh, the next piece here is about the membership and based, this is based on primarily feedback that we heard on January 8th. There was a lot of discussion from various council members about um, potential members that could be included in the task force. We might want representatives of all of these various organizations, perhaps some also at large um, representatives. Uh, and this totals, a. Um, this is already at 10. If we just, if there are, is one person representing each of these categories that are listed here, this is a 10 member task force. And we did also hear that we, from council, that you wanted to keep the task force relatively small in the neighborhood of nine to 14 um, potential members. So yet again, we're gonna recommend that CCP guide you through this process and make sure that the right stakeholders are there at the table and part of the conversation from the very beginning. The second item was about doing a community survey or poll. Um, with the stated goal here was providing information about the issues with rental housing problems and the possible responses. Um, so 
there are two different kinds of surveys that we can use that we just um, had a discussion earlier and there was discussion um, on the 8th about some of the drawbacks or challenges with using sort of a survey monkey model and just doing an open survey. Um, you know, there are pros and cons to that, <laughs> which, um, you know, the pros are it's low cost, it's quick to execute, you know, we could get it out there right away. It's very useful for identifying if there is an area of broad community consensus um, or if we are looking to collect anecdotal data stories that people have about their rental housing experience or for crowdsourcing any kind of ideas that people may have about policy proposals that can be a very useful tool. And then obviously the cons are, you know, things that your council has brought up before. There's potential for double voting. They're, they're not statistically relevant. Um, and so depending on the goal, the exact goal for that survey or poll, um, it may be more appropriate to use a more formal polling process, which would be developed by a formal polling firm and would create statistically accurate data and ensure that it was fairly executed and we got a representative cross-section of the community. Um, the cons there are it takes some lead time and there's a cost associated with that, with securing a firm and then um, designing the survey that would be used. So. Again, um, I'll just go back really briefly. The, the goal, the outcome that you're after with that survey or poll is really gonna dictate what's the more appropriate tool. And we're gonna recommend again that CCP guide the council through that process, determining when that's the right tool to use and what the content might be. So um, item three, identifying some data sources about um, rent increases and evictions occurring in the city. So um, the city doesn't currently collect any information about rental rates or evictions. We do have um, a database of rental properties through our rental inspection program. And there is an opportunity there to start to begin collecting that data. Um, we looked around for some models of other you know, places that might be collecting data similar to this. And the city of San Jose, San Jose collects information <laughs> with, um, as each rental unit is registered with the, with the city. And we could model a program after that where we start um, with our annual inspection. We basically, as it is now for the years where um, property owners are self-certifying their, their unit, they, we send them a form, they send it back saying that, you know, yes, we have smoke detectors and my unit is safe and nothing has changed since you were out here last year. Um, we could also add on to that, you know, a few line items that would say, you know, what's the rental rate that you're currently charging and have you had any evictions in the past year? Um, that would be self-reported data. So, you know, that would be subject to um, current data could potentially be verified with the tenant in the unit, but any data that we would try to solicit from those property owners going back in time, would we would have to basically rely on their self-reporting, which would be some data, but may not be, you know, perfect data going back in time. Um, regarding evictions, um, one of the challenges with evictions is that there are a lot of times when tenants move, or move out of a unit um, at the request of a property owner that aren't really a formal eviction, that don't involve written notice, that don't involve, um, you know, involving the courts, that I think that's probably most of the times that tenants move out of units. That said, the data sources that we could um, access are available through process servers, through the county courts and sheriffs, and that would give us a sense of, is there a trend that's happening? Is there an increase or a decrease or a change over time? Um, and that is data that where we could go back in time and get you know, data that as, as, it, as those, um, those filings have happened in years past and we could see if there's been a change recently. Um, and then so finally, because you know, so many of these renter move outs happen without any real paper trail, this may be a place where that community survey or poll would be a useful tool. We could survey renters and, and talk to them about, you know, in the, in the last two years, have you experienced any of the following and um, collect the data in that manner. And again, I'd recommend for that, that we allow CCP to guide us through that process because that seems like a, a poll where we really wanna be sure we're getting statistically relevant data and it probably should be executed by a, um, a formal polling firm. So lastly, um, market implications. Um, in terms of the effect that the um, this conversation around housing and around just cause eviction and Measure M has had potentially on um, the sale of existing rental properties and then and therefore removing them from the market, there is um, th that data is also a little bit hard to track because the tenancy of a housing unit is not something that we keep track of. It's not typically something the city regulates, so it's not something we have in our records. 
That said, we do, as I mentioned, have the rental inspection program where we provide this service to landlords to ensure that their units are safe and, their, and the rent that they're collecting is legitimate. We can cross-reference that database with um, information in the assessor's, uh, the county assessor's property database to look at transfers. Um, and there are some challenges with that. The, the county assessor is typically six to nine months behind in terms of recording all of the property transfers. So, um, you know, we could probably process data from, you know, 2016 and 2017, and then in 2018, we probably wouldn't be able to get the whole year yet. So, um, and that is a pretty significant outlay of staff time in, in doing that level of analysis. So, um, that is one option of how we could figure that out. We also, uh, of course, could contact um, local real estate firms or contact some recent sellers of properties, multifamily properties or properties that we know have been in our rental inspection program and you know, discuss with them what their reasons were for um, transferring the property. So item four was about developing outreach flyers. Um, uh, those were attached to your um, council item, your agenda item today, and um, we have them here. So I, we priced out two different options with local print and mailing firms, um, mailing shops in town, and um, we have somewhere between 40 and 45,000 addresses that we would be mailing to, and we priced out two options. One is for um, a postcard, which is shown on the bottom, so that would be a two-sided postcard and would essentially let folks know that the task force is this process is happening and direct them to a website, which we would develop. Um, and the, or the other option is a larger format flyer that could be printed on both sides and then folded in an envelope. So there are, you know, the different costs for those that they're not radically different. Um, would it, you know, there would allow to be, a, there to be a little bit more information that's printed and included in the envelope um, that goes directly out to all residents and property owners in the city. <coughs> Um, if we are going to choose to do a, um, any kind of community polling activity, this would also be a, um, a tool to announce that. Um, and again, we are gonna recommend that your council allow CCP to help you decide the timing, utility, and function of any kind of flyer or mailer that we send out. So with that, our recommendation, if it wasn't clear by now, <laughs> um, is that your council propose a motion directing the city manager or designee to negotiate and enter into a sole source contract with consensus and collaboration program at Sacramento State University for background and scoping services supporting the establishment of the rental housing task force. We are available for questions. Okay, so at this time it would be uh, appropriate for the council to ask any clarifying questions of staff and then we'll open up to public comment and then return for action and deliberation. Clarifying questions? Councilmember Glover. Thank you. Um, thank you for that wonderful presentation and for coming back with what looks like a lot of what we had asked for in the beginning, which is fantastic. Um, I was curious, you'd mentioned the difficulty of uh, obtaining requests or records, I should say, from other sources outside of the processing judicial system that went to court. Is there, am I correct in saying that? Um, sure, yeah. Okay. Um, is there a way that we could uh, request records from all of the registered rental units and landlords in order to make it so that they're in compliance with the city? I mean, you know, be like, hey, is it something that we would have to pass as policy that says, hey, all uh, rental units should submit the last two to five years of their rental agreements so that we can track what they've been doing with their rentals? Or is that feasible? I would actually defer to the city attorney on the legality of that. Any thoughts? My recollection from reviewing um, other cities' rent control ordinances is that some require um, that landlords provide notice to the city of an eviction um, as part of the rent control program. So um, I talked to uh, the vice mayor about this before the meeting and what I said was that I would need to do a little bit of further research in order to flesh that out. Mm -hmm. but, I, but I think there may be a precedent for that type of thing out there. I just, I just have not done that um, analysis or research to determine if that's legally feasible. I just feel like that would be- I have the sense that it probably, that there probably would be some mechanism by which we could um, require that information to be provided. 
but I'm, I'm not prepared to respond. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I just want to know the yeah. logistics around it. And then one more um, is the sale of the rental units, uh, which you had mentioned in the presentation, is trying to track since Measure M and the impact and all that. Um, well, during the campaigning process of Measure M and the opponents of it, there was literature being sent out by realtors urging people to sell their properties um, to avoid any over looming regist regulations that they may face should Measure M pass. Um, it, I feel like it would be important to include the data set of homes sold from the pressure and or fear put in them by a realtor company of the ramifications of Measure M and not just have those under the category of sold with reaction to Measure M because there's a clear differential in my opinion mm -hmm. there. Okay. And now Council Member Matthews and then Council Member Brown. Um, could you quickly go over the four items that you're recommending we refer to CCP? Absolutely. So uh, let's start with item one and go in order. Uh, so the first is about developing the application, the specific charge, and the membership of the um, of the task force. This would be part of CCP's effort to essentially scope the process um, and guide us through that. So the second item is about the utility and timing and um, content of any community polling or surveying activity we would do. Um, the third item is about uh, collecting data, exactly what type of data are we gonna need to have a data-driven process? And then item four is about the flyer. Um, what's the content, what's the timing, what's the purpose of that? Okay, thanks. Um, I'm very supportive of the idea to um, contract with a firm that has uh, experience, a third party. Um, I think in all of this, the first thing is to be somewhat clear and we'll need their help on this with defining the charge. Um, in some places, I looked at their description of services. Generally, it refers to a rental housing task force. In a couple places, it refers to a tenants' rights task force. So right off the bat, and when, we, um, when we're talking about collection of data and so forth, does it expand to um, impacts on uh, or trends in rental housing supply. So um, the, it raises a lot of question to me is what are we asking them to do? And to my mind, um, their work on charge precedes the application. I had quite a bit of comments on the application form. Mm -hmm. I think it's, um, it's very directed mm -hmm. in the sure. message that it sends and leaves out some critical um, uh, possible participants that could be useful. Um, similarly with the research, there's an infinite number, amount of research we could gather. I think we rely on them to say what's going to be significant and doable within a certain pod, um, budget. Um, the flyers are really the last step, <laughs> it seems to me. Um, so it's really not worth commenting much on those. Uh, that'll come out of there. Uh, their recommendations. I, I endorse the recommendation and their approach. The, the main thing in my mind is defining what's the scope. Okay, so we have additional questions and then we'll open it up for the com our community and then we'll come back for um, statements and deliberation. So, Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor Watkins. I'd like to return. First of all, um, my understanding is that this is an opportunity to ask questions, clarifying questions, rather than weighing in on uh, the proposal itself right now before we hear from the public. So I'd like to go to public comment, but I just want to return to uh, Council Member Glover's question um, that um, the city attorney um, commented on um, and suggest that I, I am aware of um, a s number of, of jurisdictions that have uh, such um, such um, provisions, whether in a rent control ordinance or a, as a separate um, ordinance on, on the books within the, the jurisdiction for um, requiring notifica notification from landlords regarding um, uh, evictions, notices um, uh, to vacate and rent increases. So I think that there is some uh, some research that could be done to kind of look at what is out there just um, for your information. Um, and I think, so that was the, the main comment I had, but the, my question was um, specifically if you could if you could clarify based upon any other research about the potential to do that retroactively. I mean, I, I would guess 
probably not, but maybe moving forward. So if you know, if you just to put that in the mix for questions to be answered uh, at a future date, um, that would be something I'd be interested in hearing about. Um, so I, I did note that. that part of uh, Councilmember Glover's comment, and that would be something that I would look into, and I have that same concern. But, and my recollection is the same as yours with regard to other jurisdictions. Um, I just didn't want to speak out of turn, particularly where we attempted last fall to, to modify some notice requirements with respect to evictions, and um, you know, we got stymied in that effort. So, um, but, but I'm happy to look into it. Thank you, appreciate that. Okay, clarifying questions from Vice Mayor Cummings, and then um, no, first, I'm sorry, Vice Mayor Cummings first, and then no, Councilor McCrone. No, Chris was first. Chris, I'm sorry, Chris, okay, Chris, uh, uh, Councilor McCrone, clarifying questions. Postcards, who's it gonna go to? Like, what's the universe? So what we priced out are all residents and property owners in Santa Cruz, and that, that number lands somewhere between 40 and 45,000. And that was based on the motion made by Vice Mayor Cummings. And I don't wanna, maybe you said it, but the, the elephant in the room is like 400, to 450,000, is that what we're looking at, the final price tag of this, if we went all the way? I, I think that's probably fair. Our estimates in the staff report are just that, estimates, um, but the top level is at about 400,000. And um, is there a timeline? Uh, so each scenario has its own timeline that we have, again, uh, suggested. These things can be flexible, they can change. I would estimate if you went for the full process, it would be somewhere between 12 months to potentially upwards of, and this is securing consultants, going through the process, developing recommendations, bringing them back for action, acting on them, having them memorialized. I'd say for a thorough process that uh, goes through all of, and again, Dave is here, he can speak to this if, uh, if you have questions of him, but I'd say reasonably 12 to potentially 16 months. Who's Dave? I'm sorry, Mr. Sipos is here from the uh, Center for Collaboration oh, from Sacramento right. State. Oh, so good. he is here to answer questions if you have anything. Thank you. Okay. Vice Mayor Cummings? I actually have questions for David if it's okay. Yeah, Dave, would you like to join us? Sure. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, the, one of the questions I had is um, there's been a lot of concern, concern in the uh, community around timeline for the process. And I was just curious if you could speak to, you know, walk the community through kind of some of the initial stages of um, the background analysis report that you'd be interested in conducting and then how that would lead to the formation of the task force and then um, a, a, a timeline roughly of how long this might take. Sure. Um, the assessment process, which is what the initial kind of conceptual proposal we put together, uh, can be done relatively quickly within six to eight weeks or so, but that, that will frankly depend on a couple of administrative variables and, and availability variables of the participants would ultimately be included in that assessment. Thereafter, and uh, I think to the point that, that staff had already made, and is really evidenced in the report, uh, and I don't think I have to sort of preach to the choir, so to speak. And this is a clearly a, a very emotional, values-laden topic in this community and in all communities throughout the state of California that are dealing similarly with it. Um, while by no means dogmatic, uh, we have a general approach that we do in our efforts, which, um, and, and this is all very directly informed from the assessment process, and the first stage is uh, what we call education. You know, it's one of the things that, to the data point that, that Council Member Matthews was speaking of, and that's one of the things we would assess. We would look to work with the people we interview to start pulse checking, if you will, where the various data sources are. I, I frankly would like <coughs> to applaud for that. It's worth for you as council and to staff that you, you really wove data-driven into this because on issues that are highly emotional and highly values laden, um, data can be a very, very valuable tool to normalize, if you will, where, where folks are at. Um, and so in that regard, getting a sense and pulse checking through the assessment process of finding out what kind of information is really necessary and the education stage, the early stages, 
are both bringing external education or information in, if you will, to, help, to try to help inform however conflicting various pieces of information might be. But the education process is also the stakeholders themselves, the, the, the journey that they're taking, walking through each other's shoes, if you will, and, and getting to a point where various stakeholders involved in the task force process or any kind of stakeholder process, they aren't necessarily required, certainly at the outset, to agree, but we want early on to start getting them to understand um, the motivators and the needs that each other has. Oftentimes in the process we do that, what people start to see is when we can strip away some of the ideology, um, there can be a, an effort of less demonizing, more sharing, more understanding of we're actually looking for very similar things. We just may be operationalizing it in different ways. Moving from education, then you start going into negotiation. And I'm, I use the term negotiation sort of loosely, but we in general start trying to work people through negotiating ideas in principle and then moving folks to negotiating ideas in detail. That's a very, con, you know, kind of coming, you start at a macro stage and you sort of move in, in greater detail. Um, I'm just giving you a sense of sort of process here. In terms of that process, I think that staff is accurate. Uh, this is not a, it's not a fast process to be very blunt. Um, I, I can't give you an exact amount, but I think that the, the target that they set of you know 12 to 16 months, I think is reasonable based upon a number of other cases that I've done in local jurisdictions and elsewhere of a similar size and with a similar level of conflict and volatility. So uh, my, my underlying message is it's not a fast process. And I wish I could tell you otherwise, um, but I don't. My professional opinion is it's not. Th thank you for being here and thank you for answering our questions. Sure. Do you have any additional questions before we open it up for public comment? I just curious, out of curiosity, um, what's the plan in terms of identifying the stakeholders within this um, process? Well, I think we would, well, to be interviewed or to ultimately become to be interviewed of the task force. Uh, Frankly, I would, I would look to work with staff and very likely recommendations from council of, you know, a cross section of opinion leaders, if you will. I mean, it, there's a term that I oftentimes use, which is in an assessment needs to be representative, but not exhaustive. You, you can't have a budget enough to do that. I think that's in some ways where the idea of a poll or a survey comes in, but as is evidenced by the, the staff report, there are absolutely pros and cons. And I, I agree with the what they listed. Um, so you, you can use various forms to sort of pulse check, but ultimately you want a reasonable representative cross-section of some opinion leaders, uh, people who have got a, a and, and when I say opinion leaders, I mean folks who have been actively engaged, people who are, who are, to be honest, very well versed in the topic areas, and people who have networks. You, you don't, you want to avoid in a process like this um, having a set of stakeholders sitting at a table who are, principally, even if accidentally, speaking for themselves. You, you, want to, you want to capitalize on those networks and, and frankly, oftentimes within a charter of a group, uh, mandate it, that, that they have a responsibility by virtue of sitting on a task force to be showing steps that they are taking to communicate with their broader you know, issue constituencies and, and bring that back because that can become a danger because you can have people sitting at a table es essentially acting as if they have a proxy and that can come back to, to bite you. And you, so you want to try to capitalize on, like I said, even mandating that networking. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Councilmember Brown and then Councilmember Glover, clarifying questions. Um, I just want to say uh, that I uh, thank you for uh, your willingness to step forward with this proposal and to bring us something in a uh, with a very quick turnaround time. You know, I and I, so I really appreciate that you've um, put some considerable thought into something that um, is um, obviously uh, challenging, highly contentious. Um, and potentially leading you down the road of, of <laughs> speaking, <laughs> <laughs> engaging in that in that, no, um, that what public, I do for a living. <laughs> um, debate. Um, so, uh, just a, a quick question: uh, If you could talk a little bit about your approach to, you know, one of the things I think we made a commitment to uh, is um, ensuring that uh, stakeholders who do um, come forward and rep are representative on the task force that um, there be um, an expression of willingness to not really have any lines in the sand with respect to um, you know developing proposals um, bringing um, you know bringing items for discussion and I know that that's something that has challenged us as we've moved through this the process of discussing uh, in particular rent control and um, just cause eviction so I'm just wondering if you could talk for a moment about your approach to ensuring that um, you know we we get a stakeholder pool 
um, that that where we have people who are really committed to engaging in the process and not just being um, you know roadblocks. I know that's kind of difficult to um, uh, to you know to say to, to you know have any real confidence that we can do that, but just how you would how you would approach that. Sure. Um, you know, I, I've been doing this a very long time, and I and I earnestly and sincerely, both in sort of general life and professionally, I, I very much like to believe and do believe that people are benign individuals, is what I call it. People come with the best of intentions. There are ways in which they act that that we observe, and that we may, you know, I may observe somebody's behavior and 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 question it, but it doesn't mean that that person's motives are nefarious or in any way, shape, or form. We are we are the creatures of the that which we believe. Um, to your point, yes, we can and should um, assess whether people can come in with an, an open mind. Most people that I know and most people that I've dealt with would, in that question, would more than likely say, yes, of course I can. Um, but we all come with our, our predisposed considerations. Um, you can codify those kinds of things, and depending on how you define membership, I mean, and I'm not advocating, I want to be very clear about this, I'm not advocating, but I certainly have had groups where through a larger convening entity such as a body of elected officials, you you create the terms for membership. And some of those terms of membership is how folks will function and I, I wish I had a better term, but behave, if you will. Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that uh, because again, I, I think that automatically sits, it's a little like a prenup agreement. You're already sort of presuming that there might be some, some in, intent other than that. Um, I think at the end of the day, uh, what we want to look for is people who are willing to come to the come to the table and just earnestly look you in the eye, and say, "Yeah, th this this is a challenging question, and it's a challenging thing, and I want to try to be open-minded." And and then the process, you know, I, however cliche this may sound, the process of a stakeholder engagement, a multi-party method that we use. Uh, if you think about standard negotiating and you know, a sort of a binary negotiation. Uh, you go to buy a car or something. There's a very binary. The one person wants to sell it for as much. One person wants to buy it for as little as much. Um, the process of getting into a structured, focused, facilitated conversation is a matter of a process of discovery. And people can begin to see options that they did not previously think were possible or they didn't even conceptualize. And however cliche this sounds, you make the pie bigger. So it isn't about who gets to divvy up the finite space of the pie. It's can you get people into a dialogue and they can start seeing opportunities that previously didn't exist. Again, I admit that's cliche. And yet I've been doing this a long time and that's exactly what happens. So you ask people the good question, you ask them to commit, and then you let the process play itself out. And hopefully that process itself delivers those kinds of options. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Crone, I'm sorry, Councilmember Glover, and then uh, uh, Matthews, and then hope, we'll hopefully we can get to public comment. Right. Any brief questions? Yes. Hello, and thank you. Good evening. Um, really appreciate you. Are you from Sacramento? I live in Davis. Well, thank you for coming down from Davis to be here with us tonight. Um, I was just curious. Uh, Let's color your shirt, by the way. Good selection. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Purple power. <laughs> Nice There's um, the, just, I was kind of taken back by the 12 to 16 month timeline. I understand it's a, it's a slow process and I work at the Resource Center for Nonviolence so I understand the process of communication and working through conflict. And um, in your experience, because you said that this is a conversation happening in different places around California, I take it this isn't your first rodeo when it comes to uh, dealing with this kind of uh, conflict. What have other municipalities or jurisdictions done to protect the vulnerable people in the community during that dialogue process. Because one of the things that I've been most concerned about is that throughout the process of this task force being structured and then going through the process, uh, that there will be unjust action taking place. Uh, in the meantime, there's been a concern from the community that establishing any kind of temporary protections would invalidate the process of the task force because of the uh, seemingly rubber stamping of policy by the city council that then would be pushed into the conversation of the task force. So in your experience, have other jurisdictions done things in the interim while this 12 to 16 month process is underway to keep low and middle income people in their homes? I'm gonna answer that in a couple of ways. Um, I, I wish that I could give you a, an encyclopedic response of what other communities are doing, and I, I don't think I really can on this. I mean, I, I have worked on this topic and related topics about land use and planning in other places. Conceptually, what you're describing is is 
absolutely a concern and a risk on, on both sides that you just sort of articulated. Mm -hmm. um, yes, if you start trying to do things early on as a means of protecting whomever you seek to protect, the overarching fear is that that immediate temporary action becomes a proxy right. or is presumed to be a proxy. And I think that there's a, frankly a danger there. Um, and the flip side to that is also true that if you do not do something, then you have an unprotected class of individuals. And so there's no easy answer. I, I so um, a process step, again, I'm not going to say I recommend this in this case, because I haven't done an assessment, but a process step that I commonly do. Um, and in fact, we, you're, as a city, you are involved currently with another project I am working in in this area, which is the Santa Margarita Groundwater Basin um, and Santa Margarita Agency. Um, and your Director Menard is, is very actively involved, who, by the way, Director Menard is an extraordinary resource on this topic. She's, I've worked with her in the past and she knows this topic about collaborative multi-party negotiating. Um, one of the things that we do oftentimes and one of the things that we did early on is that rather than setting framings of what can or can't happen, um, I oftentimes advocate early in a process to develop what, what I call, and it can go by various names, guiding principles. What, what are the principles that right out of the box we can agree and we can get a group to agree, and I can be a living document, that starts articulating the shared interest and the shared values. Um, that's not necessarily to be clear, it may undo itself protecting a class of citizens, mm. but it is setting forth a messaging that what this group is about and what the people that have been asked to sit at this about are universally committed to a set of principles and they're gonna be guided by those principles. They're gonna quite literally use it as a totem and, and refer back to it to, to help guide when, the in, when increasingly challenging decisions start happening. Um, it is symbolic by, by, by no definition or by no, no argument to that. However, in almost every case that I've done where some that or something to that effect, uh, I see members, if you will, of a group like that regularly then referring back to, well, we said we were committed to do this. And we said we were committed to sort of abide by this kind of, we hold this truth to be self-evident kind of statement. And that's a very valuable and powerful <laughs> thing that can be, even if it begins symbolically, relatively through the process, it becomes quite applied. So I, can it achieve all the things that it sounds to me like you're trying to achieve? Probably not. Right. Can it set a framework in going, going forward and set a different tone? I firmly believe it can. Thank you. Thanks, Councilmember Matthews, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to understand the process. So as I'm reading this, I'm under the impression that you're talking about two groups of discussion participants. One is early on some, um, you're calling them uh, influencers or thought leaders or experienced people that you will interview individually or some other member of your team will to get a feeling for the, the topic. And out of that, I'm, I'm to kind of, trying to abbreviate, out of that will come your recommendations for um, how to define the charge and how to, how to structure um, solicitation of members in the active public task force of it, like two different groups of people. There may be some overlap, there may, may I, not. There oftentimes is overlap. I, I'm not really even sure, to be honest, I'm not really sure I would define the first set of people. I'm using semantics here myself, but as a group, it's just a set of oh, people that you go to. Yeah, yeah individuals. So, so. Um, there is oftentimes overlap. I think that to the point that, frankly, you earlier you know, made in your comments a few minutes ago about, I, these are my words, not yours, putting the cart before the horse, uh, I would tend to agree. Uh, putting an application out on the streets right now, I think is premature. It's all like buying construction materials for a, a building you haven't designed yet. You know, you, 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 and because you have a whole set of processes to get, get put in place and decide on, such as how would a group, how would this actual task force be seated? You know, how would the decisions ultimately be made? How many who selects what cross section, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, are, so are they first, appointed, are they not? The first group, for background purposes for you, what, what, um, existing work are we looking at, what data do we want to collect, all of this. That would come out of a um, defined group, again, for the mayor's, I guess, um, uh, and staff's suggestion on how to structure, to give you suggested names of people that you might want to include in the initial interview. Correct. And then you do that, and out of those interviews would come the plan. Right, and and I, you know, to be honest, in my proposal, uh, that number of participants was fairly modest. I, I, I'm not saying that's inappropriately so, it just was. 
it, as you may have noticed, I recommended that I interview or one of my staff interview all of you as council members because one of the most single detrimental things that can occur is uh, have a group formed and then begin its process and accidentally go afield from where <laughs> the elected body wishes for things to go. That is that is a loss of faith and trust in a lot of different form forms. So okay. you, you I, would be I part of that. I just want to get clear mm -hmm. on that. Thank yes. You. Well, thank you so much for being here. Sure. Clearly you're an ab absolute expert in the work that you're doing <laughs> and describing, so we appreciate you taking the time to be here. I think at this point we'll go ahead and open it up to public comment and then we'll return back to Council for Action and Deliberation. <coughs> thank you thank very you. much. I just want to start with um, acknowledging, and I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Long, uh, Longinati, we have a couple of groups who will be speaking to us first who've requested additional time in advance. Um, and that is Lynn Rinshaw from Santa Cruz Together and Cynthia Berger from Santa Cruz Tennis Association. And you will each have four minutes to address the council. Do you want to do all tennis? <laughs> And you'll be given four minutes. <clears throat> okay. Lynn Renshaw, Santa Cruz Together.com. Santa Cruz Together is a coalition of thousands of local business owners, community leaders, homeowners, renters, and housing providers. Personally, I've lived in Santa Cruz for over 30 years. My career is software marketing, and I'm a volunteer. The Rental Housing Task Force requires a complete reset from Measure M. The task force scope should be a range of rental housing solutions. Santa Cruz Together agrees there's a severe affordable housing shortage and is willing to participate in an authentic data-driven analysis of options and their impacts on the rental housing supply and rents. A complete analysis would cover immediate impacts, potential repercussions, future rental supply, and rents a decade later and beyond. Measure M alternatives could include means-tested housing subsidies, affordable by design housing, a workforce housing initiative, and more. We need robust dialogue, facts, and evidence in a proper amount of time. Task force materials suggest starting with device of Measure M. The outside firm CCP outlines its background research as a study of Measure M. Why not instead study best practices from other cities addressing the West Coast affordable housing crisis? <coughs> Task force applicants are asked how Measure M should be changed. Why not ask applicants about their housing expertise? Just cause evictions are an identified objective. By implying JCE is the outcome, this process is already further eroding public confidence in the council. JCE is one of the worst policies in decades as evidenced by broad voter opposition. The political will of the community will not support JCE. Voters expect normal contract law to continue where end dates of mutually agreed upon leases can be enforced. JCE is a bridge too far. It's toxic, divisive, and perceived as forced on the community by a small group of activists. Your job is to hear the community. The council received over 1,500 letters opposing JCE with less than 35 letters in support. 19,000 voters said no to J JCE, a margin of nearly two to one. At some point, defying the majority will catch up with you. 60% of homeowners are expecting the freedom to live their lives with flexibility. The city should not pass laws that restrict what they can and cannot do with their houses. We need a complete reset and rental policy study, particularly now that Proposition 10 failed, Measure M and JCE are a spectacularly bad fit where 75% of renters rely on single family homes that can be easily repurposed as owner occupied property. It's a spectacularly bad fit for all future renters since rents are unlimited on all future rentals. And it's a spectacularly bad fit for homeowners <clears throat> that want to live their, ho their lives without city interference. The affordable housing shortage is self-evident. The majority of our community understood that Measure M will make the affordable housing shortage worse. The task force should reset and automatically look authentically <laughs> look for solutions that work now and in the future. 
santacruztogether.com. Thank you. All right. And now we will hear from our uh, representative of the Santa Cruz Tenants Association. And you will also have four minutes. Hi everyone, thank you for this opportunity. I'm Cynthia Berger with Santa Cruz Tenants Association. I've run the county's only bilingual uh, tenants rights hotline for the last five years. And I have a list of over a thousand people who have called me ready for any kind of survey you'd like to possibly do personally with them. Um, I'm concerned that um, renters, tenants be uh, heard from in this issue, not, and it's not only about building housing. Um, there's other issues besides building housing that need to be addressed and that are more immediate and that involve human lives <coughs> today. Um, the, as far as the task force, um, oh, and I'd like to say, I've always had a great landlord and paid really reasonable rent. Um, just wanna let folks know that. Um, I think that um, I had some questions. I agreed with Cynthia Matthews about the name. It was confusing. Um, I, my preference is that we discuss tenant protections because there aren't any. Um, housing is another issue for other people and it's a whole completely different issue than tenant protections, which we don't have any on the books here. Um, we have a lot of housing regulations though. I think that um, all the flyers and the applications were, were also premature. I have some questions about the uh, appointment process for the task force. Uh, does the Brown Act apply to members of appointed bodies? And if so, how does it affect communications among members when they're meeting outside of the committee activities? And um, that's the main question I have about that. I, I just wasn't clear on that. Um, I, I just wanna know that the city of Santa Barbara did this exact same kind of thing in about 2017, and the same kind of task force and um, you know, it didn't have the greatest outcome. You can read all about it. Um, I'd, I'd like to also point out that tenant protections are controversial even to academics. As many local academics took public positions during the recent rent control campaign. And we'd just like some assurance that Mr. Uh, Seppo and the facilitation, Seppos, facilitation team will examine their opinions and assumptions and biases before beginning um, any such job as this. I don't believe that they have conducted a similar study um, or a, you know, facilitated a similar exact kind of study about tenant protection. So, um, you know, this is a facilitation where you're, you may be dealing with one side that has extreme power and another side that has just extreme lack of power. That might be a little different from a, other facilitation, I don't know, but we just want like to make sure that you examine any possible unconscious biases before beginning this job. Um, so the only folks I know who don't have strong feelings about rent control are my unhoused uh, friends, pretty much. Um, <clears throat> renters, uh, in order to walk in people's shoes, I think renters need to be able to examine the books of several landlords to understand their claims. And um, they need to look, be able to look at the financials. So that would be something I think that a committee like this could be useful for walking folks through as, as education. The city does need data and like many California cities dealing with their rental emergencies, they realize there are no collection mechanisms established to get that data. So I have a list that I will share from the city of Long Beach. They had an extensive study session on this also in 2017 and I will forward you the list and it has some sort of innovative things and you can, Thank you. Yeah, and we'll look out for your email. Okay. So those are the two organizations that reached out in advance for additional time. So now we'll open up to public comment and members of the public public can address the council for uh, two minutes. Okay, great. Yeah, so uh, I uh, oppose all of the uh, recommendations uh, for a task force and I would think that the staff should go back to the drawing board and and come up with a different kind of task force, one that concentrates mostly on how to build low cost to construct housing, because that is the only kind of housing that will be affordable. 
If you build a $400,000 ADU behind a million dollar house, it won't be affordable. It doesn't matter how many of them you've built. But I actually wanted to read this, so I'm just gonna go ahead with that. Measure M is the vampire zombie that is never allowed to die. A task force that has any objectives of any part of Measure M is once again violating the will of the people. I voted against every word of Measure M and it's time to put a stake into every part of Measure M and bury it. When two parties have the same goal, they can talk and compromise if they have differences on how to reach the goal, but that's not what we have here. That's why some of this mediation idea is not that great. We have two parties with different goals and very different problems. Uh, there cannot be any single resolution to that condition. I won't get into the goals, how they're different of landlords and tenants, but I, I will talk about problems. The problems landlords face is an oppressive government who seeks to grant special interest favors to tenants at their and housing industries considerable peril and expense. Their earned property rights are in jeopardy by a city council that seems not to understand inflation is beyond their control, that involuntary regulation of retail prices and contracts create housing supply chain havoc besides just being morally wrong. The damage will play out over a very long time, but damage it will be. The problems that tenants face is none, none of the unproven, unsubstantiated, spews lies Thank of you. oppression. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Thank you for your uh, Can I submit this for your- Absolutely, you can. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, Rick Longinati. I'm just noticing, I, I think already you're ta just talking about a task force and c a community dialogue process has kind of mellowed things out. Um, I had a similar reaction to Council Member Myers, or uh, uh, Matthews, that, um, you know, the, about the charge of, of this task force not being uh, as defined as, as I think it could be. Um, with the Water Supply Advisory Committee, we had a clear charge from the council. It was to uh, analyze potential solutions to deliver a safe, adequate, reliable, affordable, and environmentally sustainable water supply. Um, and so we, you know, we were constantly uh, reflecting back on that charge, and, and I think it would really help expedite matters for this committee if, if you got clearer. But, but I wanna suggest to you that you've already got the charge because you've had a process at least since 2017 when Mayor Chase was doing her listening sessions and it came out with the Santa Cruz Voices on Housing Fall 2017 Community Engagement Report. Uh, and there were three topic areas, housing production, housing protection, and community vitality. So um, the, the housing blueprint subcommittee that some of you were on um, submitted recommendations to the council based on those three areas. And the one area that uh, was kind of left up to the voters was the housing protection and the voters voted down measure M, but the need remains for housing protection. And I think that word protection is key. And I think that forms the basis of, of your charge for this committee. Um, so uh, I, I think that just this, the, the timeline that, you know, and the Water Supply Advisory Committee was given a one year timeline, it got extended for six months. I think there are reasons for that, that we were, we were not, you know, one of them being we were not all, all up to speed about uh, what could possible solutions there are. But, you know, in the, in the world of, of trying to, uh, Thank you, and you're welcome to submit your Just let me finish comments. my sentence. Just you know, I, I try to keep it really consistent so that everybody gets their uh, equal amount of time. Oh, okay. So I appreciate that and right. understanding that. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay, you have your chance. Hi there, I'm natealex.kennedy at gmail.com and what I have to say I think is one of the most important things that we need that isn't really, really being addressed here is mandatory rental inspections. Before anybody can rent a room, anybody can rent a house, we need to have the places inspected. We need to have it so that uh, it, any deaths or suicides in a, in a property that have happened within the last five years should be mandatorily disclosed which I personally have experience with. Um, we also need it so that uh, one of the last places, or one place that I rented a long time ago, um, I was, I had to move out within about two days because the place was, uh, was 
had bed bugs, it had old garbage in the room that was listed as furnishings on the, on the rental agreement. Uh, there had been heavy meth use in the house, so heavy that like when I was there for two days, I could hardly get to sleep because of what I felt, what I had been inhaling from the previous tenants. We need to really take Take care of this. I think that mandatory rental inspections should happen with every single property that is being rented, whether it's a whole house or just a room. It is, this is that important. And the place I had been at with the uh, bed bugs, the meth use, the plumbing didn't even work in the bathroom. There were so many reasons that this place should not have been rented and uh, it was rented to me and all these problems together slammed me so hard that I, ha I was forced out within about 72 hours and I never even got my friggin' money back. So Drew, uh, Justin and Sandy, can you all please get back to me ASAP? Thank, Thank you. you. Next speaker. Hello, my name is Elena Cohen, and I'd like to thank both the uh, City Council and the staff for really putting together a very thoughtful uh, option d description. And um, I'm very supportive of the staff recommendation for um, using CP CCP and um, having data-driven analysis. And I'd just like to respond to some of the comments that have been made by other people here. Um, I think that we all actually really want to have uh, fair, uh, improved, affordable uh, rental housing. And the controversy really is, is what's the best way to do that? And um, so uh, I think that um, uh, having, building affordable housing is absolutely crucial, but to me that seems like it's outside uh, the scope of this particular task force. And I would like to see the task force uh, focus on um, the, looking at these issues objectively. I think both sides have talked about um, some of the um, uh, undercurrents of, uh, of our um, uh, prejudices, uh, known or unknown, um, and, uh, and I think it's really important to not to start with Measure M and just cause eviction, but rather to start with our currently existing laws and, and talk about how we can improve it from there because I think that um, if we start from these very confusing and divisive um, uh, options that we're really going to get, uh, we're going to go off on uh, a tangent that is not helpful. And um, so, and I, and I think the, the last thing I'd like to say is that um, an interim action, um, while I really understand how important that is, can really uh, cause uh, um, homeowners to uh, feel that um, they don't want to get involved with renting. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, next. Good afternoon, Council. My name is Fred Antaki. I've been involved in commercial and residential real estate here in Santa Cruz in this area for the past 30 years. Um, I want to just echo something a previous speaker said about the uh, focus. There's the three-part focus of the creation of housing, there's the preservation of housing, there's overall community health. And I think those three things are related and they can't be separated. So. I'll just read what I wrote, which is, um, I applaud you guys for your cautious, reasoned approach to a contentious, emotionally laden issue. My experience has shown that there's agreement on the problem, the shortage of housing, particularly affordable housing, but there's deep disagreement on the solution to that problem. Protections need to be provided for everyone's rights, renters and property owners, who need to be fairly represented in a broad coalition of community stakeholders. It's laudable to commit the time and financial resources, but I'm also concerned that council not forget its obligation to focus on creation of housing. If no concrete actions are taken, my concern is that we will lose local control and, and instead have the state step in and set standards with more generic mandates to create housing. For that reason, I hope that's not forgotten in the process of discovery and effective and collective problem solving. And thank you again for what you guys are doing. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, Carol Paul Hamas. Thanks for listening to yet another of my comments. Um, I was part of the short-term vacation rental task force and as you get ready to set up another task force, I would like to share um, the feelings that some of us, many of us had on the short-term vacation rental task force, whereas um, Cynthia said, 
the it was sort of directive. The way it was set up, it was directive. It was too directive. People felt like there was already an agenda. There was already a staff uh, bias, for lack of a better word. And that's something to be avoided at all costs, I think, because people are volunteering their time. This is a really hotly debated subject, like that was. And if people, uh, if you really wanna get people's most creative ideas, it needs to be fair, it needs to be objective, it needs to be transparent as little guided as possible, in my humble opinion. Not, I mean, you know, we're not gonna have like a 12 year task force, but maybe a timeline that's guided, but not an agenda that's guided. Um, I just think that's really important. I think people do have creative ideas. I'm really grateful for the opportunity that you have helped us, you know, present the city to talk about it because there are multi layers and multiple solutions. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, next speaker. Hello, my name is Shelley Kniep, and I'm a housing provider in Santa Cruz. Mayor Watkins and city council members, anyone on this council who votes to retain any of the procedures outlined in the defeated Measure M is not honoring the will of the people or the principles of democracy. To go against the majority of voters smacks of aut autocracy, tyranny, and dictatorship. Measure M was defeated by a two-third majority. Woman up or man up and gracefully accept its defeat. Please stop being sore losers. The women and men of Santa Cruz have spoken. We don't want Measure M or any part of it. Please stop thumbing your nose at democracy and those who provide housing. Please stop blame, putting the blame where it does not belong. To do otherwise is oppressive, repressive, and unjust. Previously today, there was a proposal based on a model of Boulder, Colorado. I lived in Boulder for 34 years. I raised my family there. The City Council of Boulder looked at rent control about 15 years ago. And what they decided after looking at the facts of the studies is that they decided not to implement rent control. Why? Because it ultimately hurts those in poverty, as Bernie Sanders has also said. Thank you. Hello, council members, uh, my name is Faz. Um, I wanted to thank you uh, for really just getting this process going and doing what previous councils have failed to do, which is uh, really bring people together on this discussion. And I think having the city facilitate this is really um, a good step forward. Um, I've heard what people from the opposition have been saying about housing supply. Um, I also have to agree with one of the one of the women who just came up to speak and saying how that's not really part of this conversation. This conversation isn't about housing supply, right? This is, I think, tenant protections and housing supply are two completely different issues. Um, you have to protect the people who currently live here, and I think that this task force should be centered around tenant protections, whether it be about rent control or just cause evictions or any other potential policies. I think if we really want this process to be comprehensive, then we have to look at everything. But I think housing supply and talking talking about creation of affordable housing is, is just not relevant to this specific issue. Uh, renters have an immediate crisis. The people who live here have an immediate crisis. And the discussions in this task force need to be centered around those who are uh, most marginalized and the most uh, <coughs> displaced and most affected from the housing crisis. Um, I also wanted to just say that um, I think in regards to the timeline, um, I understand this needs to be a thorough process. I would also like the council to keep in mind that because we don't have any temporary protections right now for renters, or we have very minimal protections, I think it would be uh, worth considering to m find a way in which we can shorten that timeline because renters need protections as soon as possible and also to consider what kind of timeline we can have that will make it short but also make it a thorough process. So I'd just like the council to consider that uh, moving forward. Thank you. Good afternoon, council. I just wanted to start out by saying this might be one of those extremely rare occasions where I'm like really in agreement with city recommendations. <laughs> I wanna point that out. So um, I have to say I was not too happy when I first started hearing Justin recommending a task force and I thought that with the power differential, differential 
excuse me, differential, as Cynthia brought up, um, that it would be unlikely that we could have a task force that would help um, in a more um, fair way. And due to the level of oppression that I think the power differential, um, it's, it's really real. So anyway, I'm getting, I wanna make sure I'm watching my time. So first of all, um, I have heard wonderful things about mediation process and it sounds like Mr. Sephos, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, is um, extremely well versed. I especially liked what he said about how in an emotional and value laden situation like this, having a data driven um, kind of uh, directive really helps to take people into a more neutral place. The other thing was uh, guiding principles. I think that sounded extremely helpful. Um, so just all in all, I really like the sound of it. My One of my main concerns is somebody who has been deeply investigating uh, homeless, the in general homeless populations, homeless providers, city government and all this, I just wanna say that Homeless people absolutely need to have representation on this task force. Please don't overlook that. So many people uh, think the number I'm gonna run out of time was 3,000 in 2014, 2015, according to the grand jury investigation. Now it's being cited as 1,500. Where did all those people go? Some of them are in their cars. How are they gonna get a postcard? Please consider this thoroughly. Please, I recommend this, you vote yes, thank you. Okay. Next speaker. <coughs> Uh, hi, my name is uh, Jeff VC, and uh, I've been a uh, Santa Cruz uh, landlord and resident for 37 years, a long time. So I'm in it for the long term. I have six rentals. I don't want to sell them. I don't want to convert them to anything else. So I really like the idea of this task force. I think that it definitely needs to be a reset. It needs to start from ground zero, and we need to, and we need to have people from, like, that list was great. And I fit on that because I have six rentals. I, I would volunteer in a minute, to be on it. I work part-time, I could do it. I don't know who I need to talk to about it. But uh, anyway, so let me continue. Uh, I, I support this, you know, the uh, task force, as, as it said, uh, because it's data-driven. And we have lots of data. There's data, I mean, not only here, we don't have too much data here, but there's d data from San Francisco, Berkeley, Santa Monica, a lot of cities that are put in rent control. We know what happens when you restrict l landlords' uh, 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 their control of the rental properties. And so the question is, I really think, is how much do you want to restrict the control? And it's really gonna come up to the city council to decide, because the more you restrict it, the more landlords are gonna sell or convert properties. So it's gonna be a balance. And I really think it's gonna be your decision. And I'm not even saying what's right or wrong to do. It's gonna be, it's a balance. And that's why the data is so important. We need to understand, like one thing, for all the landlords and maybe developers, you need to find out what are their three key concerns as far as like landlords not selling their property. What's their big concerns? You need to understand that so you can see the sensitive point. Same thing with developers. What are their concerns as far as building more? That's really, really important. And I think it was uh, uh, Councilman uh, Glover was talking about this, uh, the inspection plan. That's a, for apartments now for rentals. That's a perfect place to gather more data. I've got 15, 20 years of data I've always had. Uh, you can get uh, rental, uh, rental agreements, 30-day notices from tenants, eviction notices, uh, uh, deposit returns. Like when I return a deposit, it says how much was there, you know, da, 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 what they did. There's lots of data out there. And I think mostly, if my landlords are smart, they keep it because people can come back a year or two later and have questions. So you keep this stuff, all that's there. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, my name is Barbara Childs. Um, this is so reassuring to me. We are all on the same side. Um, we get this wonderful staff recommendation, which recommends a really um, respected, decades-old organization from outside the city with experience and expertise. And then the main opponents of Measure M are in support of it. And the main opponent supporters of Measure M are in support of this recommendation. This is a very auspicious beginning for a task force. We all want this to happen. We all think we have lots of data and let's spread it out on the table. This will make a wonderful process of community education. It couldn't happen in the heat of the battle. We just kept seeing signs that were wildly distorted. It didn't give us any information. This is our chance to educate our community, raise the level of consciousness, dispel the fear on both sides, 
and maybe come out with a wonderful, really creative solutions. Um, conflict resolution can produce solutions that neither side ever thought of. And I'm extremely hopeful and very happy at this moment. Thank you. Next. Good evening. My name is Deborah Wallace, and I'm a local property manager. And I support the staff recommendation where a third party is hired at the beginning to objectively structure a data-driven task force. I also request that the ta task force be balanced with all parties equally represented. Measure M was overwhelmingly rejected by the community and should not be used as a starting point. Voters found just cause eviction to be one of the most objectionable aspects of Measure M, so listing just cause eviction as an explicit objective of the task force is not honoring the will of, major of the majority. We need a fresh start. Actual data needs to be collected, verified, and analyzed in order to formulate a plan of action. The majority of your constituents do not want lease end dates to be invalid or for tenants to be able to move any number of family members into rental properties without the consent of the property owner. The task force should work toward an ordinance that will expand the rental supply rather than shrink it. As a property manager, I experienced the fallout of the emergency ordinances and concerns about Measure M firsthand. Our office saw several long-term rentals sold to owner occupants. Owners do not wanna lose control of who resides on their property and for how long. Mom and pops just aren't going to take the risk. The woman before me uh, said it very well, and I think this is a, a good place to start and to, to work together towards some really good solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Hello, City Council. I'm just here to spread love on the situation. Y'all serious as heart attacks sitting up here. <laughs> and uh, out here, we need to break it down. I'm about love. And I just wanna acknowledge your work. And y'all look like you come from good families. And whatever decision you make, go back to what grandma said about empathy, love, compassion for the people who without of people who don't have money. I mean, take a look at that when you make that decision. The empathy, I know it's there. You was at a program the other day talking about compassion. I, I, I made sure I remember that. <laughs> and uh, I'm so proud to see two black men up in here at the head of the board. This is an honor, and I'm speaking up because it's Black History Month, and it's time for a change. And you who elected these guys to come up in here I honor you and I respect you. And I want, if I use up my time now, can I use it at seven? Um, we'll go ahead and pause the time, will you? This is on the item uh, which is before us, which is the establishment of a rental housing task force. Yeah, so I can't, I, you can, at seven o'clock I can come back. If you have an additional conversation. Okay, I don't wanna mess that up because that's the serious stuff. <laughs> but back to acknowledging who you, who you are, I have respect. But my deepest fear is not that I'm inadequate. My deepest fear is I'm powerful beyond measure. And you all gave me that 33 years of clean and sober and listening to your counselors, your groups and things. I am on fire with what's coming up for me. And it's all about love. Because all the racism and the bigotry, I had to jump through those hoops. And I see love in here. And I saw your work out there. And I don't hear it up in here. I see everybody talking about their money, they 20 houses. I live with a woman and they, they ain't jacked my rent up yet because I'm out there cleaning it up. Thank you. I Thank ain't you. done. But you'll have an opportunity okay. to come back at another time. Thank you. I just want to remind, if I could, before you begin, that we have moved public comment, uh, oral communications, excuse me, oral communications is now at 7 p.m. And so it has been moved, and it was originally at 5.30 p.m. So any folks who are here for oral communications, which is items that are not on our agenda, they can return at 7 p.m. to address the council then. And uh, currently what we are addressing and hearing public comment on is item number... 16, which is the consideration for the establishment of a rental housing task force. Is, uh, is that a new time from now on? Or just yes. Now on? 
it's a new time from now on. That was changed by the council. Okay, when did that happen? That happened, well, it was, uh, what uh, happened, it happened yeah, the first two months ago. Really? Yeah, right. so you. no problem. Okay, you're welcome to go ahead. Go ahead. Um, just as the gentleman before you, I have great respect for all of you, and I hope you will respect me by either closing your laptops or paying attention while I speak. Thank you. Consensus and collaboration, two great concepts often presented. Are we going to pursue consensus and collaboration in tackling the most serious issue our cities faced in pursuit of affordable housing and fair practices in the provision of rental housing? Starting fresh would be a great approach. Taking that deep breath, seeing that big picture. Involving interested parties from all sides of the issue who are experts in providing housing as well as those who seek it. Fresh means fresh, not using an already overwhelmingly defeated measure to guide us. Voters said no once, so why revisit what was already defeated? Consensus and collaboration, are we capable of it? Absolutely, I believe we are. Will we do this correctly for all parties involved and not just the most vocal anti-establishment ones who shout and click and declaim this council has an opportunity to earn back the trust of the very citizens whom you represent. You have experts ready, willing, and able who are knowledgeable about providing housing. Use these resources, ask us to help, facilitate a civil discussion, and an agreeable outcome will follow. The starting fresh is key. Consensus and collaboration can bring about healing to this divisiveness. Please hear us and work to develop consensus. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, you Karen. Before you begin, is there any other member of the audience interested in addressing the council at this time about this item? Okay, you'll be our last speaker if that's okay. Okay, go ahead. My name is Neil Langholz. Uh, the Rental Housing Task Force appears to be on the wrong track before it even begins. Uh, do, the, um, do the majority of voters know that the task force appears to be setting out to prove that the rejected measure M is the right solution. Um, why are we ignoring 62% of the voters that don't want measure M? Uh, trying to pretend that only a few small details need to be changed is disingenuous. Changing um, a few details will not make it so, so that just cause eviction uh, evictions don't restrict homeowners freedom to do what they like to do with their their homes. Uh, least end dates need to be enforceable. Anything less will continue to destabilize the rental housing supply. Uh, with the failure of Proposition 10, it should be very, very clear that rent control will not work for a majority of the renters in Santa Cruz. It also won't work for future renters or any renters that move since, since rents are unlimited on all rental housing when people move. This picture is very clear now that Proposition 10 failed. The council should be careful in setting rent renter expectations. Um, the council and staff need to need a reset. The task force should look at a menu of options to solve the affordable housing shortage. Uh, not force overly, um, overwhelmingly rejected Measure M on the city. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. I think to say that somebody that is a landlord doesn't care about housing for people is for the most part disingenuous. A lot of the, the rental property in this county <coughs> is owned by people who have been small business people, who have not had um, retirement money coming from government or from um, a corporation. And owning rental property has been the basis of their retirement. When we start making things difficult in terms of flexibility, you are creating another subclass of people that are victims. And victimizing somebody else doesn't necessarily solve the problem. What I think that needs to focus on is how we can create systems where people that can afford to own 
do. Maybe it's a maybe it's a, a restructuring of how things are financed. Maybe it's creating some version of a co-op, some version of the way the uh, the stru the legal structure of a, of a mobile home park is set up, the, the ones that are owned. But we need to broaden out to solve the problems. It's not just about protecting a few people. Um, I have a friend who is a Section 8 person who's just gotten a notice that she has to move. Um, we, I'm hearing from the federal government that funding for Section 8 is going to change and there's going to be less of it. So we, we've got more coming in the pike. The, the um, changes in the, in the septic system laws are, are going to make a lot of the properties in the San Lorenzo Valley less um, able to be rented or even to be sold. So we've got more stuff coming in addition to that. So thank you. I, I want the rent the task force. Thank you. Okay, next speaker. I want to speak in favor of the proposal for a tenant protection task force. Um, and let's be clear that um, anyone who can afford to rent out another property besides the one they re reside in is almost a millionaire in Santa Cruz County. If they own two properties, they're definitely a millionaire. And the people who are tenants um, have no protection by and large month to month. Most of the people I know are not on any kind of extended lease. Um, if that happens at all, it's for the first year. So um, <clears throat> I just want you to be mindful when this task force goes forward that the tenants um, in Santa Cruz currently have no protection due to the decision not to pass a temporary just cause measure. Um, the exorbitant um, rent increase ordinance does not protect tenants because uh, landlords can simply evict the tenant arbitrarily and then raise the rent beyond the limit. So it, it really does not provide any rent stabilization. Um, so any um, proposal that the task force um, considers, there has to be some form of control regulation of the reasons for eviction, just cause eviction. And I wanna make it clear also that Prop 10 did pass in the city. So voters in the city did not reject rent control. Over and over at the door, I heard, I'm for rent control, just not this measure. And there's one or two things that I would change and then I'd be for rent control. So if that was true, I hope those people will come out again and speak for the type of rent, rent control they favor. Um, but I think that people need to be realistic that the loophole where a landlord can simply arbitrarily evict a tenant for no reason um, and then raise the rent to whatever level they desire, that that's not rent control. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Sherry Cherie Peterson and I've spoken to several of you before. Um, well, she just touched on a subject that um, rang a bell to me. I wasn't thinking of it, but I became homeless four and a half years ago when my landlord smashed into the side of my car, the manager of Redwood Commons, and she was drunk on chemotherapy and doing meth. So the police came and it was a hit and run, but I got evicted and I lost my, <coughs> I lost my voucher, I lost my $1,000 deposit that's never gonna be returned to me, and I'm the one in the street. I'm legally blind, I'm in my 70s, I shouldn't be in the street. It's really scary to hear, I'm delighted to hear you're finally addressing housing, praise the Lord, but I'm scared that this guy's gonna gather data for a year and a half, and where am I gonna be, waiting in the corner, or, you know what, I mean, what about, providing shelter now? What about housing now? What about housing, the university dumped 10,000 people on us, what about housing now? We're behind in building housing, and that housing at the end of Pacific over there, me and my friends were watching it going up, going, oh, we might live there. And now they paid the whatever small fee it was to not have to have old people like me or homeless people in there, and so they all rent to rich people. And you keep renting to rich people, like the six-story place that's gonna go up is all for rich people. 
and it's really depressing. You know, am I ever gonna live in sight? And this guy's gonna decide in the database, where does that leave me beside the gutter? I'm glad my son provided me a van to live in. I'm glad I have somewhere, someone who loves me that lets me stay there. You know, I'm grateful for that because I've been waiting for the city Thank to you. move on something. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, thank you to the community for coming out and speaking to us and addressing us on this topic. It's now time for us to return to the council for action and deliberation. Is there an interest in a motion to be made? Council Member Brown? Just a couple of comments and then I'm ready to make a motion. Um, first of all, I wanna thank the public um, for um, sticking to the, the topic at hand and, and not um, doing a another post-mortem on Measure M for us today. I really appreciate that. Um, I wanna thank staff for your considerable efforts to bring us this task force proposal uh, to move us forward on a set of issues that we all know have generated significant and contentious debate within our community and to do that in a, a timely and responsive way with you know a whole lot of uh, demands from this, uh, this council. Um, and I am really pleased that staff has identified CCP as a third party academic institution that can guide us through this process. Um, I truly hope this approach will engender a high level of trust among all stakeholders and the public in general. Um, I understand the concerns expressed about using Measure M as a point of departure, and I agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, I don't see the CCP proposal uh, to engage with stakeholders in establishing this task force as an overt effort to bring back Measure M, and nor do I see consideration of tenant protections, including but not limited to just cause eviction as an intention to circumvent the will of the voters. So with that, I would like to move the staff recommendation, um, and um, I believe I could just leave it at that, but I am happy to reiterate it um, if you would all like. I, I can reiterate it if you'd I'll like. I'll second it. Say Okay, so. Okay, so we have I'll a second it. <laughs> okay, so I can reiterate it, but it's right yeah. there on the screen and we have it in our public document, so. Um. Okay, so we have a motion by Councilmember Brown to move the recommendation provided by staff, second by uh, Councilmember Myers. Um, and then Councilmember Matthews, did you, I saw you raise your hand earlier, did you have? You know, I'm just gonna add, I appreciate that the recommendation is uh, broad. I think that's good. The principles, the community has, heard the range of opinions and walk on water, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is there any further comment at this time or are we ready to move to item? Council Member Govern. Thank you. Um, I, I, so thank you to the community members that came to speak. Thank you to staff for putting it together. Um, and thank you to our representative from CCP for coming into Santa Cruz. Um, I do support the staff recommendation, so I'm really happy to see that the motion was made and seconded. Um, I, there, I was curious, I just wanna put it on the record for some potential uh, data to that I would be interested in seeing incorporated into the analysis of what's going on. You can take it or leave it. Um, one is the costs uh, for landlords over the last five years or increase in costs with regards to taxes, mortgage payments, all those kinds of um, things that would be used as a reason for increasing rent. Um, rent raises for um, landlords uh, or rent increases put together by landlords um, as far as the rent increases that were associated with those um, properties. Then also looking at the length of tenancy before the tenants are moved out, <coughs> and also the rise or drop in uh, wages over the city in the last two to five years, which would be really interesting to see uh, in there. And then also, just to respond to some of the things, I wanna appreciate, uh, especially Barbara and Curtis for their wonderful statements of uh, positivity and love and compassion and coming together and empathy. I did also wanna point out uh, and respond to a couple things that were mentioned um, that caught my ear. Uh, one of them was the talk about democracy and trying to circumvent democracy by having a process with a third party uh, contractor to come in and have the discussion and incorporating the concepts or thinking about Measure M. Um, I don't believe it's in their specifically measure but looking at different aspects of stuff. However, it's constantly brought up that it was defeated 
uh, by a vast majority. I, th I think it's important to show that according to the numbers that were reported by the people today, that would leave 48% of people in the community that did support Measure M or some form of renters protections and rent control. So it's important that we have equity in the representation of what's going on. And then also just on that topic of democracy, I would really bring up the issue of money that uh, played in this last election and really start to ask ourselves on a policy level within the city, um, if it's possible to limit the amount of money that comes in from outside the area because the vast amount of money that was spent on the opposition to Measure M was funded from outside funding sources and did contain a lot of, uh, in my my opinion, half-truths that led people to some strange notions, including of which, which was mentioned um, by, uh, and just to, as an example uh, of something that's kind of concerning to me, is the claim that was made twice so far that Prop 10 failed in Santa Cruz. One of that by Ms. Renshaw made that claim. And it's really disconcerting to have that claim be made on the record when it is completely false, if you look at the data. So I just want to emphasize that and put that forward. I do appreciate this and I'll be supporting the recommendation. Okay, we'll go ahead and um, maybe call the vote unless there's any further discussion or deliberation at this time. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Okay. Yes. So we have um, our first of three uh, study sessions on local government finance and trends. I just want to acknowledge that we are over the estimated timeline, so likely that will have to be shortened just a touch in order to get a short break and return as best as possible at 7 p.m. So, yeah. Honor and balance. Honor and balance, yeah. So we'll go ahead and ask um, Marcus. Yes, thank you. Is Marcus here? Okay. I called him to give him a heads up. Your program is going to be quick. I don't think he anticipated. Oh, okay. <coughs> there he is. He gives me time to give a standing ovation. There he is. That's why. Just, yeah, come on. Uh, just kidding. Them. Think about what you think. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be saddled with the responsibility. Uh, it's something we can all agree on. All right. It's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. half a million right there. Yep. A lot of money. Okay. So we'll go ahead and ask that um, we're going to move on to the next agenda item. So if you can move your conversations to the outside and we're going to go ahead and move on. So if you could keep your conversations um, down or move them outside, please, that would be much appreciated. Thank you. Okay. So Marcus, I apologize. We had a, a longer uh, consent agenda uh, session than anticipated, yep. and uh, we will likely have to cut your presentation sure. short. Sure. And hopefully, elements that aren't touched upon today could be incorporated in part two. Perfect. Okay. Thank Perfect. you very much. Do you anticipate going to maybe six fifteen? I um, anticipate six six fifteen or six. You know, okay. at the latest, mm -hmm. How about I pray, focus on painting broad strokes and there's some detail that we can come back. This is the first of three study sessions, so we can hold off on the detail and just focus on broad strokes. Take a note of any questions you might have and follow up in the next two study sessions. Thank you very right. much. Marcus Pimentel, your finance director. I'm here today with Tracy Cole, our principal management analyst, new to us in the role of a budget person. Oh, congratulations. So, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll we had planned a tag team. I might just plow through it just to uh -huh. sure. go for speed. Thank you very much. That's okay. <laughs> so w why we're here tonight is the first of three study sessions. A, we certainly have some new council members who are very familiar with our community, so a lot of this shouldn't shock you. And, and B, we have a budget process that's starting off. Uh, staff have already been working on their budget proposals and reduction scenarios and what if ideas. Beginning in May, we'll have a one-day budget hearing, and at the end of May, we'll be presenting the proposed budget for adoption, and it'll, the budget will be released in April. And over the next couple of months, we have a lot more community engagement and public hearings uh, to get through. So tonight's just setting the stage very high level about what's to come. You've probably all heard or seen we're, we're not in the greatest 
financial forecast position, and it's not just us. This is a statewide issue. There's nothing unique that we're doing to cause this. There, is, there are major influences that we'll be talking about, and I'll repeat them again. Local government, the economy's been in a boom cycle or, or certainly a recovery cycle for well over a good decade. We haven't, we haven't seen that same level of recovery cycle, and there's a couple of predominant themes. Mandated costs are going up that we've talked a lot about, aka pension, pension costs, and revenue isn't behaving like it should be. Investment returns have been stagnant at you know one or two percent rates for over a decade, where investment returns used to be four percent. Sales tax isn't acting like it used to in recovery periods. We're seeing three, four, five percent gross, but not six, seven, eight, nine, ten percent gross. Property tax is doing okay. That's a stable, predictable source. But some of our bases are shrinking. Utility users tax, some of the base is starting to be chewed on on the ends with streaming video. So there's things happening in that require statewide reforms. We've been active with statewide legislative committees talking about those reforms, but they're still years away. So until those reforms are in place, we keep seeing revenue acting differently because of a disruptive new economy where people are spending their money differently. We also believe that there's credibility that our 10-year recovery cycle will eventually end. All things do come to an end. We're soon gonna be the longest recovery period ever, as denoted by this next slide. We're in the number two position since 1845, we've, or 1854. We've not seen a recovery period last longer than 10 years begin to end, and we're getting close to that longevity point. That alone doesn't mean that, hey, at 10 years it stops. But it does mean we're in uncharted territory. Most recovery periods are about five, six years. So we're in, we are in uncharted territory, we're close to. And there are a lot of things that, while national economists are saying, hey, jobs are great, unemployment's low, so this thing could keep chugging along. Regionally and certainly in our state, there's bigger issues with cost of housing, uh, debt costs, interest rates going up with the, the changes the Fed is doing. And the fact that 70% of our economy is based on consumer spending, once consumers start being constricted, they act really quickly. Unlike businesses that might invest and plan for the long term, consumers will stop spending quickly. So we're poised, we're concerned about a lot of factors that we, we believe it to be credible that California, if not this area, might see a, a slowdown coming in the next year or so. Pension, so I, I mentioned some of the, one, one of the biggest changes we've seen, we're, we're in a 10 year recovery period, doesn't, I can repeat that over and over again, yet we're seeing increase in pension costs. We've not seen this before in a recovery period. In recovery periods, pension costs stay stable or even go down. We've not seen one where we're poised to double again our pension payments. From 2012 to what we're making today, we're paying five million more a year in the general fund. It's five million more a year for the same benefit. We haven't, we haven't enhanced benefits. In fact, we've reduced them. That's five million more a year just gone. In five more years, it'll be another five. So we'll have doubled twice our pension payments during an economic recovery period, largely because CalPERS has not been hitting their investment targets over the last 10 years. What this chart shows you is, there's a pie chart there, a big red box and a smaller black box. The big red box shows that they are underfunded by seven, by 29%. They have 71% of the funding they believe they need to date. If they had just followed the market or what they've done in the past with investment returns, they'd be fully funded and we wouldn't be seeing any increases in, the, in these last five years and going forward for the next five years. So the underlying issue is CalPERS hasn't hit their investment targets. When they don't hit their investment targets, we're the, back, we're the backfill. Because they went ultra conservative for reasons that they made on their own hand, they put more pressure on member agencies to, to make up the difference. So members throughout the whole state are picking or feeling the same level of pain. Again, we haven't seen this ever before or in a recovery period, investments aren't hitting their marks and they're passing those shortfalls on to us. That's new to us and it's very big, very significant. We talked a little bit about the disruptive economy and, and at all levels you see it. Your, your kids or your neighbors, they're buying apps and not toys. We're spending money on services, not buying trinkets. You can buy your, uh, my latest one, you can buy your tax software at Costco, but if you download it, it's non-taxable. There's so many different things consumers are choosing to do that are taking it out of a taxable space. We're buying services that are non-taxable instead of goods. The demographics are changing. We're, getting, we're becoming an older, an older country where we're spending more money on healthcare and not taxable goods. So just a lot of things are happening where the base of taxable goods is shrinking, the market of taxable goods is shrinking, and the state tax system has not come up to those reforms. There have been a lot of discussions over the last three years, a lot of discussions, but there hasn't been really 
a clear message that something's gonna come. You can take that and apply that to gas tax and utility users tax. Gas tax might be a great story, right? Fuel consumption going down, but bottom line is governments have funded their roads based on fuel taxes. So as fuel taxes have gone down, we haven't seen that. Now last year the state took some action on that and we appreciate that, but still there's an overall concern that ultimately the longevity of fuel taxes are gonna fade and we're gonna go into a different economy and how fast will we be ready for that? Utility users tax, Netflix, non-taxable, Comcast, taxable, same service, you're delivering and watching a video, but one's taxable under our UUT, Comcast, and the other isn't under our, our Netflix. So there's just a lot of things happening in the economy that are eroding our revenue base and that's why we're not seeing the same robust increases as consumers are spending more money, but it's not going into taxable products. And then our own story, that the story replicated throughout all of agencies, capital investments. The general fund has not had sufficient capital investments over the, the last 10 years. It's been a long time since we've made significant investments on capital programs, probably 2004, five, six. We should be making five to $10 million a year in general fund contributions to maintain our, our facilities and infrastructure. And over the last several years, we've had essentially zero except for what we thankfully got out of Measure S last year, which funded some critical core projects. But one and a half, $1.6 million is not near the five to eight million we might need annually to invest and maintain our, our facilities. And we've, we've seen every year, I, I talk about it internally, we've seen every year the surprise project, uh, whether it was way back with, with uh, uh, um, anyways, we, we've had road issues, we've had uh, community golf, co uh, uh, golf course, I've got that on my brain, sorry. A soccer field, where we had soccer field issues when I first came here. Every year there's been something that's caught us off guard. West Cliff erosion caught us off guard. There's just, there's a lot of investment that we must do and we're not, we're not able to do that. So that's our, our story and we're not alone. We saw this last year, we saw it, we updated our data. Tracy did a wonderful job looking, diving deep into budgets of our comparable, some of our fiscally comparable agencies and they have much bigger deficit issues than we have. So we're, we're in a good position but we're not alone. Everybody's facing certain levels of shortfalls. It's just inherent in the system. When you see costs doubling twice, major cost components, and your revenue's not catching up, we're fortunate others have not been as fortunate. So that's that's a quick recap. I'll, I'll dance quickly through some quick details that we could come back to uh, the next meeting. This is just meant for context information. Last year we spent a lot of time and I, this council activated ultimately it was three different subcommittees of this council that worked on different topics and one of them was the budget ad hoc committee who came up with some brilliant and wonderful outreach strategy ideas and some budget principle ideas. There's a lot of great work done on our outreach side and we wanna keep replicating that going this year. So we're really excited about things like our focus group, things like our budget 101 study sessions and more outreach. Um, we wanted to remind council members in this or our public that everybody thinks of our property tax and sales tax and all that money flows to us. We get slivers of it, 16, 17%. We get a portion of every dollar in property tax. We get about 16, 16 cents on the dollar. And the same with sales tax. We get a little bit more, but about a buck 75 for every hundred dollars spent. So we get slivers of these revenue bases. Largely the state and county jurisdictions get the, the bulk of those funding components. So it's not, you know, the property tax and sales tax, we get components of that, not all of it. And revenues for us act differently. So we've got some iconic images. The, the top slide isn't us, but the other slides are. We have different revenues that are more, res more responsive to economic concerns. We're concerned because sales tax and transit occupancy tax are big revenue bases for us. And those are the first, we, when, when consumers stop spending, we see that in months. We see those trends come in place versus property tax that might take a year and a half before the slowdown hits us on a cash flow basis. So sales tax, TOT, once a consumer decides not to travel to Santa Cruz or spend the same level of money in Santa Cruz, we see that within months hit, hitting our economy. So they're very risky to us. And two, two of our top three revenues, property tax, sales tax, and, and TOT, sales tax and TOT are in that high risk category where if the consumers choose to stop spending, it's a risk to us. It's just information about our different risk vulnerabilities in our revenue bases. I'm on the stretch for home run. We've done some great things. We can come back to it. A lot of a, you saw an award we got earlier today. There's been, this council's for years, um, for decades has, has led forward with the idea of, you know, I, I joke about this, no money, no mission, but how do we how do we think forward, think long-term about sustaining our services? And this council's been doing that for decades and I applaud them for that. 
we've got on board. We can talk in a lot, lot more detail about our fiscal 2023 system, sustainability strategy. It's really identifying that in fiscal year 2023, if we can build that fiscal bridge, we've talked about that to get us there. By that point in time, most of our cost increases will have leveled out and we can start you know, catching up. And then by 2030, 2031, we'll be in good times. <laughs> 2030, 2031, that's projections. But there's a lot of things we've done on pensions. Left side is things we've done. Right side are things we can do more of. You've got a fresh slide deck. I forgot to mention that. Um, so, and this slide deck will be online uh, in the next couple of days. So the left slide, are, we've done a lot of things already. We've led essentially a lot, been the leader in a lot of ways on what to do with pension costs. When this League of California Cities produced a report in 2018 of January, last January, we looked at the report and said, well, I guess we're done. Because everything they recommended, we already checked off years before. So this, that's what I mean, this council, this, this administrative team has been very proactive with what can we do, let's try to do it now. There's more things we can still do with the, the right side or things we want to talk about more. And we hope to maybe spend a little bit more time at the next council meeting on that. Finally, maybe some detail that that we wanted to, to cap on. What, what are the things you must, as a council body, be tracking on what are your major responsibilities? Certainly adopting a budget and, and setting those limits of us are, are some of the key components. So we have just the highlights of right now we adopt a one-year budget. We adopt, uh, we, we fund the first year of a capital investment program. It's, it's a three-year program moving to a five-year program, but we're only funding the first year of that. So th those are your primary responsibilities, adopting a budget that then sets the, the maximum authority for years for that next year. And then we, we've added some nuance there that might be just helpful for you about the different levels of what council approves and, and where, where, what must come back to council for approval. So new, new, new funds, transfers between funds, that's what you saw today. There was a transfer from general fund money to a capital improvement program that required council approval. We've also listed some other ways that you guys have already set limits and set authority levels that we wanna make sure you're aware of that, that is your responsibility. Um, Living wage will be coming to you at the next council meeting. We talk a little bit more in depth about that, but the, the city council sets the living wage by way of example. To recap, this is different. These are different times. We've talked a lot about that over the last couple of years and it continues to be different. The League of California Cities, California Legislature, they've identified that things need to be reformed, but the agreement on what to reform and what that is isn't there just yet. And if I had to guess, it's still two or three ways, years away from happening. And typically it's when things break, when we're over the cliff is when the reforms will happen. When the Highway 99 corridor and there are a lot of cities start going, you know, having real challenges, I think that's when unfortunately you'll see action. Um, we're not really great at doing things proactively a lot of times. I listed there what we have next. Again, this is part one of a three-part budget study session. Next meeting, we'll, we'll be spending, recapping some of this in a little bit more detail, but also getting more deep, a deeper dive into the numbers, what's going on within revenue streams, what's going on in, within our expenditure accounts. And then March 12th, we'll re preview our capital investment needs, where we should be investing and in, in our resources haven't been and where our gaps are at. Uh, I was going to leave with things just to, to ponder, like what types of things should we be thinking about? And I know the council budget committee that's already formed for this year is already thinking about things like, let's look at a, at a, at a, at a committee to, to focus on the needs assessment for capital improvement projects and how we fund that. Um, but there, these are things that we might want to spend time on a pension study session. We've talked about that over the last couple of years, but we haven't just found, found the bandwidth. And I'm happy to talk about it at length over lunch or boba, boba budget. Budget boba, some of my staff were joking. <laughs> we had budget and brews and that didn't seem to work, but boba and budget maybe. Um, we're always happy to do a deeper dive one-on-one -on -one about pensions, but at some point in time, it might help to deeper dive into that because it's, it's, it's not about the benefit, it's about the shortfall on the investment side. And I think the benefits get hit far too often on that. So that concludes my power run. That was quick. Well, thank yeah. you. <laughs> thank you for being flexible and for your presentation today. Um, I will just simply add that I sent out a email to uh, the council and some of the city manager staff just in regards to how to sprinkle some of the information um, throughout the upcoming months in preparation for our budget hearings mm -hmm. in anticipation that we want to um, have deep dives and general overviews of our various functions prior to moving forward with the budget hearing. So that is something to keep in mind. Perfect. 
moving forward and we discuss that in our ad hoc committee as well. Um, so this is a study session. It's an opportunity for us okay. to listen and learn. Um, is there any member of the public who would like to address the council on item number uh, 17, which is the uh, mid-year review part one study session on local government and finance trends? Okay, seeing none, um, at this time, it's an opportunity for council to make any comments and um, I just had one question. Um, I was surprised it's dispellably low reserve levels because I thought we were doing okay on that. It, it's to the... Yeah, we just drawn them down. It, it's more to our exposure. So we do not have a catastrophic emergency reserve. Our reserve levels were set at a lower level several years ago with anticipation of trying to get up. To, we, If I recall correctly, we set reserves at a, a two-month level. The recommendation was three months, but we at that point in time, the pain point to get to that funding level would have been too great. So we wanted to aspire to get to three months over the long period of time. It's a deeper dive question that we can get more into it, but there's there's different complexities. Our reserves are not sufficient necessarily to, with all the different risk factors that we have, whether it's economic or environmental or what have you. Disaster. Yeah, exactly. Any other council member comments? Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I think we have one more item before um, we break for our 7 p.m. Uh, session, which begins with oral communications, and that is the review of the meeting calendar. And um, I will ask the city clerk to provide any updates to the calendar at this time. Um, I have none. Okay. Is there any other? No, no. Okay. Okay. Do we need to take any type of action at this time on that? Or? No. Okay. Okay. So at this point, then I will adjourn the meeting until 7 p.m. for oral communications and 7.30 to begin our item for... Okay. Okay, all righty. If I could call to order our 7 p.m. session and um, ask the chamber to please uh, wrap up their conversations. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to our 7 p.m. session of our February 12th, 2019 meeting of the City Council. And I'd like to now ask our clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Crone. Here. Glover. Here. <clears throat> Meyer. Here, Brown. Here, Matthews. Here, Vice Mayor Cummings. Here, and Mayor Watkins. Here. 
Okay, so um, we have moved our oral communications time to now be at 7 p.m. So from 7 to 7.30 is now when we will have oral communications. And oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not listed on today's agenda. And there are, member, are there any members of the public who wish to address the council by show of hands, please indicate so now. And this is for oral communications. This is for items that are, uh, have not, are not on the agenda. It's not for the 7.30 item. Okay. Okay, um, so if you can please line up to uh, my left and uh, you will each be given, uh, we have some, so, we, so let me start, by show of hands, can you please let me know? Okay, you'll each be given two minutes and um, if you feel comfortable, please do feel free to sign in so we get the correct spelling of your name, that's not necessarily mandatory. And we'll go ahead and start with the folks who indicated that they were in line first, which are here in the front. Welcome. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening, uh, Madam Mayor and members of the City Council. My name is David Thorpe, Chapter President of SCIU 521 and an employee at Santa Cruz Public Libraries. Uh, my bargaining team and I have met most of you um, and I'm pleased to have this chance to talk to all of you together. More so, I wanna introduce you to a few of my colleagues and friends and the friends and family they support. Anyone here that is a service employee for the city or here in support of one, would you please stand up? <laughs> These are your people. They cherish and love Santa Cruz and are dedicated to working hard behind the scenes to make your city the best it can be. For everyone you see standing here, there are many who more who would like to be here but cannot. They're working their second and third jobs to make ends meet. In fact, this weekend, I lost a valuable member of my bargaining team as he finalized his plans to move to Oklahoma City. This coworker is leaving the city he grew up in for a home that is one fifth the price. We've lost a very talented coworker. You're facing many challenges this year and you'll hear about them here tonight. Uh, we, want, we will be part of the solution, and all we need is support in addressing the high turnover and fair compensation. As time permits, I hope my colleagues can talk to you about the work they do. Thank you for attending to us. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, my name is Juan Molina. I have been an employee for the Streets and Traffic Department for over a year. Behind me are my coworkers and I will be speaking on their behalf. As you notice, two of my coworkers have been in the department over 10 years. While the rest of us have worked two years or less, we continuously have vacancies. We are a department of six workers. <laughs> You know what, go ahead and pause your time. No, 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 no problem. Yeah, we'll go ahead and start your time over. Um, yes, thank you, no problem. Okay, thank you. So at this time, I will go ahead and start your time over and if we could just allow for our individual speaker to have his time and um, maintain as uh, uh, respectful as possible. Please go ahead. In my department, we see a high turnover of workers on a constant basis. Since I've been in the department, six workers have left. This department provides an opportunity to obtain a class A driver's license, training and other certifications as it is a part of the requirements for the job. Once my coworkers obtain their license and certifi certifications, they leave for a similar job at a higher pay within the city or at other agencies. I understand why they leave. The starting pay in this department is less than the living wage ordinance. The high vacancy rate affects our workload. It increases, causing potential injuries. Our job consists of patching potholes with hot asphalt, constructing and repairing sidewalks, gutters, manholes, etc. We are exposed to hypodermic needles and human body fluids on a daily basis. We are asking the city council to address worker retention for my department and throughout other city departments. Thank you for your time. Oh, 
you know, uh, my, name, my name is Sherry Shree, and I'd like to talk about, well, a couple of things. Uh, one, I hope you don't put the library under parking, because I would never go to the library. I'd have to go to the Live Oak Library or a library less toxic. And um, another thing, I, I was listening to Gary Patton talk on KZSE, because I get around and I listen to the cool radio stations. I love that one. But he was talking how they, um, that pristine meadow over there that they're keeping, that they're gonna put 50% 50, 50 of the land, they're gonna give 250 students, and then the other 2,000 students are gonna cram into the other 50% of the land. And I, you know, it, it's appalling that we get 10,000 students dumped on us and you, the city council, could stop that, but it's the, it's the um, region, they have no clue how to run the university, and that's why they're overloading, already overloaded housing situation here. So I'm just asking you to ask the chancellor to get a clue on what they're doing with the planning commission. I think we all need more planning commissions planning for the planning commission. It's really depressing. What's going on? There's no housing for me. And all the students, I shouldn't get mad at them because they have to pay $1,200 for a semester and live with four people. And we're all having a hard time. I'm just asking you to be, use your conscience, use your heart, and build more houses for all of us, please. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor. Council members, thank you for the opportunity to be here and speak on behalf of our service employee unit. My name is Neil Kristen. I've been a city employee for about six years now, uh, and I've worked in various capacities, and I've worked long enough to be able to understand the many negative effects of the rate of turnover that we've experienced, the increasing rate of turnover the last, last many years. Um, we're here as a group asking for change. We're asking for your support to aggressively counteract this, this trend of being a training ground for, for many departments throughout the city. Um, we can no longer sustain this. We know this, we look at our membership, we look at the negative effects. Um, I personally represent a stubborn group of employees that are not only from Santa Cruz and that have to work a second job to provide for ourselves and our families, but we wanna be here. I've made meaningful, minimal contacts and relationships with community members and employees throughout the department. and. Uh, being faced with the opportunity to say, well, you can make more money somewhere else based off your training, education, and experience, that's not something I wanna do. I love my community, I wanna continue to be part of my community and provide services to my community. But we know across the board that we need change, and so we're looking to you for your leadership uh, in providing that change and providing, whether it's creative budget, budget issues or whether it's finding that funding somewhere else within that budget, it's time to make that happen. And so please, if we could be a resource to you in trying to contribute to that effort, we're here and we're willing to work, but we just, at this point, we need that leadership. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Speaker for oral communications. And just a reminder, this is uh, oral communications. This is the time to address the council for any item that is not on our agenda tonight. Good evening, council. My name is Lee Brokaw. I read newspapers, I work on the other side. I want to give you some idea of what the rest of the other Bay Area is saying. From recent Bay Area newspapers, December 20th, 18, East Palo Alto, the largest landlord announced his plan to tear down 160 controlled apartments and replace them with 605. The current residents will be relocated to similar apartments and allowed to return at their same monthly rate. What would Sherry Conable do? January 18th, 2019, Regional Bay Area Agencies, Metro Transportation Association, Association of Bay Area Governments are in the process of creating a new agency, CASA, Committee to Save the Bay Area, which will bring rent control to nine Bay Area counties. What would Sherry do? January 30th, after 41 years of renting a Section 8 apartment, Joseph Halicki's rent was increased from 1467 to 2467. What would Sherry Conable do? January 31st, Menlo Park, ordinance limiting rent hikes is pulled. What would Sherry do? February 4th, new affordable housing in San Jose designated for formerly homeless foster youth and developmentally disabled is proposed near Roosevelt Park. The city council has considered 
a $9 million loan to support the project. What would Sherry Conowell do? February 11th, Menlo Park Council gets plans for rent caps. What would Sherry do? Let this be the mantra for the city council of the calendar year of 2019. Let's move the ball on housing the homeless and those who work here. Let's be guided by one question. What would Sherry do? Hello again, my name's Satya Ryan. Um, thank you, Lee, for mentioning Sherry. I was missing her a lot tonight. This is the first meeting I've been to when she wasn't here. Um, what I would like to ask tonight is the, that we bring back the three-minute sharing, if that gets on the agenda. I know it used to be this way. Um, I know there's times when that can't happen, when there's way too many people, that it might need to be shortened, but in general, when it's possible, I know many other towns do this. And so I request that get on the agenda sometime soon. Thank you. You, next speaker. I think uh, because I'm speaking on behalf of Conscience and Action, you gave me four minutes. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and pause the thing. We, we will be addressing the uh, 7.30 item, which I believe is the item you s wish to speak to us on, but that this is now oral communication. Okay. So okay, that would be later. And yes, you are. Okay. Already identified. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next speaker. Hello, my name is Elliot. Uh, I know I don't have a lot of time. That's one of the things I'd like to point out is that you're not giving us a lot of time at a lot of these meetings. Mainly, I'm here to request that the city council look into things related to harm reduction which I know is a philosophy not all of you are unfamiliar with, and I don't need to explain the whole thing. I'd just like to point out that if you care about the city, you should be reducing harm in it. And there's a whole philosophy of tactics around how to do that that you could be looking into. Also, the people outside were saying something about a loudspeaker. I'm not sure if they can hear what's going on in here, and I think that maybe you should look into that. Thank you. Next speaker. Hello, Council. My name is Ben, and uh, I also would like to speak to you all about harm reduction. Um, essentially, what I want to talk about is the fact that harm reduction is largely shown to, well, I mean, it does what it says on the tin, reduce harm. Uh, uh, providing services like free HIV testing, uh, providing safe uh, sex contraceptives, free nioxone, opiate overdose reversal kits, free hep C testing, first aid and supplies, and access to clean needles and responsible disposal. In general, these all are uh, ways to protect the public at large, not only people who unfortunately are addicted to drugs, but those who might be uh, so, sort of secondarily affected by things like needle litter or per perhaps even, I mean, it's just having things like Narcan available, it's, it's, protecting people from things that are scary like death. Like it's, uh, it's to protect the public. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. I'll just also make a brief announcement prior to going, excuse me, that uh, our, for our 7.30 item, we will have capacity at the Tony Hill room. I'm not sure if that announcement's being made, I'm assuming so. That will be available for folks that aren't able to um, be accommodated by the space that we have here if you're interested in going to the Tony Hill room. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, thank you everybody. How many of you were working in 1972? Can I see some hands? Anyone on council? 1972, nobody? Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and pause. Hey, do you think it, it was pretty? Me. I'm gonna go ahead and pause the comment. This is the time for you to address the. Council. All right, all right. I'm just, I'm just as the, doing a little opener. Thank you. 1972. Thank you. The real wage is adjusted for inflation, cost of living, and uh, among other things. Guess what it'd be at? 34 bucks an hour. Guess what? Where are we getting paid? Not even 15. Ten years ago, I was working for 12 dollars an hour in retail in New York City. I'm here. 
and I, I can't even make more than that in this town. Something is terribly wrong if you want us to thrive in this next generation. It's time to pass the torch and realize that your city's revenue depends on low income spenders. Your revenue depends on a lot of sales uh, and, and that requires a lot of people. You don't get a lot of billionaires buying 35 pairs of jeans. You get a lot of single individuals buying a jean here and a jean there. We need $20 a minimum wage right now, $25 by 22, maybe even more. But uh, what we need to talk about here is city revenue would increase with more low income spending across the board. We're getting paid below what we're worth. If you value us and you value this city, I think you will see that $20 minimum wage is not a whole lot to ask for, especially living in one of the most expensive places in the world to live. We can do better. We can do better for each other. And guess who's the low, who tends to be uh, getting paid the least? It's not white guys like me, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> Okay, it's our Mexican brothers and sisters, our Latinx brothers and sisters, our people of color brothers and sisters, and non-gender non identity people. We love you all, but $20 minimum wage, folks, let's fight for that. Thank you. Thanks. Um, good evening, Council. I'd like to raise a concern and also propose a, a change to the relocation payment ordinance. Oh, how do I get that up? We'll go ahead and pause the time, or the time over. Um, just just one, to make one, it. One second. Are we okay? Okay, perfect. It shouldn't take long. I'd like to raise a concern and also propose a change to the relocation payment ordinance to prevent landlords from evading the ordinance by terminating a tenancy and raising rent on subsequent tenants beyond the rent crap thresholds. You can simply make it unlawful to terminate a tenancy for the purposes of evading the ordinance. I've included language from both the Los Gatos Municipal Code and the California Penal Code that does something very similar. Staff considered including the Los Gatos language when the ordinance was up for consideration, but ultimately opted not to do so. I'm not sure why, I think they might have had concerns that it would be vulnerable to a challenge uh, Costa Hawkins challenge because it included Costa Hawkins ex exempt properties. I don't think that it actually does. Um, however, I do think the ordinance as it's written is vulnerable to a legal challenge because the rent cap thresholds are so low, they they really don't pass the sniff test as a um, large rent increase. And there are two areas of California law that implicitly define a large rent increase as a 10% annual increase. So, and that's also been a discussion among legal circles. There's no case law in it, but, but it is an active discussion. So just those two things, you know, I think you could strengthen the ordinance, um, both making it less vulnerable to a legal challenge as it currently is, and also stronger so landlords can't evade, uh, evade it. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Kate. Um, I'm here to talk to you about harm reduction and kind of maybe jump on a couple erroneous facts before they're even put out there. Um, harm reduction is an evidence-based practice that has been repeatedly backed up by peer-reviewed <coughs> research. Claims that harm reduction encourages or enables drug use are erroneous and not based on academic research and created by anti-drug lobbyists. There have been multitudes of peer-reviewed studies that confirm that harm reduction does not increase drug usage and that it does maximize intervention options, reduce the rates of overdose by providing Narcan and other overdose reduction supplies, reduce the risk of e HIV and Hep C transmission, and improve the quality and length of life for drug users. 69% of overdoses in Santa Cruz County occur in the city of Santa Cruz. All harm reductions, all harm reduction efforts should be supported in Santa Cruz City. Thank you. Thank you. How much time do I have? You have two, you have two minutes. Two minutes? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me empty my... 
My name's Marilyn Garrett. I'm a retired teacher and part of wireless radiation alert network because this wireless radiation is very damaging. This is a detector of radiation. This is just an indication of what we're getting in here. These are not natural frequencies in nature and it's a big factor in killing the bees. I went, and we can't live without the bees. They've been on the earth for about 40 million years and predicted to become extinct in one decade. This brochure is titled Mobile Communications, the cause for the global disappearance of the bees and uh, explains how our electrical signaling and that of the creatures is put askew, we have functional impairment. There are major illnesses we're seeing now that are linked to these exposures, like diabetes, heart problems, mental health issues. Every time there's a cell tower put up, there are about 300,000 across the United States. These are emitting microwave radiation and the documented health impacts. There's a list of them, people experience in insomnia, heart problems, fatigue, um, memory loss, et cetera. And uh, we need to stop this and stop the new rollout of the 5G technology, which is military wave technology, and they need to put the antennas on every light post and electric utility poles right in front of your homes. I refer you to what Thank is 5G.org. Thank you. I'll leave you with these, please. Okay. Members of the uh, community. Oh, well, if you could just, if, wait, we. Council. Are you interrupting me again? It has, we haven't started your time. We're just waiting for a quick Oh, I'm thing. sorry. Is there any additional members of the public who would like to address the council for oral communications? That is for items, oh, for oral communications? Items not on our agenda for this evening. It's like you need to extend time. It does. No. No, we have until 7.30. We have a half hour allocated for oral so communications. When four council members decide, that's what you have until. There's two more out there. What we could do is potentially, if, if interested, they could potentially come speak to us after our, after our 7.30 item, and or if they're not, they could put their name down and we could acknowledge them at the first of our oral communications at our next meeting. One minute. Council member wants your attention. Council member Glover. Thank you. Just wanted to ask the uh, city attorney, is it feasible for a council member to make a motion to extend public comment past 7.30? Wonderful. Oral, it's oral communication. Oral communication, excuse me. Wonderful, then I'd like to make the motion to extend oral communications by 15 minutes to allow for people to participate in their democratic right for First Amendment speech. Second, could those people come in, please? In line. I'll ask one more time. Okay, there's a motion by Councilmember uh, Glover, second by Councilmember Crone to extend oral communications to 745. Is there, Councilmember Matthews? Uh, we have a very long meeting ahead of us. Um, uh, you know, I just wanna, if I can just maybe. <coughs> I'd like to suggest that the mayor get an accurate count of how many people wanna speak and give them a minute each and that should. About 30 seconds. Okay, well there's a motion on the floor to extend the, the <laughs> Councilmember Brown, you'd like to call the question? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, those opposed? No. No. Okay, so that passes with Councilmember Crone, Glover, Cummings, and Brown in support of extending oral communications to 745 and postponing the, addition, the evening item to the, after that. So we will hear oral communications until 745. Uh, this is for items that are not on the agenda, and then we will convene to have our evening item. You'll have two minutes. Members of the community, I'm glad to see that four council members are standing up for your right to speak in this line. It's a very brief right, but it's a very important one. And this looks like a revolutionary change. I hope it continues. Um, I, mayor, one minute, Martine Watkins, and I call you that because, I call the mayor that because of what she did at the last meeting. 
has doubled down on her insult to the community, moving from muzzling speakers, shrinking speaking time, and excluding those waiting hours to speak, to gagging city council members. And I'm referring to the fact that the agenda tonight does not contain items that three council members tried to put on. I'll be talking about this further during that actual agenda item. But this is also a matter of procedure at the city council. If, if the mayor can unilaterally, with the collusion of the city manager and the city attorney, stop items from going on the agenda that three council members want on the agenda, we don't have any kind of even pseudo-democracy here. <coughs> He's refused to agendize the Glover Crone proposals and substituted instead the city manager's dog and pony show. And sadly, the four progressives, who I've called out and will continue to call out on this, and I'm glad when they respond, with the power to block this today, allowed this freeze while we dawdle, move no, along to nowhere deportation policy to spin forward. And that has to do with the Ross camp, which I will talk about later. Last meeting, we saw rent control and just eviction, whose advocates were elected to office, silenced, sidelined, and dumped, tabled. More endless task force games as landlords evict tenant activists and drive us deeper into gentrification, producing more homelessness. The civic auditorium was supposed to be available for these meetings. Why aren't our council members demanding this be done? Thank you. Council members, I got up to speak and a gentleman took my seat. Um, I'm hoping to get it back. I found that hugely disrespectful, so I just wanted to say that because it's, I came early to get that seat. Okay, um, I am going to be talking about creeping fascism in our country and in this city. A lot of people may want to believe that Santa Cruz is, oh, so preciously exempt from the creeping fascism that's everywhere in our country right now, but it's not. Uh, Madeline Albright was here warning us about it, which I find a little dubious, but hey, I'll take it. And I wanna refer, as I'm speaking, to the Sunday night meeting that was held in the Civic Auditorium. The Lakota People's Law Project called attention to the abusive treatment, the absolutely racist and horrible treatment of Nathan Phillips, a Native American elder. Chase Iron Eyes was there and a very esteemed attorney that I believe is one of our most just activists, Daniel Sheehan, he is um, based at the Romero Institute, warned us again of the fascism that's taking place. So what happened on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial is now sort of history for those that heard about it. But um, at that Civic Auditorium event just the other night, Sunday, February 10th, many representatives from the Native American or First Nation representatives from around the country were there, such as Chase Iron Eyes. Daniel Sheehan warned us about such public relations firms as the behind the scenes public relations firms, like talk about a name that calls your own BS out. Hey, these are the people that represented the about face change of spin that that young Catholic little boy made um, when he uh, took back his admit admission of his treatment. What I'm saying here is don't think it's not happening here, it is. Our city council is engaged in deep and profound uh, attempts to wed business and corporate interests with the government. Thank you. Thank okay. you very much. Next speaker. Hello, I am natealex.kennedy at gmail.com. And uh, some of the first things I gotta say is, Bathrooms are a huge issue in the city right now. You're often 15, 20 minutes away from, a, from one when you feel that you gotta go. And when it takes 15 minutes to get to the toilet or the porta potty, your body gives you about 10. Now, I have even personally had it where I've been walking down the street and quite frankly, shit my pants and had to drop it right there. And I'm one of those people guilty of shitting on the sidewalk because I had to. I'm gonna go ahead and pause the time. I just, if you could please keep your language uh, under. Understood. Um, I only felt that the words were appropriate in the manner they were said. Okay. But we have a public setting. So. Yes. Um, so anyway, I will admit it. I am wearing a diaper right now, an adult diaper, because I do not want to have to poop somewhere I'm not allowed to. And so what we really need is to have a 
citywide ordinance requiring that all re all places that have a bathroom, bathrooms that say no public restrooms, that if it's available to customers, I should be able to make a $2 deposit on purchase to be able to use that bathroom before, because if, if I'm ready to explode, the last thing I need is to be choosing what kind of coffee I'm about to drink. And uh, thank God for Starbucks leaving their restrooms open to everybody. I've had the Santa Cruz Coffee Roasting Company kick me out for asking to use a bathroom, swearing at me, using all those words you don't want me to use as I'm being forced out. And then I cross the street directly, go into Starbucks, and at that time they did not have any locks at all on the bathroom, so I was able to use that. So anybody looking to use a bathroom, Thank God for Starbucks. Go use theirs if you have to. Thank you. Hello. Um, my name is Sarah Smith, and I'm here today to talk about a wonderful program in our city, and it's called Casa de Aprendizaje. It's a bilingual family daycare home that's run by some friends of mine, Adriana and Pedro Castillo. And I'm just wanting to highlight the importance of this program. I've known Adriana and Pedro since Annie was two years old. She's their oldest daughter. And it's been an incredible journey to see the work that they've done to build their, their program. Adriana graduated with honors from Cabrillo in the early childhood education program. Her site is considered a mentor site by the ECE department, and they use it for training uh, ECE teachers. And it's also just uh, an incredibly um, vibrant community of parents. And so part of what I wanted to let you know is that the parents who are attending her program have been concerned about safety in their, around the center. And they weren't able to come tonight, and they said, we can't come at seven o'clock because we're putting our children to sleep. And they said it would be much better if we could come in the afternoon or if there was some way that they could make their voices heard at a time when they weren't in the middle of doing night care, getting their children ready for bed. So um, it's a wonderful program, and the, they have an incredible staff and the parents are committed to thinking about um, the entire community. They know that we have lots of issues to deal with in our community, and they are working together as a community in the family daycare home to try and think about what they can do to also help improve the safety in our community. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to bring them to your attention. Thank you. And I'll just remind you that this is an opportunity for oral communications to address the council for items that are not on tonight's agenda. And if you could please um, lower, you okay. could either hand it around sure. or please lower it, because what happens if you hold the sign up, then folks can't see behind you. Okay, you'll have, you have two minutes to address it. My name is Melissa Freebear and I'm a registered nurse. This is my expertise, harm reduction. If the city and county wanna run a meaningful harm reduction program, then you need to run it properly using best practices. Having three kiosks to dispose of your needles is inappropriate, obviously, as our children and our locals are stepping on needles in our beaches and our parks, and it's unacceptable, and we're not gonna take it anymore. If you wanna allow people to come to this town and shoot up dope and provide them all the necessary supplies to do that, including Narcan so that they don't have to access medical treatment and actually get services and get help for their addiction, it's not going to come on our beaches anymore. We're not going to allow our children to step on these needles, these cookers, okay? It's unacceptable. I am a registered nurse. This is what I do for a living. You have 80 homeless people this last month that were given over 200 plus needles, not safety needles, needles that as soon as they toss them anywhere, where do those end up? They end up in our watershed. They end up on our beaches. They don't end up in the city of Capitola. They don't end up on the west side for a reason. They end up on the beach flats. And we're paying attention and we're sick and tired of it. It's our money. 
If you're gonna give our money away for this program, then run it properly. The, the county has already been informed, they've been given solutions. And if you do not take action, they said the city was unwilling to put Sharps containers because of the symbolism behind it. Um, we're way past that, okay? When you're handing out needles, boxes of needles at Camp Ross, okay? We're way past that. Then you need to provide Sharps containers because I, for one, I will hand deliver these needles every day to you until you do something. You'll be given two minutes? Yes. Okay, so my name is Jennifer Lanford Brown and I'm also gonna touch on harm reduction. Harm reduction, I removed personally over 6,000 dirty needles a week off the streets. I go out and supply Sharps containers, tons of them, to the people at the camp. They can buy them, here's a list from the SCAP program, they can buy them themselves, they do buy them themselves. They don't have Sharps containers to put them in. The county is not providing any needles that they're not taking out of the community. The city is not providing any needles that are not being taken out of the community. <clears throat> Providing Narcan is not continuing opiate addiction. I live on Felker Street. I have received my 90 day notice because my lease is, ex is after five years. Mm. I work with the homeless. I'm a harm reductionist. This is critical. I worked at the River Street Camp, the 1220 project. I was at the heart and forefront of pulling the people out of San Lorenzo, giving them trauma-informed care and harm reduction is important to implement that together. We have to. The same people that I helped into housing, navigate into housing, are in the camp. Do you realize there's over 200 people suffering and they don't use Narcan to continue their opiate addiction? or to avoid medical services, they're waiting to get into Janice. They, I have never met anybody who wants to be a drug addict, not one person, and they're desperate. They would love to get off the streets. People who have received housing and stable housing have gotten off the streets. So I again want to remind those that are interested in speaking tonight that we are still in oral communications and this is the time for, the count for you to address the council on items that are not on today's agenda. Mayor, Council, this is public service announcement about Warming Center. We're open tomorrow night. We open when the temperature gets really, okay. really... I'll go ahead and talk. You are actually on the agenda in terms of the specific addition to the finances. Is that, is that correct? I'm announcing a, 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 an activation and a challenge to it, council. I think it's different. different. Okay, yeah, just thank, making sure. Thank you, okay, Susie. Uh, my challenge to new council, I'm making any, not making any assumptions about your relationship to the conundrum of homelessness, but my challenge is we're open tomorrow night. We're open co for an extreme rain event. To this moment, we have not received one penny of funding. It's all community supported, all volunteer oriented. So and, uh, we give uh, blankets, but what my challenge to council is, before this winter is over, I encourage each one challenge each one of you to volunteer because it's just a volunteer program. We don't we we make sure that nobody has to sleep outside on the coldest nights. We've reduced the reality of, of hypothermia on the street. That is done. We never have to worry about real hypothermia at least at 38 degrees or, or less. So I encourage you sign up uh, via Warming Center Program at Gmail. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Sarah Bravo. Um, I'm a UCSC student. I'm uh, here speaking on behalf of the UCSC Snail Movement. Uh, we're a group of students um, <laughs> who are, we're a group of houseless students who are living in our vehicles who have been affected by the housing crisis. Um, we are struggling because we don't have safe places to park and sleep. Um, when we, we've been sleeping on campus and we are woken up by the university police every night, they come to our vans at 2 a.m. and shake our vans and bang on them, shine searchlights in them. And 
they threaten to side us a tow us if we don't come out. And then they tell us to go out into the city and park and sleep in the city. That's not okay. It doesn't have to be that way. Um, and we need help, we need support. Um, we are pressuring the university to uh, provide a safe parking program and designated lots on campus, uh, but we've repeatedly been denied. Um, so we need your help. I mean, we shouldn't have to go out and sleep in the city. The university has the space for us. It's quiet, it's safe, it's monitored. Um, there's just no reason for this. Um, so that's it. Uh, oh, and also, um, yeah, we have a, please look out for our petition soon. Um, and my email address, um, we're also looking for uh, donated legal assistance um, to help us interface with the university better uh, because what we are doing is not working. Um, so if anyone could please help us, my email address is S as in Sarah, W, Bravo, like Bravo, you did a good job spelling my name, uh, at ucsc.edu, thank you. So I, I want to uh, remind the community that we will be hearing an item on homelessness and update and direction, at which time we will also allow for public comment. So this is a time to address the council on an agenda item, an, on an item that is not on today's agenda. Yeah, I'm not sure if the university's harassment of students is specifically in your agenda, but that's happening. It's happening every night and it's escalating the more we speak out and voice our experiences about it. So it's it's not um, like we, we don't like the infrastructure to support the homelessness. We lack the moral capacity to support the homelessness. The university has talked with us and said that there's no a uh, way to pursue any action regarding homeless students. Why? Because of profit. The university profits from the students. The housing market, the student housing market is one of the biggest profits that the university is getting. So why don't they wanna approach their homeless students with, with respect, <coughs> with compassion? Because it doesn't give them any profit. So please, please help us expand your compassion to homelessness, to homeless people, and to homelessness in general. Um, that's all I have to say. Good evening, council members, Mayor Martin. Uh, this is not on your later agenda. I believe this is a sweeping comment that won't help that kind of a conversation but needs to be said. Um, I've been reading in the paper and hearing, which is even more fun because you can't prove it one way or the other, about the city's desire to get in on the nine to $10 million that's supposed to help alleviate homelessness here. And I think the city needs to get rid of all your criminalizing laws or at least begin that process before you start asking for money to serve people that you've proven you don't like. I really need to see something more than Pamela Constock and Cynthia Chase floating a wonderful idea and your staff, I'm not criticizing city staff, but Policy is lacking, creativity is lacking, and I need to see a willingness, I really do, or you guys are gonna watch me pooping in the street, suppose, I guess, but <laughs> that you can make something small and still chase this nonsensical developer money. You don't have to choose between status quo and what does this person right here need. That you can make decisions that are informed by, by what you see, if you don't trust what everyone has to see, trip over, try to pick up, try to get on sitting or dry, but just from what you know for sure, add the human element and you'll get a better outcome. You know that, you know I believe in the diversity and I bet every one of you knows why it's dynamic at times. So, I've been watching maybe more than 40 years how we treat people we want to ostracize or just not see. And uh, I've been talking about Mitch Snyder all over town for nothing, it seems like. And I would like to see the city <laughs> embrace an opportunity that everybody's trying to embrace, but that I can show you about 50 nonprofits that are ready to handle, do something creative. Thank you, thank you, your time is up, thank you. So at this point, we have um, concluded I appreciate your challenge. We've concluded oral communications. We extended the time an additional 15 minutes. Um, so we will uh, hear oral communications at the end of the item if there's time or have you uh, be the first to speak. So we're no longer having oral communications. Okay, 
We have an evening item before us, and um, I'd like to start by uh, first acknowledging that this is a very complex and um, uh, intense item, and I wanna thank you all for being here. I want you to understand my role as the presider of this meeting to ensure that everyone has a role and opportunity to be heard, that um, when they have the opportunity to speak that they can feel comfortable to speak to us and be given their time without disruption. Um, that's the job of the mayor and the job of the uh, facilitator of the meeting. And one of the things that council has, uh, has gone through is the process where we establish norms. I'm gonna go ahead and read those norms and then I have a brief statement. So the council interactions with each other um, include to be respectful, to engage in open and honest communication, to be honest and truthful, to address, address difficult issues, to find areas of common ground, to be open to different perspectives, to give the benefit of the doubt, to role model good leadership, and to be considerate of each other's time. I also have a brief statement that I'd like to read before we go ahead and kick off tonight's agenda. I will read my statement and then I will turn it over to our staff for their presentation. We will open it up for public comment where we'll have an opportunity to hear from you all and then we'll return to council action and deliberation. So I'd like to kick off um, our discussion of homelessness before our staff begins the presentation by reflecting on my hopes for tonight's proceedings and the apparent challenges we face, not only in developing policy that will make a difference in people's lives, but in a way that we as a council treat each other and work toward effective governance. Tonight's discussion will no doubt be challenging. We are trying to alleviate pain and suffering. We are trying to make a difference. As we deliberate tonight, let's try to recognize these common values and build from there. Even through our disagreements, even through our frustrations with each other, let's work towards consensus and do that by listening to each other and the public. This is our time to learn and listen. And to that end, as I mentioned earlier today, I will be striving to ensure our dialogue is respectful and productive and that each of you has an opportunity to speak without interruption and I allow, ask that you allow me to do my job as effectively as I can and have the patience as I navigate this process with you, staff, and the community. And for the benefit of the community who have come out to take part of tonight's proceedings and for those who are at home watching, there is an issue I wanna address before we get started. And I'd like to speak to the perceptions that are floating around in the community to say what I understood to be true and to recognize what many may be thinking. And I bring these up tonight to say them out loud to address them and to hopefully set them aside so that we as council members, as staff and the public can hold the most productive dialogue for our community that we can. For perceptions that are unnamed, that are often not addressed, if allowed to fester, can sometimes further divide us. And my hope is to bring us together. And so I want, to understand, I, want to, I want to understand that there are perceptions that my colleague, Councilmember Glover, has intentionally um, attempted to smear my character by suggesting I arbitrarily disallowed for this agenda item. <laughs> Excuse me, this is the opportunity for me to address you all and we'll have an opportunity to hear from you as well. I arbitrarily disallowed for his agenda item to be added to tonight's discussion. As to my own actions, I don't believe that either this perception to be true. Councilmember Glover worked toward an agreeable path to providing an opportunity tonight with myself and staff for, that will allow him to bring his ideas forward. And I'm open to hearing about those ideas. We have created space for, to hear them with our existing item. And we have a process to ensure that our meetings are well-planned and structured. I received an item request to agendize that on the morning of our uh, agenda uh, review process, and that did not allow me the adequate amount of time to add them to the agenda. And that's the reality of governance when we have so many complex issues to address and seven council members who have varying issues and items they'd like to bring forward. There's no lack of understanding the urgency of human suffering, and there's no lack of understanding the importance of the public process. We are all here because of those values, and we all share them in an attempt to make a difference. I also understand that there are perceptions that my colleagues, both Councilmember Glover and Councilmember Crone, are intentionally bullying me because I am a woman. That if not for my, my gender, if I were a man, there would not be this question of my integrity. There would not be this question of my character. 
And I say this perception out loud, not to validate its truth, but rather to stand alongside my fellow council members, staff, and community members who may feel pushed around or bullied. I say this perception out loud to name it, to set it aside, and continue to speak my mind. Continue to do my job and to work on these tough issues. Continue to do the job of mayor, which I am honored to be in, and to take it very seriously. I hope that we as colleagues can do the same and work together with each other as we begin our conversation tonight. And with all this in mind, I would now like to turn it over to our staff for our presentation. Go ahead. Uh, point of order, Mayor. I would go ahead and- Point I would, of order. I would like to go ahead um, and we're, say- We're not uh, done with oral communications yet. Uh, oral communications um, generally matters presented as oral- You were not recognized. And I appreciate your respect to address me. And I, I'm addressing you, I have a point of order. Do you wanna look up to, uh, City Attorney, what point of order actually means? I'll show you right here. I don't believe you have to be recognized in point of order. And I, it, while he's looking, I am profoundly saddened and I, I apologize if there was um, mm -hmm. ever anything that w that I did that, and because I, I don't know, David was the mayor before and you know I did lots of points of order and many. Um, we'll go ahead and pause your comments if we could for a moment and allow our city attorney to respond to the question before you. I'd also love a chance to respond. To Any to respond. council member with the exception of the presiding officer may call for a point of order to bring to the attention of the council a violation of the rules an omission, a mistake, or an error in procedure and to secure a ruling from the presiding officer on the question raised. Point of order shall be raised immediately after the violation, omission, mistake, or error in procedure has been committed. Council member who wishes to call for a point of order may interrupt the council member who has the floor at the time, but shall not explain the basis for his or her point of order until subsequently recognized by the chair or by the presiding officer. The presiding officer in his or her discretion may allow the council member who was interrupted to conclude his or her remarks before ruling on the point of order. The point of order is not debatable. However, the presiding officer may consult the city attorney or city manager for ruling on the point of order. So conf confirming with you, city attorney, you mentioned the port of point of order violation has to occur and the calling has to be immediate. Is that correct? That's right. Okay, so is the point of order violation something that immediately took place or is that something that has passed? I was actually trying not to interrupt, waiting for you to finish. Um, generally matters presented at oral communication will require, this is on page 21 of our council handbook, will require further investigation or information shall be referred to staff. And if the council determines that action is required, the item may be placed on a future agenda. I have two issues that folks brought up during oral communication I would appreciate the staff looking into. One is the uh, by David and the SEIU team, uh, SEIU bargaining team, there was two workers. They said that the, their wages are lower than the city living wage. I'm just wondering if the, if the city manager or Lisa Murphy, our HR person can get back to the council if that's in fact true. The other question I had is the city really unwilling to place Sharps containers around uh, Santa Cruz. That's another, if you can get back to us. So I know that you can't respond, nobody can respond, but I would like, a, it'd be nice to have a report back. Okay. Okay, we'll go ahead and move on to our staff presentation. At this time, we'll hear a presentation from staff. Um, then we will open it up to the council for questions. Then we'll open it up to the public for um, public comment. And then we'll return to the council for action and deliberation. Thank you, Mayor Watkins. Uh, good, at, good evening, council members. I'm Tina Scholl, the assistant city manager. And with me presenting this evening is Susie O'Hara, the assistant to the city manager. You've seen us many times previously talking about the issue of homelessness, and that's what we're bringing before you again this evening. Um, the last time the council addressed this issue was in December 11th, and that was a compendium, a large recap of all the activities in 2018. This item today is specifically related to the county and city of Santa Cruz joint action plan for emergency shelter provision and encampment management. This is an, an issue we know the council is <coughs> eager to take up and we are eager to, eager to bring forward to you as well. So the agenda for our presentation follows along four main points, um, setting some context, talking about current challenges, 
describing the funding and collaborative opportunities. That is why we find ourselves in a different time and place right now um, in talking about this issue. Three, uh, talking about the actual joint action plan for shelter provision and camp management itself. So going through the details of how that works. And then fourth, reporting out on the Board of Supervisors who took up this item earlier today in their, their meeting. Um, reporting on their action taken, um, Ms. O'Hara was there uh, to, to watch and participate in that. And then also go over the recommended council action we have for you today. So first talking briefly about current challenges and, and really nothing on this slide is gonna be anything new for this council or the community members here tonight or watching is that there, we are legitimately in a state of an unsheltered homeless crisis. Um, the council last January, January 2018 declared a shelter crisis and made the findings that we have such acute circumstances that we're not able to shelter our homeless population. The latest census um, point in time count showed about 1,204 individuals homeless in Santa Cruz, and the countywide average for unsheltered is 80% of that total population. So about 960 people were estimated to be unsheltered in the city of Santa Cruz. Now to the point in time count, there was just the recount happened on January 31st. Um, I participated as did other staff members and other people, so we look forward to those results coming out, and that will be likely June or so, because there's a series of steps and follow-up that has to happen in analysis. Analysis, but we do look forward to reporting that. Um, based upon the anecdotal evidence in our community, uh, those numbers going up is an anticipated outcome, but we will see. So we are definitely in a crisis state. Uh, we also have a critical need to provide additional emergency shelter beds. This is uh, a unified position of the city council and all of your policy actions for at least the past two to three years. And we've been working toward that end. Uh, we talk to you frequently on this issue. And then the most immediate challenge facing us is of course the encampment that's happening along Highway 1 and River Street by the Gateway Center. That has been the most acute a homeless crisis that we have, the most tangible example of um, a lack of shelter and the human suffering and the need we have in our community, as well as impacts on other community members, residents and businesses nearby, as well as impacts on the environment. You know, we heard about needles and the watershed. It's a very complex issue that was referenced earlier, um, but so this really has, is the top of our priority <coughs> to discuss and we'll be, we have an action plan around that to discuss with you. Um, so what makes now different in terms of opportunities? We've had a lot of energy, staff time, council support to work on homelessness, um, and yet we do feel that we are poised at a very different point in time, and it's very exciting for, thing, for tangible, real things to happen. And we have opportunity in two forms. The first is funding, and we've spoken to this council many times about this, is that we have about $10.6 million coming in from the state. This, these are one-time monies but to have this revenue flowing in and be able to put it to work pretty quickly is such a change, such a change for us and really presents so many um, opportunities for program and partnership and making real service delivery on the ground. So for an update on that, the proposals, so an RFP was issued, a request for proposals and around a certain set of different categories and priorities. And those proposals are due February 22nd. And we expect the funds to that for that to be dispersed as early as April and May. Um, and I will note that $9.7 million of this money has to be spent within two years. So there's a very rapid spending horizon for the major majority of these funds. But, but a new piece of information that I don't believe has been reported is that when working on this RFP process, there was a sense that even though April or May sounds quick, it's really not quick enough to deal with the acute suffering out there today. And so we worked hard with the county and the city of Watsonville, which are all entities that have declared a shelter crisis to say, can we do an emergency allocation from this heat money to get dollars at work more, more quickly? And that, that was able to move forward. So we have about a million dollars that were set aside and had a, a more rapid, um, proposal process to try to get those dollars going. So we hope that these monies could be released as early as next week. And they would do things for like hygiene services, immediate some of the sheltering programs you'll hear about, et cetera. So that is good. We, d we do, there's this urgency, we do have this money um, hitting the ground very, very quickly. 
And so here's just, this is a, a slide that just shows the cash in the heap. Those are the two grant programs. You've seen majority of this content before, but just pointing out the lowest row on here, the emergency sheltering LOI, which is a letter of interest process, which is a simpler um, procurement process for hygiene and also community engagement. But we won't talk too much about that tonight. All right, um, so the other aspect of, of opportunities, why today feels different, why we feel like we're poised for a change is the collaboration is, is currently at a place with our other cities and the county that it really hasn't been at before. Having a single-minded focus, having everyone at the table really working and talking in a way, um, we, we, haven't, we haven't seen it. Um, and I think what we're going to present today really exemplifies that. And I will, you know, point back to the two by two committee. The two by two committee. This was one of the recommendations out of the council's homelessness plan from 2017, which set forth 20 different recommendations. And one of them recognizing that. Excuse, if you could, we'll have an opportunity to have uh, you as uh, our community weigh in at this time. If you could, please. Uh, remain quiet and how if I uh, acknowledge that there is a person who does speak out, I will uh, let you know that you have a warning and then if uh, it happens again, then I will ask for you to uh, leave at this time. So at this point, um, we'll go ahead and return to, to our staff presentation and we will have an opportunity to hear from you. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, and so the two by two, this was one of the recommendations from that 2017 plan that said that the city and the county have a unique um, responsibility and partnership role to play. So let's create this designated committee of two city council members and two board of supervisors members. So the two by two that will come together specifically to talk about homelessness coordination. And so already this year in 2019, the two by two committee has met <coughs> twice, represented by Mayor Watkins and Vice Mayor Cummings and on the county side by Chair Coonerty and Supervisor McPherson. So already um, these four individuals prioritized meeting, set aside time in their calendars and met very quickly and with urgency and said that um, we really need to see solutions and came up with um, their own guiding principles. So um, they're here on this, I, I know the font's a little small, so I hope everyone can see it, but there were some four guiding principles that came out of the two by two and as part of this action plan. And this is also can be found as an, as an attachment to the report, um, the first part of the action plan. Um, and these guiding principles, I'll go through them very quickly. And then in case Mayor Watkins and Vice Mayor Cummings wish to make some comments from your participation in the two by two, um, that can happen. So the guiding principles were the provision of services and alternatives to people living in the encampment must be balanced with the health and safety benefit of clearing the camp by offering outreach and alternative shelter options. Basically saying that, um, that there, to the, the camp to be moved, there have to be other things supporting these individuals to move on to a better place. And also beginning immediately, though until the camp can be managed and there's other alternatives, the health and sanitation and safety were of importance. And there's a number of actions that were taken to ensure that. Um, the third talks about um, preventing future encampments. Um, in order to do that, there's this goal, this aspiration by July 1st, 2019 to have um, an increased year-round shelter capacity to prevent this. And then also the fourth one is that there should be future discussions about common policies and procedures and coordination. So, uh, so unsanctioned encampments can be addressed in a way that is more responsive and quickly. We don't have this growth of a large population like we're seeing today. So with that, I just went over that quickly. I'll, I'll turn it to Vice Mayor Cummings. Sure. I just want to start by saying that um, this process thus far that we've been doing, combining um, myself, Mayor Watkins, and two county supervisors has been a really productive conversation. Um, all the people who have been involved, and I'll, and I'll add the city staff and county staff who have also been very supportive and who we've been working with, um, have really been um, trying to find the most compassionate way that we can deal with the situation that we have right now um, to try to minimize harm, to try to find people's shelter within our community. Um, I mean, we have a range of comments that we receive on a regular basis. Um, there are some people in the community who would really prefer that we maybe just shut the camp down tomorrow and push everybody out. Um, but we have made it clear that we're trying to do the best that we can to find alternative 
are alternative viable options for trying to get people into housing um, as quickly as possible. <clears throat> we wish we could do it more quickly, but we're trying to work at a pace that is gonna get people into housing and also try to reduce the size of the camp and get people um, into the best forms of shelter or the best programs possible. Um, and so we've been putting, we've been taking a lot of input from people in our community, some of whom work in these programs to try to see what they're working on, how we can work with them, um, encouraging them to apply for the funding that's available. And so uh, I just want folks to know that this isn't something that we're ignoring. Um, we are trying to do the best that we can to move forward with trying to reduce the size of the camp and get people the services and the help that they need um, while also addressing the concerns of people who live in the surrounding communities. Thank you. I, I don't have much more to add other than that's already been shared today. So I, and for the interest of time, I, I, I won't say a whole bunch more other than that, you know, it's really encouraging to know that we have our colleagues on uh, from the county and on the Board of Supervisors <laughs> really interested and committed to having an ongoing dialogue with us so that we can most proactively and as best possible address um, all of the different elements that associate um, with this challenge that we experience. So it's encouraging, we're committed, they're committed and we're um, ready to get to work um, in alignment. And so um, I'm very hopeful in that regard. So say one thing. One thing. And, and just one more thing is that I just want to thank everyone who's reached out to us to provide comments, to let us know how things are affecting them, um, how we can do better. And I also want to thank everyone um, in our community for their patience as we try to deal with this, um, this issue that we have in the most humane way possible. Okay. Well, we'll go back to our stuff. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, uh, Vice Mayor Cummings and Mayor uh, Watkins. Uh, Vice Mayor Cummings laid um, a really nice <laughs> foundation for my comments, and I wanted to specifically give a little context as to staff's role in helping to develop this action plan. So as you may probably know, um, Assistant City Manager Shull and I have been working with the CAO's office for um, what feels like several months, and I think it actually is, in really trying to shepherd um, the programming around additional shelter beds in this community. Um, as this council knows, and the previous council, as we've tackled homelessness over the last couple years, um, the issue of siting, the issue of community acceptance and compatibility of homelessness programs has been a significant um, challenge for, for the city council as we've tried to move forward with programs. So um, staff's role is really just trying to continue to beat that drum. Um, having the CAO's office at the table with us has been incredibly helpful, and that also goes to the Health Services Agency, as well as the Human Services Department as well, um, and across the board um, with our city staff as well. This has been a significant investment of time and energy into coming up with solutions. Um, I did wanna give that context and also let you know that we did activate the Emergency Operations Center several weeks ago and facilitated by our fire chief, Hi Duke. Um, we are meeting on, on a weekly basis. Um, we know that conditions change out there um, day by day, hour by hour. For instance, we're expecting a heavy rain event tomorrow and thanks to Brent Adams for opening the warming center. You know, there is thing, there are things that we have to be responsive to and this is a, you know, a giant effort on behalf of the city in the county, so I wanted to give you that context as well. So um, to speak to the action plan, there really are two tenants to the action plan. One is to um, immediately increase our shelter bed capacity. And as I mentioned, you know, finding new suitable sites that the community has acceptance around um, has been challenging for the last several months and per perhaps a couple years. So this um, immediate plan, which will be funded through the LOI that um, we are reviewing tomorrow and hopefully we'll be making some decisions um, very soon, as early as early next week, will be focused on our current sites. So where we have or where we have in the past had shelter. Um, this morning, the Board of Supervisors did approve a contract amendment for the Salvation Army to open the Laurel Street Salvation Army building for women, uh, families with children, and adult, adults with mobility impairments. The Salvation Army building on Laurel is the only building that has an ADA compatible, um, accessible bathroom and shower, as well as an elevator to the second floor. So really, it's critically important for us to get the folks that are at the VFW to be moved over to the Laurel Street site, so that will be hopefully happening um, 
later this week, um, as soon as tomorrow, and which will free up some spaces at uh, the VFW site as well. Um, as mentioned in the staff report, we're also exploring the concept of moving back to the 1220 River Street um, site and the LOI and during our bidders conference, we did describe um, the kind of operating scenario we would expect to see there. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that. So we've had um, you know, a successful program out there that had specific neighborhood compatibility structure um, that was included in the operational plan. Um, we, given the environmental considerations that um, you know, the site is adjacent to our intake that serves 100,000 people, you know, there are additional environmental conditions and concerns associated with that site that we might not see in a parking lot or another, you know, s more um, hard surface site that's not adjacent to our river. So given that, we really are looking at feasibility at this time. We do think it's possible to find an operator to, um, to run a program there, but last time we weren't able to find one, so we're gonna have to work really hard with our community partners to see if we can, um, see who has capacity and who can work with the city and the county support to stand up a program there. That site is also limited in time by a construction project to replace our 20 inch pipeline that goes from the intake up to Graham Hill water treatment plant. It is our most critical um, raw water pipeline and it is expected to be replaced uh, starting in July of this year. So we do find ourselves in a situation where this, this site is really only available for a short period of time. And um, we had questions from Vice Mayor Cummings about what would be our expectation in terms of transitioning folks. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through the presentation, but um, it continues to be very complicated, but we do have more people at the table and we have more money <laughs> to spend, so there is opportunity there. Um, we are also recommending the continuation of shelter services at the VFW. So there is currently capacity for 60 beds at the VFW in Live Oak. Um, that is currently funded through April 15th. We would expect to ex extend that through the fiscal year, so through uh, June 30th. We are working with the Association of Faith Communities to um, expand their sh satellite shelter program, hopefully double that number as well as initiate a small scale safe parking program. They are poised and ready to go with that and so um, I expect through this LOI process that we'll be able to move forward with that. Um, we are exploring any other sites where their sheltering operations have we've had previously existed. Um, so if this, you know, if A through D don't come to fruition, we're we're going to keep looking and we're going to keep hammering away at it. And then also the provision of additional warming center capacity. So um, as you'll note in the motion, we are recommending a small contribution to the warming center for the purposes of provisions of blankets and, and other um, materials that Mr. Adams um, has requested. We also are working with him to open up the Harvey West Clubhouse um, and that will be a site for the warming center um, through uh, I believe the, the end of April. So um, have been working diligently with Mr. Adams on that as well. So that, um, this will be somewhat, uh, you know, 12 months ago we were having a similar conversation. So we were, we we're hoping um, in the next a uh, couple months with the HEAP and CASH RFP process to determine the feasibility of opening either an, an interim or a permanent year-round shelter. So as you'll see in uh, the notes here, We'll work with our nonprofit community partners, and that will be through the Heap and Cash RFP process to provide year round 24 uh, 7 shelter sufficient for at least 100 people to be operational by July 1st. Um, and we want to report back to you on how that, that process is going. So we're all very clear as to the feasibility of that. So within 60 days, the city and the county team will determine whether there is a suitable site and operator that can meet that deadline. And then we plan on returning to those respective governing bodies by April 30th to talk about the plans for implementation. Sorry about the font here, and I, I, will, I will paraphrase because there's a lot of information. So the second tenet of this action plan is to really um, ensure to the best of our ability with our combined resources and um, this immediate um, disbursement of HEAP funds to allevi alleviate human suffering, um, we really wanna focus on management of the encampment. 
and those um, to kind of mitigate the immediate public safety and health risks, we're gonna focus on three things, health and hygiene. Um, City Parks has um, been responsive to county public health um, in their request to ensure that we have sufficient hygiene um, facilities out there. So we have increased capacity. I think we might be up to eight porta potties with two ADA porta potties and hand, hand washing stations. We will continue to, to mo um, monitor those numbers and make sure that that is sufficient. Uh, yesterday, the County Health Services Agency installed a uh, syringe disposal kiosk, so that has been done. The county will coordinate um, and dis uh, the dispatch of teams from HPHP and the Human Services Department, so that's the Homeless Persons Health Project, to um, continuously conduct outreach to ensure that we've done smart path assessments provide the clinical support, um, health support for folks that are out there, including infection control and wound care, and then also d talking about public health prevention and education. And then um, we will continue, this is the city's parks department, to manage um, the waste that is created there um, through a contract that we have with an outside contractor. Um, there's obviously a significant amount of waste um, that we are managing on a day-by-day -day basis, so that, that contract is kind of a week-by-week -week operation. Uh, we will be balancing that health and hygiene approach with um, increased public safety presence. So you'll, as you'll see in the first um, bullet there, uh, Santa Cruz Police Department will uh, side a mobile command van um, and conduct enforcement operations on those committing crimes at Ga Gateway Plaza, the Tannery and Felker Street. Request the assistance of our um, other local um, law enforcement agencies. This is critically important as SCPD is um, highly taxed on um, getting as much patrol and um, enforcement as we possibly can out there. So really trying to lean on the Sheriff's Office you see um, S SC police as well as um, other agencies that might be available. And then also work with probation in the Santa Cruz Sheriff's Office um, on the focused intervention team, which was actually discussed at the county board this morning. Um, they are currently um, in a pilot phase with that that started uh, three weeks ago. So we're able to make referrals to that focus intervention team as well. Um, so that is, that's good news and refer those eligible encampment residents to the team. The city and the county will also develop a volunteer coordination effort. We have, a, it's wonderful, we have a lot of volunteers out there ensuring that folks have access, ensuring that we have some management of volunteers out there is something that we think is important for the coming weeks. And then ultimately the abatement plan. So we will together with the county develop a noticing and abatement plan to transition interested encampment residents to a, uh, alternative shelter as they become available and fully abate the encampment by March 15th. And that is obviously per the council um, direction that we'll receive tonight. So I'll take, talk a little bit about the county board action um, from this morning and then uh, recommended city council action. So this morning, um, the county uh, board of supervisors unanimously approved the joint county city action plan with the following addi additions that I wanted to bring to your attention. Um, they also, in addition to what you see in your packet um, for, with the first attachment, want to provide 24 hour security to minimize neighborhood impact um, as the encampment is transitioned and abated. Um, and also move the encampment fence. So it's currently directly along uh, the levee pathway, directly adjacent to the pathway, maybe six or eight feet back to establish a bit of a setback from the levee pathway. So they did add those two um, additions to the action plan. In terms of funding the security, that's something that we'll have to have a conversation with the county about how best to do that. I'm not entirely certain um, security is something that HEAP will um, pay for, but that's something that you can consider as well, and we will come up with a strategy with the incoming dollars. So um, this recommendation for your motion is in the council packet as well, but I'll read it for the, for, um, the benefit of the, the public as well who might be, not be able to see it. So one is to uh, approve the principles of and direct staff to implement the county and city of Santa Cruz joint action plan for emergency shelter provision and encampment management, including 
Um, and we wanted to have a lot of clarity around the dates so there wasn't any confusion moving forward as to what um, the council direction was. In collaboration with the county, provide Gateway Plaza encampment residents with alternative shelter options through concentrated outreach and navigation to begin tomorrow, February 13th, 2019. In collaboration with the County of Santa Cruz, fully evaluate the site and operational feasibility of, and implement when feasible, the temporary shelter options as noted in the action plan, including but not limited to the new Laurel Street Salvation Army program, which um, again, the board did approve that contract amendment this morning, a new program at 1220 River Street, which was the former site of the River Street camp, expansion of the Association of Faith Communities Shelter Program, initiation of a small scale safe parking program, expansion of warming center capacity, and continuation of the Veteran of Foreign, Veterans of Foreign Wars Program in Live Oak. And then the C here is in collaboration with the County of Santa Cruz, provide 30 day closure and shelter transition notice to the residents of the Gateway Encampment on February 13th, 2019 with a plan full abatement uh, by March 15th of 2019. And uh, last but not least, motion to fund the warming center in the amount of $5,000. We did receive a proposal from Mr. Adams for the provision of bedding and supplies. So, We'll take your questions and I'll return to the motion. So at this time, it's an opportunity for council members to ask any questions of staff. Are there any questions on this side? Do you have a question? I mean, number question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll let uh, council member Glover go first though. This is time for questions, for clarifying questions. That's what you said, absolutely, yeah. Glover. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, thank you for that wonderful report, staff, and for all of the work that you've done in addressing the issue of homelessness. I was curious, I noticed in the plans of action that it was to uh, locate, and I think the language is a syringe disposal kiosk. Could you go back to that slide, please? Thank you. So it's, it's a singular kiosk there, is that? So it's one of the large scale red, big right. bear box kiosks, yes. Okay, great. Yes. And, um, what do you need f from us to install more of them around the community? Because I know that there are more high use sites. I met with Supervisor Coonerty and he identified at least two or three other high use sites around the San Lorenzo Park area and also near the beaches. So what would you need from the council in order to move forward with more locations? Yeah, so about 18 months ago, the neighborhood safety team did start conversations with the um, health services agency on a pilot program to install syringe kiosks in three different locations. With the previous council, those conversations did stall out. Um, so we are you know, poised to regroup on that um, and work with our parks director as well as um, the SSP team and Dr. Leff to move forward with that if that's the way of the council. Wonderful, thank you. And then how many people are in the camp now currently? So um, by most estimates, it's anywhere from about 150 to 200, but not necessarily everybody sleeping. So there are people that you, excuse me, there are people that utilize the pro, like the area during the day and don't necessarily camp there. Okay, and thank you. Um, and with the proposed relocation to the different shelters, are there enough shelter spaces for that 150 to 200 people? That is, that is fully the intention is to um, provide an opportunity for everybody who is interested in shelter space to provide enough opportunity and shelter beds to transition everybody who's interested. So um, in terms of what we are shooting for, we are shooting for kind of a one-to-one -one match between what we um, assume to be the number there. And, and when you say shooting for, can you let me know what that means? Like, uh, is it uh, that you have that many number of locations secured through the proposal and then it's just a matter of getting people into those places or you're hoping that you'll have enough for the total amount of people in the camp? So as I mentioned in the, in the slides and in the staff report, um, the operational feasibility of all the sites still needs to be determined. Um, the, the big question in, in terms of feasibility is the site at 1220 River Street. Um, there is capacity there to serve 50, 60, 70 people, depending on what type of structure we use. If we do a, a campground again, or if we try to do an indoor structure, it really does get to, do we have operators that have capacity um, in our community that can operate this type of program? We'll know more when we're done evaluating the LOIs. 
Um, should there be a question about well, whether we have operational capacity, we'll have to return to the council and talk about how to make a program happen there. Okay, great, thank you. And then is there an estimated funding level that the city would be responsible for for motion 1B? Just an estimation on the city's contribution to the establishment of those additional shelter areas? So um, as mentioned in the staff report, it, it's expected that the action plan will be funded through the HEAP and CASH process and that state funding. Um, at the, I think it was at this um, December 11th meeting, the previous council did allocate an additional $100,000. So between that and the state funding that's coming in, we fully expect that these um, 1B shelter programs will be fully funded. The reason why I ask um, with regards to that, and I appreciate you specifying that it was the heat money, which I was aware of because of the report, but um, I'm just concerned about the cost associated with the implementation of this model of shelter programs, because as we saw previously, the River Street Camp running initially at $90,000 a month and then uh, ending at about $75,000 a month. And there um, are proposals which, uh, I brought forth, which were some of the items that weren't agendized tonight, that would offer the opportunity to establish encampments that could run as little as $150,000 a year. Uh, so do you think that having those kinds of options available to you uh, may make it more uh, possible for us to better utilize those heat funds instead of putting them all into things when they're uh, kind of, in my opinion, overpriced? So given the fact that this funding is coming in and um, for you know this time we have um, a lot of money to be working with. I think it's more a matter of citing. I, I do think we have the, uh, you know, enough funding to fund 1B. It's really about um, looking and maximizing as many different options as we possibly can, and then deciding where those might be able to be placed. Thank you. Uh, Council Member, I mean, Vice Mayor Cummings, and then Council Member Crum. Any other? Thank you for this report. And um, one of the questions I had, and I've brought this up a number of times, is um, to my understanding, this abatement process is going to start hopefully tomorrow. And then if we're able to um, find shelter and space for all the people there, the hope is that by March 15th, then we'll be able to fully relocate folks who are wanting assistance. But during that time period, I'm just wondering um, if there's any measures the staff is taking to keeping the camp from continuing to grow. So as we find people beds, is there any measure in place so that we just don't continue to see more people come in and by March 15th, we have 200 people there who we have to deal with at that point in time? Yeah, I mean, I think you've, t you've brought up um, one of the most challenging operational considerations that we have. And so this week, tomorrow and um, Thursday, we are gonna be meeting with county staff to um, talk about the board direction and the council direction and develop a, pol a guiding policy document for the operations moving forward. That guiding policy document will be, <coughs> excuse me, will be handed to an operational team and we will be trying to address the thing, kind of some of the stuff that you have asked um, questions about. Um, whenever there is a void, people will be you know, pot potentially filling in that void and we are very aware of that. So it's a matter of putting some structure in place to ensure that we do have some you know, operational standards um, in place to try to make that not happen. You know, I think that, it, that is something that's gonna be very challenging, and but we're gonna work on it. Councilmember Crone and then uh, Councilmember Brown. Thank you, uh, thank you, Susie, for every, you know, you've been at this for a long time and really appreciate your coming back and, and just keep at it, thank you. Um, thank you to everybody also out here who's doing it too. And I see many faces who I've encountered um, working with homeless folks and who are homeless too. Um, my one question really has to do with uh, C and I'm just wondering how the decision-making process went. How did we decide f uh, March 15th, um, well, full planned abatement, start, start abating it on February 13th, and then full abatement by March 15th, 2019. And is, is that even, well, go ahead and have a follow-up maybe. Yeah, absolutely, thank you, Councilmember Crone. Yeah, the timing, the dates, that, that's, that was a topic of a lot of conversations because there was a sense universally from everyone, city, county staff, city, county elected officials, this needs to be addressed as quickly as possible. For the people living in those circumstances, for the community members around it, it needed to move quickly. So I think some people would wish it could, it could be changed tomorrow. 
and magically if that could happen, I think that's an outcome everyone would want to see. So we were balancing this need for speed and to move very, very quickly, but also being pragmatic and being practical and thinking about, well, if we want to actually provide some alternatives to identify siting, identify shelter space, that takes a little bit of time. So that was one thing that we confronted, I'd say rather quickly, to come up with this action plan ideas, to come up with 150 bed spaces. But then also providing 30-day um, notice for folks. So we wouldn't wanna just go in tomorrow and let everyone know we're, you're, you're leaving today. So we're providing people, people adequate notice, intensifying the outreach and opportunity for people to get enrolled in benefits, to consider their <coughs> options, to think about a housing plan. So th that was part of it. It's balancing, moving as quickly as we possibly could with a feasible plan that provided people the maximum notice and opportunity. Um, oh, yeah, just, just wondering how the process went. Are we, are we saying that the two by two along with Hap and Heap came to consensus on that date. Just, I was seeing, because I didn't see any, and there could have been a memo, I just didn't maybe see it. Sure, so this really started with staff. Um, so staff started working, and, and staff between the city and the county, led by the city manager, who got a hold of, his, of, of the CAO and said, we really need to be coordinating and talking very seriously about this issue. So thanks to the city manager for, um, getting the county at the table with us, and they were willing to do so, but he did initiate that. So we were talking back in December and saying, okay, what is happening? What's the plan? What are we gonna do? So we started working initially on um, the outline, the, the framework of this. The two by two committee um, very quickly in New Year said, we want to meet. And so we met with them and heard very clearly the policy direction of, we would like this to move as quickly as possible. Staff, can you please go back and work on this and bring back an action plan that balances all the things I talked about. So, so it was really a combination, but I would say, I mean, it, this, this entire plan from um, the initial germination to what you're seeing today happened in a matter of weeks. Mm -hmm. last, last question, Mayor. Um, is, can the city make any commitments to the folks at the camp behind Ross Dresses for Less that we will find them a place by that, that date, um, March 13th, is it? 15th, 15th. 15th. excuse me. 15th. It is, our, it is our intention to get as much possible to do that. So can we absolutely guarantee, we're, we're trying really hard and we have the most feasible plan. We already have the Laurel Street <coughs> approved, that's 40 new beds. Um, the others are coming online with certainty. So I would say that we have plans that are, I'd say what, 80% mm -hmm. mature. So these aren't just exploration. We're, we're well past that phase. So we think that there is concreteness and reality to what we're presenting. Councilmember Brown, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, um, so I I am very sensitive to the urgency uh, f related to the the Ross or the Gateway Plaza encampment, um, and I'm also uh, sensitive to the um, potential for displacement, people who are really truly in need of a safe space to sleep. And so I'm just wondering if uh, there's a plan, for, and I understand this is a, a very quick turnaround time, if there's a plan for the council to get some kind of report back at which point in this 30 day period, we might be able to make a decision about a continuation um, if necessary, if um, shelter need, shelter availability is, is not um, possible. <coughs> so just if, if you thought about that, um, and, and then two, this is a separate question, you could take them both. Um, the amount of five thousand dollars for um, expansion uh, for the provision of bedding and supplies for the warming center to uh, essentially expand its services um, is what it seems to me it's it's a big ask for a very small amount of money and so i'm wondering how that uh, amount was uh, come to and if it might be possible to consider a larger uh, contribution to the warming center all right, I'll talk about the second one first because it's, it's an easier one. So um, Mr. Adams um, also has a purchase order with the county for the expansion in the amount of $20,000. And so that was really a collaborative effort um, between the city and the county to ensure that we had that um, moving forward. So that $20,000, $15,000 is supporting the um, expansion of the warming center. So that's increasing the number of sites that are available and then all, um, having the opportunity to double the capacity. Um, 5,000 is to support the storage program on Folker Street. Um, and I believe that purchase order 
um, is complete and yeah. Um, the $5,000 was an additional um, request specifically to the city for the purposes of ensuring that there's enough provisions from, of bedding and supplies. So between those, um, that is the proposal that we got from um, Mr. Adams. Um, as to the first question, um, you know, I think a lot of our um, potential moving forward really does hinge on the potential of using 1220 River Street and finding an op operator for that. Um, you know, I can speak from experience that um, as we went through this process, uh, you know, a year ago, it is, it's extremely challenging finding operators who can um, expand up for a short period of time and then have to expand down. Um, but I do think that we will see with this LOI process that there are um, a few nonprofits who are willing to come to the table and have this conversation. So I'm really actually quite optimistic. I think we are at a, at a different place than we were last year. But I do think um, we'll know soon if um, 1220 is a viable option. And if that is not a viable option, we probably would have to return to council and talk about what the plan would like be like moving forward with regard to additional shelter beds if we need to look for a different site and how that might impact the encampment abatement timeline. If there are no further questions from the council at this time, we'll go ahead and open it up to public comment. So I've received um, uh, four uh, organizations who requested additional time. And I'd like to first invite up uh, Mr. Robert Norris, representing Huff, and you'll be have given four minutes to address the council. Members of the community, and City Council. I wonder who picked Susie O'Hara and Tina Scholl to uh, deport and disperse the Roth campground without consulting with the campers. That's the one group you may notice they didn't mention. <coughs> the joint action plan as it's described is words on paper without substance. What is real out there tonight for the next night, the next week, and the next month is the real shelter that real homeless people have provided for themselves out of sheer necessity. That's the shelter this proposal would strip away from them in a month. I don't, I, I gain no confidence by, say, by hearing that, oh, you can come back in two weeks, maybe change it. You're gonna terrify a bunch of people and, and drive them into the community is what you're doing. It was largely built and managed by the homeless themselves. You can see this community from Highway 1 as you drive into town, ragged, overcrowded, makeshift, but real. This is a community we're speaking of. It must be spoken to, listened to, and appreciated. Not, not merely a place where Mills cops parade through with submachine guns. Yes, that's where they were two weeks ago as a training exercise or a show of force. Not just a target for abuse by Take Back Santa Cruz wannabes taunting residents or a fundraising source for our staff here. The Ross camp for several hundred people is the only shelter these folks have. And no glowing promises of the city manager, eerily similar to the promises of last fall, last spring, and the fall before from these same two individuals before this council, most of them the same, many of them the same, it's, it's the same deal, again. The city manager and the mayor have replaced the, cro the crone Glover resolutions. Glover resolutions, sorry, sorry, Drew. These were imported by three council members, introduced by three council members, prepared on time, well ahead of time, with accompanying staff reports a week ago. We heard a sort of apologia from the mayor, but she didn't allow the council member to respond. Interesting. Or the public, thank you. The, Glo the Glover Crone proposals include a necessary homeless emergency declaration, not here in this proposal. Reopening closed bathrooms, not in this proposal. A review of discriminatory ordinances, not in this proposal. A safe parking plan, a real safe parking plan with immediate relief for those whose vehicles are their homes. A transitional campground permit process so that people like Brent and other people can actually work on setting something up without having to deal with this endlessly dawdling, delaying, and babbling staff that we have to listen to for hours while each of us, except for me, because I'm representing a group, gets two minutes. If three council members can't agendize the most basic and essential initial steps, and instead we witness instead the proposed destruction of existing shelter, 
That's the campground. Are we really gonna swallow Susie O'Hara's pipe dream of a navigation center that navigates nowhere? A fantasy of housing first that doesn't exist? Or Tina Scholl's promise of a few extra tents crammed into the boneyard barbed wire River Street campground that served only 60 out of the 1,000 to 1,500 homeless at a huge cost? Or a handful of beds at 7th Avenue and the Salvation Army that can in no way replace the tent city that the city manager proposes to destroy? Is this our vision? Is this what we expect those outside to accept? Sure, folks surviving in tents must prepare for the midnight wake-up calls of Mills Police. The sorry, no public bathrooms here policies of Tony Elliott, Carol Scourge, and Isaac Ray. This council tonight can attempt to adopt an, agenda, an alternate agenda, and we're gonna be told it violates the Brown Act, but this council must try to do that and not Thank succumb you. to this nonsense. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'll go ahead and Before I um, invite up the next uh, organization to come and speak, I wanna remind uh, those that are speaking before us that we have council policy that is uh, driven behind uh, how we can be respectful and to keep all comments to the issue at hand and at all times avoid personal attacks on either council or staff. So at this point, I'd like to now invite up uh, Yasmina Porter, who will be representing the uh, Tannery Leadership Group. Thank you, and Yasmina, you'll be given four minutes uh, representing your group. Thank you, everyone. I think I'm speaking mostly to the vice mayor because you're the only person I haven't really gotten, we haven't gotten a chance to work with. Um, I wanna uh, just say that I'm here on behalf of the Tannery community that includes a lot of businesses and families, the Arts Council, John Stewart Company. Um, and first I'd like to uh, uh, hand it over to my colleague, Linda. Hi, thank you. My name is Linda Cover. Um, I live and uh, work uh, at the Tannery Arts Center. Um, I'd like to um, stress the support that we have uh, uh, for your proposed uh, uh, initiative to manage the camps and disband the Ross camps. In addition, we and we already have done this, is made it possible for the walkway to be used by pushing back the porta potties and places where people are hanging out so people can walk by. That's a good thing. Um, as the city did last year at the River Street Camp uh, when it was active, uh, we we got a security for our Tamp, uh, our tannery campus. Um, we, we we are requesting that again, just like you did last year. That's why the River Street Camp was um, a worth a worthwhile. Um, the last was that. Is that You're I want to go, go ahead. Go. You're good. <laughs> I'm just going to ask if everybody who's here to support. Um, what you're gonna vote on today, if you could please stand. So the proposal by, um, that you guys prepared that we read about. And if you could raise your hand as well. Some of you are already standing, so we don't know. Um, thank you, you can sit down. So one, I'm almost on the verge of tears because I got a, a paper that called Tannery people, they call this name, some kind of name. Anyway, um, one of the things that really is missing that I notice is actually talking to the people in the camp, which I did and we have been doing, um, and some of them are, are here. I didn't see anybody else but me that has been going out and talking to people in the camp and, and bringing them here. So the one thing that I would like to say is if possible, I would like you to adapt the proposal as is, and but adding that they should be offered um, gift cards or Safeway cards to the people that are voluntarily moving. And I also wanna state for misinformation that people have been putting out. The Supreme Court said that people have a right to sleep. You cannot make them move if you don't have a place for them to go. So don't not vote for it, just in case they don't find a place. If they don't find a place, they can't make them go. That's the law. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, was that our time? 
Okay, I just wanted to reiterate, reiterate that we really, as a, as a campus, we support what you're trying to do and get housing for people and something decent that uh, gets people in a place that works as part of their community too. Since we still have time, I wanna also share that when I was at the County Board of Supervisors today, they said that this, First of all, this is really, really, really important, everybody in this room, because there's funding right now from the state. And if they don't vote for something, that money just gets taken away. That's what happens. So what I'm hoping is that you're gonna vote yes for what's on the table, and then get back in there and put more in it than what Chris Cron and Drew Glover are talking about. That's what I'm hoping, that you're not gonna just fight amongst each other and then do nothing for the homeless people because they are my friends and I have been homeless and she has been homeless. So I hope you'll take action, you have the money to take action. And what I heard from the County Board of Supervisors today is that we were the first community, the Tannery and Felker Street community, to say, put it in our neighborhood. We're not saying move it away, we're saying take good care of them and do it right. And now you have the money, so make it happen. Thank you. Well, if I still have time, I'm still going to say this, that I, 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 I support you for going forward. Just go forward. Please keep in mind you're going to need a lot of housing. And um, I appreciate your trying to do this, finally. And uh, the, we, we're not the NIMBYs. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So... Um, our next speaker is representing uh, Conscious in Action, and that's uh, Steve Fleisch. Please, you'll be given four minutes as well. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as you can imagine, having just heard this report, it's kind of taken some of the hot air out of my uh, presentation that I worked on all afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I want to really uh, make an ego decision that I, that I won't give a bunch of emotional hyperbole, uh, and I want to do it, Martine, for this reason. I thought what you said was really important when you made your introductory comment about your relationships. Your relationships cannot be separated from us, the community. And I think that's one of my biggest bones of contention, uh, Martin, with the way this has happened is that we activists, and as Serene just pointed out, a lot of homeless people have not been a part of this decision making. And therefore we have felt alienated. <laughs> we have felt alienated and, and not involved. And I think that's what causes some of the emotion, you know, of accusation that it's not healthy. I wanna say to you, I'm a rabbi, change the commandment. Instead of saying, love your neighbor as yourself, say, love your fellow council person as yourself <laughs> with respect and the caring that you want to have from each other. But in doing that, invite those of us who are activists and who have worked hard on this to be a part of the process. And I, I particularly want you to know how grateful I am to Chris and and to Drew for all the work that they put into their proposals, but Chris and Drew, because of what I've just heard, I'm not sure, I, you know, I wanna think about this process, but especially because I'm hoping that you will make the effort, first of all, to treat each other with respect and kindness. I'm the father of a son who was on this council and who came home and cried too many times. So I know what it means for you to respect and love each other. Lastly, in, include us. Make us feel that we're a part of this process so that we don't feel alienated. And then hopefully in consultation with Chris and Drew and and uh, Sandy, I can come back in a couple of weeks and say, well, it, it, it's going forward. So thank you for allowing me the four minutes. Thank you. And our last uh, group is, um, oh, I'm not gonna pronounce this correctly. Casa de Aprendizaje Preschool, and that's Pedro Castillo. Uh, thank you, Mayor Hakins and uh, um, City Council. 
My name is Pedro Castillo, and uh, this is my wife. Adriana Castillo. Um, we just wanted to uh, let you know that um, we're um, a compassion people, and then we really understand that that you have a real hard decision to make, and then there's a, there's a uh, big problem that we face on our city. And I'm here not just to talk about ourselves, but also to talk on behalf of uh, the families. My wife has a uh, um, family <coughs> home daycare that she's been running for over 12 years, and then uh, she provides services for children, and then not just for children, also for the families. Uh, she provides classes for parents, and then um, we has been disturbing uh, for the parents when it's time to drop off uh, their children. They've been uh, having encounters um, uh, multiple times on the day, uh, sometimes during, during uh, pick up or drop off. Um, my wife uh, has to get up early in the morning and do clean on the street. Um, uh, I just wanted uh, to give you a brief uh, picture uh, where our uh, daycare is located. We're located on Parker Street at the end of the cover sack near the, uh, the levee. So we ride by the um, pedestrian bridge crossing, and then so on the one side we have the, uh, the uh, uh, homeless shelter, and on the other side of the street we have the MLI services. And also there is the uh, food and, and uh, um, uh, the liquor store. So what happened is, this is, not, this, this is not new, this has been going for a long time. Our street has become a, a, a highway for people to walk from the home shelters to the MLI services, to the liquor store or to get food. And then, so we've been impacting ourselves also our, our neighborhood, our community. And then the parents being seeing this, and then there is parents that uh, when they go and visit the, the program, they uh, they see the street and they get they, they get they get afraid, they get scared, and then so there is uh, pa kids they've been lost to or they've been missing to have a, a uh, education, early education that my wife provides because some of the parents they get uh, afraid of uh, what's going on on the street. But really here is we're asking for your help. Uh, and then to help our, the families that my wife provides service to. Um, what we actually need from you is, there's a lot of things that we, know, that we need, but um, if we can get some help, you know, while the, the, uh, the uh, these things that, you know, that, that move forward and everything. Um, I just wanna mention that we really, uh, support, you know, what you guys, what you would try to vote for, <laughs> and also we support that the, the people needing housing, you know, they, they really, um, we support that they should have good housing and a uh, place to stay. Nobody should be sleeping on the street. You know, we really uh, uh, approve that and then, and then uh, agree with that. So what we'd like to have is, is some uh, street, uh, pick up trash, uh, pick up uh, trash on the street, um, to have more police presence, it's, it's, it's like the it, it, <laughs> approved. Um, right across from our, from our, from our uh, school, there is a program, uh, day night storage, and then it's being conflicting with uh, our daycare, so we're asking if it okay. can be relocated. And you, I just want to say, you're welcome to submit your uh, hopes oh, okay. to us, and we can go ahead and review oh, thank you. as well. Okay, thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Okay, <coughs> so that concludes those that had reached out to me in advance, representing organizations. <laughs> so at this time, we'll open it up for public comment. And that's for um, any individual who would like to address the council on this item. And if you could please line to my left, you'll be given two minutes. And um, if possible, uh, please uh, show the respect that you hope to receive when you're uh, standing before us and uh, allow them their two minutes uh, to address us. Go ahead. You in line? No. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm fine. Okay. Uh, no, you, I mean, sure, go ahead. Uh, um, my name is Scott Imsland, and I um, live on Price Street, and uh, family got to come up 
uh, from Felker and, and have a comment. And I came with uh, a few people here that are from Price Street and we feel the uh, spillover from uh, the homeless camp and, and you know the, the bridge and all the traffic that comes through. And I just wanna support the, the police presence uh, that happens specifically on Felker and Price Street in our area. It's really super helpful. Um, I thank them and our neighbors always thank the police for uh, coming upon our calls and just having a presence through the Denny's parking lot, um, through the uh, hotel's parking lot. There's a lot of activity that goes on and I'm sure you're aware of it and the police are aware of it and I talk to them and I have friends in the police department <clears throat> that I surf with and they're, they're great guys. They understand the problems in that area. Uh, and I just wanna, uh, the security patrols that were a private company that came through our area had a huge impact on the drug dealing and what trafficking goes on in that area. If you live in the area, you see it firsthand. And knowing people in the fire department and the police department and also old city council members and mayors, um, they know exactly what's going on down there. And I'm coming from a side that won't be necessarily what's in this house tonight, but I see the negative aspect of the camps and um, all the bikes that have been stolen from my family and all the neighbors, all the cars that have been stolen, personally, three uh, broken into. Uh, thank God the police department found them all within 24 hours and got them back actually in great shape. They weren't destroyed. Um, and that was really, uh, the police department did a fantastic job in the highway patrol. So, okay. thank I'm you. sorry. Thank you very much. Okay, Bless thank you, you for being here. Okay. All right, our next speaker. First of all, I'm very angry. I'm gonna try my hardest to channel Sherry Cannibal's energy. She was always very respectful, so I'm gonna try to, please Sherry, help me. <coughs> October 10th, 2017. Not all of you were there, just Cynthia, I believe, was on the console. If I'm not mistaken. And you guys had said within zero to three years, you were gonna do a number of things. Secure storage. I'm just gonna go through a, a few of them. Secure storage, that would have been easy to do. Don't tell me, oh, Brent Adams is, is fulfilling that. He is, but it wasn't from your help. He did it on his own, not because of you guys. And thankfully he did that, so I'm happy, but it wasn't because of you. Restrooms and showers. Where are the showers? There are some restrooms over by the camp. Um, navigation centers you were gonna talk about. You were gonna talk about secure electronic device charging resources, no place like home. Um, I could go on and on, recovery center for crisis. None of these were done. Oh, I'm sorry, there was one that was done. Homeward bound. Yes, you've been able to get that one uh, easily where you can send people home. So I'm gonna, what, what about all the people that are living there that have pets? Are you sure the places are gonna supply that? Are you sure that people, uh, what about people that have partners, families? Are they gonna be able to live in those places? What about people that have, um, that have drug abuse, a, a drug, um, not, that are addicted to drugs, that are addicted to alcohol? Are they gonna be able to go to the, um, to the Salvation Army, to the other places? No, you are not yeah. gonna be able to move those people over yeah. straight Thank away. You. Please do not end Thank the you. campground, okay. please. Your time is now up. All right. Hello, my name is Vicki Winters. Um, I've been going out to the camp with um, my fellow members of the Democratic Socialists of America Mutual Aid Solidarity Group. And um, we <clears throat> went to the camp this afternoon and talked to folks, uh, mentioned what was on the proposal for the city council. Um, I don't know if any of them, I don't see any of the people we talked to here, but um, they wanted us to pass on these messages. 
The council sh should come out here and live for a couple of weeks. During severe storms, there should be a way people can stay in hotels. When we mentioned the that you're discussing 10 million in funding for homeless, they said it could build an apartment complex, but it will go in someone's pocket and they'll keep shifting us around. You don't wanna move every few months, but they keep shifting us around, shifting us around. Uh, one man who said he was a builder said um, that you should have a tiny home village on city land. He said, that's a battle I'd be willing to fight. Um, people just said, treat us as human beings, not animals. We're human beings. Uh, they should respect our privacy and not rip up tents. Uh, when it, I mentioned people who are familiar with the Ross Street Shelter, when I mentioned that it, a River Street Shelter, sorry, mentioned it might be opening, they just rolled their eyes. Um, so that was an expensive thing that did not do much good at all. Um, and then had a long chat with someone named Justin, coincidentally, um, who was identified as a veteran. Um, and he said that in his mind, the value of Ross Camp was that he could spend a few hours every day not focused on basic survival needs. He knew where he would sleep at night, he knew where he would go to the bathroom, and that freed him up to be able to access veterans resources at the library and, and, and look beyond basic survival. Um, he, I, we talked about the, the, these kinds of encampments they have in Eugene, where there might be a communal meeting space, and he was really excited by the idea of communally preparing food and participating in decision making. So. In my mind, I think we need new creative solutions and it looks Thank like you. you're more on the old way. Thank you. All right, we'll have the next person then on. My name is Ursula Reed. And after listening to the committee's uh, recommendations, good. I don't think so, simply because the, from my understanding from the Ross camp, there are 200 tents out there, if not probably more going in. Not only that, there are not just one people in the in most of the tents. There may be a few, but most of them have two or three or maybe more. So 150, serving just 150 people is not gonna work. And the thing of compassion and empathy, if you really want compassion and empathy, put yourself in their place. If even one person winds up out on the street because this camp <coughs> has gone down, then you're doing a disservice. It could be you, think about it. It could be you, don't do it. Thank you. Hello, I'm natealex.kennedy at gmail.com, 34698888. Now, uh, right now I've got my tablet taking dictation from verbal into text. Uh, we can put subtitles up here, uh, we really should. But on a more serious note, what we're talking about, what I think we need to do is open up as many campgrounds as we possibly can, but make them fenced. So they're fenced in, you can exit, but as soon as the door closes, you can't come back in, at least without being, uh, without somebody letting you in. And not only that, I mean Harvey West, several open banquet lots all over town. There's plenty of places we could do this. But uh, something I think is what we should do to make it more effective and more self-sustaining is actually charge rent. And I'm talking anywhere from $2, if that's all you got for a night, up to 50 or even more for a night for people that would otherwise afford to go into a hotel room 100 and 150 a night, you know, but they're in town just for the night, they need somewhere to crash, and they would rather do it in a sleeping bag on the dirt than in a room in a $150 a night hotel. Um, what we could have is even a plea, a, a trailer that had for uh, police to be in that would also have a property manager that could handle taking rent and letting people in. And uh, 
just that whole, the whole idea is we need, we could do it at Grant Street Park, we could do it in Harvey West, we can do it in a lot of areas with public land, we can do it elsewhere. If we have several, not one, but several campgrounds for people to go to, then I can see the logic behind stuff like the sleeping ban, the camping ban. But if we don't have anywhere for these people to go, we need to repeal those laws. Let people pitch a tent right on Pacific Avenue if Thank they want you. to. Thank you. Okay. Hello, thank you. Uh, my name's Mike Dealey. I would like to start by offering a quote, I believe, from Bernie, Senator Bernie Sanders. Poverty exists not because we cannot feed the poor, but because we cannot satisfy the rich. That, unfortunately, is true here. We saw it with Measure M, where homeowners went against those who are most vulnerable. Some people, elders who I spoke to, terrified because they worked their whole life looking at the end of their life on the streets, maybe prior to that. Tonight, I want you to consider, and I want all of us to consider, that we are living in an economic storm that has been waged against the working class and the poor for decades. So this is a formidable obstacle, not an excuse to say it is out of our hands and above our heads. We have to do something, but we have to also recognize this obstacle. Homelessness, I say they are economic refugees. And we need to think from that point of, of, of view, not how they're draining the system, but how the system has been drained, all of us, of our hours of work, just to live, just to put food. Here we live in a breadbasket of the world and we have children going hungry. We bailed out the banks for three, at $5 trillion in a matter of days at 0% interest. But we can't loan that money to our own Americans. We have more homes owned empty and owned by banks than homeless people in America. Now, how can we look at this from a micro, from our own a perspective as, uh, city, mem uh, as city residents? Well, we have a police department, but is that their job to manage the homeless? I'm not disrespecting those who serve in our force, but I do think, I do question the function of that office and our park ranger's office. How much are we spending on gas for them to be rolling on their cars on our bike path? How much is that gas? Do we have the budget? I don't think thank, so. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hi, um, Jennifer Lanford Brown, I'm back again. This time, this is really serious. We have to bring back 1220 River Street. We have to, to be able to get the people out of the campground. And I know this from experience. I've worked at Salvation Army. Excuse, okay, pause the time, please. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's okay, we'll go ahead and start the time and then it will allow you to speak and please, if you can. Speak into the microphone and we'll okay. have others. I've worked at the Salvation Army. I've worked at uh, all of the homeless programs at the Armory. I would pack it full by myself overnight, 115 homeless people a night. I've housed people for 20 years of my life, senior mortgage loan officer for Chase. Right now, I got my 90 day notice. That's what landlords do. I'm facing homelessness. I was homeless for seven months with a handicapped husband in a wheelchair and my 13-year-old daughter now. I live at 155 Felker Street. I support 100% what the city does. I trust you guys. I was assistant manager of the 1220 River Street program. I helped implement the Hold Harmless Agreement. It is a program that works 100%. I was at the forefront of pulling the people out of San Lorenzo. You cannot put them in a extremely high barrier place that isn't increasing the beds that we've normally had because when we had the armory open, we, I could throw 115 people in there easy. Same funds from the emergency shelter program from HUD. Why can't we just open it up again? There are people all over the place who can do it. We have to run by the same policies. You guys can do it and it works. But right now, Justin, you said finding people housing. I help people get into housing that are in that camp now. The reason why they're, they're not being evicted, they follow the rules and they're scared. Landlords put them on month to month leases and then when they decide, Thank you. they're out. Thank you. Hello 
again. I don't have a prepared comment this time, so I'm just gonna be off the cuff. Um, I just wanted to bring up a couple issues with the plan that I see, and that is that if SmartPath is your primary way that you are assessing people into housing, it's an ineffective program. I'm a SmartPath assessor myself. I have not seen people housed through that program. Um, and also, it does not include um, race or LGBT status in factoring in people's vulnerability, which is a big factor on people's vulnerability in the streets. Um, that should be completely rectified. I've brought it up multiple times. Um, to other people involved in that and nothing has changed. Um, I don't think that it's an effective program and I also wanna bring up the deterrence focused initiative or however it was rebranded, uh, the focused intervention team, that's it. Um, I don't think that the city, I know that it's a, a county program, but I do not think that the city should support it or work with it. It's basically a program to criminalize homelessness and specifically people that are homeless that have mental health issues and people that are homeless that have mental health issues that don't want treatment that has traumatized them. Like they should not be forced into treatment and it's a program to offer a carrot of housing that doesn't actually exist and saying that if people don't uh, follow the program that they'll be penalized more heavily. Um, it's really a terrible program and I'd say this also to the community, like this is really, you should be active about not allowing this to happen. Um, yeah, it's really, really terrible and there really is no housing and you know, commercial lots are erected, like things are commercial lots that could be residential lots. There are spaces for housing, but I guess a commercial, lot is more revenue, so that is prioritized. Um, lots should be prioritized for housing, and don't dissolve the camp. Thank you. Good morning, mate. Oh, good afternoon, evening. <laughs> Sorry, I was dozing a minute ago. Um, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Um, I just want to point out how great this conversation feels, as opposed to a conversation about uh, RV laws and uh, blue boxes on the Pacific, and this feels like a solution-oriented conversation. Um, I'd also like to um, point out that this year we are not facing a hepatitis A outbreak because of hand washing and facilities. And I'd also like to point out that um, the river, the uh, Caltrans property there, has there's always been some tents there. Um, and I know there was some concentrated efforts along Coral Street and Lime Kiln to move people along because that was impacting businesses there. So sometimes I think what we're seeing now is sort of a, um, the, there's no, right now there's no tents along Highway 1, like if you're headed up towards Mission, they were, they were there years ago. So I think people have kind of coagulated there. So it seems so huge, but a year ago it was much more dispersed. Um, and I also want to point out another wonderful, beautiful humanitarian thing that is happening at that encampment. Um, I go down there a couple times a week and I remove used syringes. And I also give out anywhere from 15 to 40 um, boxes of Narcan twice a week. It's getting used up. Sometimes uh, one woman, two people in one morning. Um, and I don't know if. Well, of course you remember, but at the Benchlands campground, there were two fatal overdoses in a very short period of time. Uh, I don't, haven't got the report from the coroner thus far. She'll have it in a few weeks, but every day there's not a fatal overdose at that encampment is a miracle because there's about a couple hundred people there. And that's from a community that's doing a lot of outreach, HPHP, and, um, and, and the people are, are empowering themselves to take care of their community and saving lives. It has nothing to do with not wanting to wait for 911. And thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Amy Liebichuk and I'm a social worker with the county. Um, my primary concern with the Ross encampment being shut down is um, where are folks going to go? And I realize that there are these shelter plans available, and I think that's great that we have um, plans in place. Um, my concern is, the reality is, we have a lot of folks um, that have mental health issues and substance use issues, which is gonna impact their ability to fit into um, the rules and regulations of the shelter programs that are available. Um, as a society, I think we need to decide 
is housing a human right? Um, if you have mental health issues, are we still gonna house you? If you have substance use issues, are we gonna house you? The reality is even if folks wanna address their substance use, um, we have wait lists at um, Janice Detox. Are we gonna get all these people in? Um, <coughs> It's, it's not a reality if you know we have, I don't know the percentage of folks at the Ross encampment who would want substance use services, but we couldn't get all those people in in a timely matter. Um, so we need to come up with solutions for that. The second thing I wanted to address was um, the proposal for all this funding that's coming down. That's awesome, $10, $10 million is a lot of money. Um, my concern is that as we've seen with the Section 8 program, I meet hundreds of families who have Section 8 vouchers, they've had them for months, years, they can't find housing, so it just turns into a lousy piece of paper. And I'm concerned that these rental assistance programs are gonna turn into the same thing. There's money available, but there's no housing for these folks, so we need to build affordable housing. Thank you. Hello again, uh, my name is Elliot, for those of you who did not catch that before. Um, I don't have any specific like policy suggestions or anything, just some concerns. One of them being that it strikes me as upsetting that suddenly we're all so concerned about homeless people just because they got together to do something for themselves and to set up a camp when these same people have been homeless in this city for years and years and years. People have been homeless for a while and we're only upset about it because they're organizing themselves. Um, and that's concerning to me. Also, it concerns me that one of your solutions is to bring in more law enforcement when things that are considered crimes in this town include things like sitting within 14 feet of a building. <laughs> which is something that people who live in houses do all the time and don't get cited for. So anyway, also just, I know I have limited time, but I wanted to point out that I also have concerns with some of your behavior, uh, Mayor Watkins, and I'm also a woman, so I'm pretty sure it's not like internalized misogyny, it's just your behavior. Good evening, I'm Scott Graham. Um, one of the problems that I see is that none of these places that you, that people go to, these uh, service centers, the, um, uh, uh, like the Salvation Army and these other places, none of them work for real people. You have to line up at four o'clock, get on a bus, go there, and then get kicked out at five in the morning. Now, if somebody that's homeless can find themselves a part-time job, and that part-time job goes from six to midnight, how are they gonna go to one of these places? It doesn't work. Right now, the people at the Ross encampment have free will. They can leave, go to their tent, they can go, come and go as they please. Homeless people that I've talked to, when they had the Boneyard campground, they called it a concentration camp. And that, that's the way most of these services are run. These are human beings. These are not cattle. They are not criminals. You have to treat them as humans. They have to have free will. So you, you have to come up with a solution that treats people like a human being instead of like a cattle, like a criminal. And you know, it's like most of these places work, on, work like the work release program at the jail. That, that's not a human thing. That, that's something for criminals. That's something for animals. These are humans, show some compassion. Come up with a program that works for a human with free will. Thank you. Mayor, City Council, 
Uh, there, there was a bomb dropped at the beginning here. I wish we had a little contract conflict resolution about what ha happened, uh, 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 the, the, the letter that the mayor read uh, about some of the behaviors. Uh, what I see is just maybe software uh, council behavior, somebody issuing something too soon and not having the process. But I, I really wish we had a, a clear hearing of what you wanted to pr present. I hope you get time, maybe maybe in a coming council meeting. So uh, be, beyond the common maybe, t maybe tonight. Uh, I, I really, I have a lot of respect for what the the, the, uh, the city's doing. It's a, taking on a, a really big uh, dragon, uh, and yet we're talking about this encampment. Here we are again. It's the same time next this year uh, that we were last year. We're talking about an encampment. We're not. I, I operate the warming center, and it, we're just proving that there's a, a, a completely different subset of population: 80, 100, 150 people downtown that aren't even part of this camp, and we're not even dress, addressing that. They're not making it into the winter shelter. We're t I, I want to talk about homelessness and. Santa Cruz, as a community, we should ba wrap our hands around this problem, not say, why are they here? How do we make them go away? But this is a reflection of us. If we were going to take better care of ourselves, what would that look like? 10 million, 10 million, whatever money comes and goes, all the millions we ever spent, this problem just keeps getting bigger. Let's, we, let's, let's pretend we don't have any money. Let's, let, then what we, we, we would do? We'd have to be way more uh, in, inventive. And I've been trying to talk about transitional encampments to this body for years. Uh, I still haven't had a hearing to, with the, the city manager's office. There's a reason I can't do that right now, but I do actually want, if we're gonna go ahead with an encampment like this, I mean, in the 22 recommendations, 20 recommendations, we said we would never do a declaration of emergency. We wouldn't do any encampments. Here's our second renegade drug camp, and here's gonna be our second police-oriented encampment. We're not gonna try transitional encampments that show data rich all over the Northwest. There are dozens and dozens of these. I've seen them, but here we are flying with blinders. <laughs> I just said, let's get real and do transitional encampments. Thanks. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor Watkins and members of the City Council. My name is Jim Brown and I'm the Arts Council's Deputy Director and Tannery Director. I was hired more than a year ago to help the Tannery Arts Center live up to its promise as a thriving arts community. <coughs> the arts are a force for good here in Santa Cruz and I'm privileged to have the opportunity to work with these folks. However, art and creativity can only thrive in a safe space. Tonight, some people have spoken about the challenges neighbors face with the unmanaged encampment on the San Lorenzo River. Some have spoken about the challenges and needs of the people living in the camp. Both of these are worthy concerns and valid for the council to be considering. The city county joint action plan on the table for this meeting is a valiant attempt by city staff and the, the council members and the supervisors who participated to craft a middle way uh, that addresses the health and safety concerns of the camp neighbors with the genuine needs of the people living in the camp. Expanded shelter beds, reopening the successful river camp, and connecting those in need with services. While it is not a perfect solution, it is a step in the right direction. And in my view, it's a step that could have been taken months ago and prevented the crisis that we're in now. In the interest of supporting the Tannery Arts Center as a safe and vibrant home for the arts, and in the interest of making real progress on one of the community's most contentious issues, I urge you to support the action plan presented by staff and unanimously approve the superv county supervisor, the plan that the county supervisors approved today. And I would ask that you amend the plan to include the security, the additional security resources that the county supervisor approved. Thank you. Hi, my name is Serge Cagno. Uh, I would like to very much uh, state my appreciation for, I'd very much like to s state my appreciation for everybody who's sitting down trying to solve the problem. I mean, there are a lot of really smart people that are really dedicated and really trying to do the best that they can. Um, I do this work because I enjoy connecting with people and sometimes coming to these kind of things feels like there's a lot of head butting and stuff. And um, for myself, uh, I, I want to say thank you. Um, for the two parts of the uh, um, recommendation, um, I like, uh, of course, I, I like the idea of more services, um, uh, that there's a second part of it of closing the shelter on a certain date. So the idea is we're maybe going to have a bunch of programs that are going to happen at that time is a phased rollout thing. I mean, you know the problem. The, the phased rollout of when the beds are going to be available but we're definitely gonna stop it at, at March 15th. 
So there's not gonna be beds for people. And to count the VFW of continuing that contract on 7th Avenue, April 15th as 60 of the beds of 100, well, those people are actually gonna be on the street too and are gonna need beds. So that's not, yes, it's, it's more than would have been otherwise, but it's not gonna be putting beds for all the people that are at the Ross camp. Um, the Ross camp, for me, uh, I think uh, uh, Rabbi Posner said it, that we all just wanna have a voice uh, with Mar uh, Mayor Watkins, we're uh, the Youth Homeless Demonstration Project. The youth voice is actually federally mandated that they get to choose which programs get to move forward to get voted on. But we're not mandated for that for adults, so we just don't do it. There is no adult committee of homeless people that get to actually say, well, you guys want to continue, do more of the rotating shelter, but we need bus passes to be able to do that program. So I, I'd like to ask for Thank adult you. voice, but also for the Homeless Action Partnership General Board Thank to be allowed to. And you're welcome to email us also. Okay. Hello, council, members of the community. Uh, my name is Av Hirschfield. I'm a tenant advocate in this community. Um, I want to speak to one aspect of the council, the recommended action for council about uh, part C of section one. I read that and it's pretty upsetting to me to read that camp described the term abatement as though people were roaches or rats or termites or pests. It's pretty dehumanizing language and I think the basis of any kind of action that this body takes, the city takes, is based in the language that it uses. Um, so that's pretty disgusting. Um, as someone who follows uh, how programs like a navigation center worked in the Bay Area, they're a joke. Uh, and part of the reason they're a joke is there is no housing for people to be navigated to. Uh, so if you close this camp, if the council decides to close this camp in 30 days, um, like the social worker from the county said, many of the people there will not be able to use their vouchers in order to find housing. Um, like some of the other folks who have spoken before me said, uh, people who are addicted to different kinds of substances, uh, which makes them ineligible for other kinds of shelter programs. People who have pets that they stick with all the time uh, because that's the one thing holding their sanity together. People who have partners and they're not allowed to live in a shelter with their partner will not go into the shelters. Uh, and those people are going to go onto the street into illegal encampments. It's really upsetting that some of the proposals that three council members put forward uh, around examining how laws in Santa Cruz criminalize houseless people, especially, so, for example, the one that uh, Elliot said about 14 feet being a criminalizable offense for sitting next to a building. Uh, most of you weren't on the council several years ago when uh, ex city ex uh, police chief uh, Vogel talked about what percentage of tickets are paid. I think over 90% of tickets don't get paid. They go to collections and they tank your credit and they mean you can't get into housing. Hi, my name's Nita Hertel and I am here to, for one thing, say what about, you started out with a number of like 900 people estimated in the city that are homeless and then you start talking about the 150 that are living at this encampment. And I second what this person said a while back. The only reason we're looking at that camp is because it's an eyesore and it's visible and people don't like to see that. People are driving by, coming through town saying, oh my God, there's a letter to the editor saying, I used to live in Santa Cruz and what happened to Santa Cruz? Well, I just came back from Portland, Oregon there is a lot more people up there that are homeless, that are on the street, but there also are solutions that the city itself are supporting, like Dignity Village, which has been in existence for I don't know how many years. And they allow people their own little structures that they can put in a designated parking lot, parking area. They've been there for years and it's a stable community. This is a community. And like Zava said, these are not rats. These are our citizens. They're residents, they live in our town. You may want them to go away and you want that camp to go away because it's an eyesore. It's in a shopping area. There's a lot of traffic that goes by. Well, these are human beings. Do you think they want to be there? I was f listening to the hail come down the other night and all I could think of was, how are those people surviving? 
How are they living through this? And how do you not go mentally ill? And how do you not become a criminal if you are pushed against the wall and you live in a community where there is no support? I know you're doing what you think you are, you know, you're doing your best effort, but I want you to have some imagination and go and look at other places, see what they're doing, talk to other communities, talk to other city councils, talk to the city council in Portland, they passed, they passed rent control. Thank you. My name's Michael Archer, I've been living here in Santa Cruz uh, since 1980 and, um, and this has been a problem, you know, I met people living on the river since then and, and I, I'm gonna say for me, for the last year or so, I've been living with my head in the sand, just kind of ignoring it. And I pulled it out yesterday, looked in the Sentinel and saw that the county meeting was today at nine and I went to it and I, I'm encouraged. I wanna know who I, who I write to the state to thank that gave us $10 million to address this. Um, hey, should, I, should I write Gavin? I mean, where'd we get the money? <laughs> I'm thankful, really I'm thankful, and I'm thankful for the hard work this woman made putting together the summary from that meeting today, and uh, the two women that are heading the council to figure out how to spend this money. And, and my request is that we try to figure out a blueprint that, that we, like many of the people I hear say, include them in the conversation go to them and say, how can we do this? What, what, what do you need? And I think, I got 50 seconds, I'll see if I can kick it out. When I went to Australia, she heard this story. I went to Australia, my friend and I drove about 3,000 miles around and I kept finding, we kept, every now and then we'd see an abandoned uh, Chinook, Winnebago, and I'm like, what's that all about? And he says, well, the government was, you know, upset about what they did to the aboriginals. And so, to resolve it, they decided on their own to give the aboriginals Chinooks, or Winnebago's, whatever they were. And the aboriginals said, Pfft, they didn't want these. Do you talk to us? And so that's why you see them like abandoned every here and there. And so I, I, I'm just, I'm very thankful, bottom of my heart, this speaks to who we are, how we deal with this. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Hi, good evening, Council. I'm Michael Gasser. Um, Vicki Winters mentioned the visits that the uh, DSA committee has been making to the camp the last few weeks. And yeah, I was with Vicki today when we went to the camp. We thought it would be a good idea to let the residents know what was happening because unless they'd read the Sentinel, of course, they wouldn't have been consulted about the closing of the camp or even um, informed that it was going to happen. Some of them knew because some of them had read the paper, but most of them were not surprised, to my surprise, because they're used to this. They, some of them are so cynical that they weren't interested at all in us bringing what they had to say to the council because they had no faith whatsoever in the process. They know better than anyone that the history of dealing with homelessness in Santa Cruz is a history of, of harassment. Um, we all know that. I mean, I, I'm not an expert on this at all. People here are. People have already talked about this. This is a long history of spaces that are open and not being used, being closed off, places where it's illegal to park for arbitrary reasons, which are clear if you just begin to think about it. They know what's gonna happen. They know that uh, even if there aren't enough spaces, or if there are and new people move in, what'll happen to that little niche there where people could live and are actually living is that it'll be fenced off like the other places that like the the corners of the walkway across highway one on high street not used for anything but arbitrarily fenced off right so that's what uh, targeting homelessness in in santa cruz is and Really, there are cities and states and counties like Cumberland County, New Jersey, like the state of Utah, like Medicine Hat, Alberta, that have realized that this is serious. And two things, it's not just an issue of, it's not just a humanitarian issue, it's cost effective to have long-term permanent solutions like housing first, like the transitional uh, encampments that Brent talked about. This, this involves radical solutions. I, I mean, fine, this is, this is a tiny beginning, but Thank don't you. close the camp. Thank you. 
Hello, my name is Marcos Negron. I represent the Grant, the Grant Park neighbors. It's about a thousand addresses um, east of Ocean Street and some of the businesses along Ocean Street. And uh, we're growing pretty rapidly out of necessity. It started off with the park, you know, needing to keep our park safe, clean, so we can have our families there, see our kids off to school, that kind of thing. And um, uh, personally, I've lived in Santa Cruz for about 30 years as a resident and a county, Santa Cruz County foster parent. So I know a thing or two about helping hand to mouth and about compassion. Um, I'm really glad that the neighbors and I have figured out how we can effectively work with the city and work with Parks and Rec to keep our, our park clean and safe. And uh, just to, here to represent them and tell you that the decisions that you make affect us as residents. And I'm glad that you're uh, putting attention to it. Uh, that's, that's about it. Thank you. Really good pen. I need it back. Okay, hi, my name is Elise Casby and I'm a longtime activist and investigator of homeless issues. I also became homeless due to domestic violence issues in my life and I hope not to talk about that too much, but I do wanna start with one metaphor that was extremely helpful to me. When you are getting battered, especially the psychological side of battering is about confusion. You're extremely confused. You love this person, they're telling you they love you and then they hurt you. It's so confusing, especially if you're not getting hit. So I just wanna say, Patricia Evans' book called, um, I forget what it's called, darn. Um, <laughs> it was so clarifying for me. There's about five books that I would recommend to everybody to read if you are ever battered or, or you're somebody who's recovering from domestic violence. The reason I'm bringing this in is for a victim like myself, there's two boxes. There's the box that your oppressor is in and they're telling you, hey, things are okay, I'm trying to work with you, but then they're harming you and th things don't feel right and it's not going well. And then there's the box you're in, right? You wanna believe them, you're confused, you're smart, you're trying to figure it out, you're not getting the help you need. There's finally a little bit of help from some people saying, you know, your batter is in another box. Their reality is different than yours. And you start to validate your own feelings and activities. And this is what's happening to homeless people in our society in this city. Karl Rove's strategy was in a nutshell, he taught a lot of people how to lie. And there's a lot of lies going around this community. Phil Kramer writing an editorial for the Sentinel stating that he housed 296 people. I'm sorry, I wanna see the evidence on that. The money we've put into rangers, the money we've put into harassment, people sitting in this council, people sitting in this staff are oppressing homeless people. It's a, and you. I say we need a new body to give us new solutions. Thanks a lot. Okay, great. Hi, my name's Brooke Butler. I've lived in Santa Cruz since 1984. Um, the first decade I was a renter and since then I've owned my home for 20 years. I'm one of the lucky ones. Uh, and I haven't really concerned myself very much with this except, you know, incidentally, as I go around town, I do notice the difference and it is bleeding over into the neighborhoods um, in a way that is, uh, an impact in the last couple of years. Um, I am encouraged that you guys have done such a thorough report and that there's efforts being made to do something, um, hopefully on a more long-term basis. I think uh, anything uh, temporary is just putting a Band-Aid on the problem. Um, and I'd like to see some more um, creative thought as far as um, Every time we talk about a tent city, I'm thinking tents are not any protection from the elements. Uh, these people are freezing cold and in the mud and, and even in a parking lot, I, I can't imagine the level of discomfort um, on top of the desperation and that we can do better. And if we're spending $90,000 a month um, and that, that's somehow not enough, I, I'd like to know I mean, I, it's gonna take more time than we have tonight, but I was sure would be interested in seeing how that money got spent and why it was so expensive to put up 50 tents. Um, 
I keep thinking back to the days after the earthquake, that first year after the earthquake, we had pavilions downtown that housed all the businesses <laughs> that were displaced and the people of Santa Cruz supported those businesses 100% shopping every day in those pavilions and it was a beautiful solution. And I know FEMA paid for those, but I'm curious to know if that's something that we could come up with using some of this money to buy a bigger space. Thank you. Hello everyone. My name's Alicia Cool. Um, I know a lot of people at the Ross camp. I seen a little show of hands earlier um, and I actually wish that I could do that right now and ask how many of those people would like to go and live at a shelter. Um, versus staying at a, a camp or at the Ross camp itself. Um, so I have a couple of suggestions. Although offering shelter beds are great um, and we should always have those available, because we know that that's not going to work for everybody, I mean, for all the reasons that have been discussed, um, pets, displacement, all those things. I don't need to go over all those things um, again. But because we know that a lot of people will not leave the Ross camp perhaps, and that won't work for them, offer the shelter beds, see what happens. Um, put off any closure or talk of closing the Ross camp. See what you can do by offering those shelter beds. Um, and see what happens. And in the meantime, while you're doing that, continue to work on the proposals that we worked with Conscience and Action and Huff, Drew and Chris, the interns, put forth those proposals because those proposals address a broader spectrum of issues. Um, and if you close the Ross camp without addressing and and putting forth those proposals. All you're gonna do is put those people back into the community, back under a bush. It doesn't do anything for any of us, the homeless or the community, um, if you don't address all of the issues. So I say don't close the Ross camp, but offer the shelter beds and see what happens. All right, my name is Trey John Spinner, and uh, I'm not from California, and I really don't know the statistics about what's going on here, but I'm pro, you know, for people that don't have places to go, because I also, for a few years, I stayed on the streets. Um, I don't feel like you should um, exile those folks um, or us, you know, uh, we should have places for the people. It's a lot of people that's lost causes, but it's a lot of us who also want to do better for ourselves. We just need that extra help or that extra push. So I feel like we should have the places to help those people get to those places, you know, and don't, you know, um, exile them. Um, and that's all that I have right now. Um, thanks for uh, having this issue discussed in the community. Um, on uh, Sunday, just as we were done, I had run out of food, um, a woman comes, maybe in her, she's in her 60s or so, and she's all bundled up. And fortunately, somebody had donated a blanket so she could wrap herself in that. And she goes, um, like, is there a shelter? I, I just can't sleep outside again another night. And so, well, you know, we mentioned the Homeless Service Center. She said she'd gone there, but there was no room there. And so I called Mel to see if I could find, um, you know, the face community shelter. I called uh, uh, Brent Adams' number, and um, they didn't have a warming center. But it was bitter cold. It was terrible. And it's just heartbreaking to just look into the eyes of that woman and say, man, there is nothing I can do. I can't, I wanna bring you home. I'd like to bring you home, but I can't, because I don't have control of my home. So, you know, that, it, this is heartbreaking. These are, and, and people have said some amazing things. I was gonna say what Abby Samuel said. She pointed out exactly, more eloquently than I could, this whole idea of having this study that grew out of two years of us sleeping on the sidewalk in solidarity, but we got to go home and take a shower. These other hundreds of people, they don't. And it's just heartbreaking that we don't take 
this, we, we've been up here for years. We talked about building SROs back at the time of the earthquake in preparation for this day when there would be so many people living on our streets. These are our economic and political refugees. They're internally displaced people. I think the city council should ask the UN to drop food aid in here and start solving this problem. Hi, my name is Lori Egan. I'm the programs director at the Coastal Watershed Council and I'm here today to ask you to approve this plan. The Coastal Watershed Council works to inspire people to explore, enhance, and protect the Lower San Lorenzo River. I want to acknowledge the council and the city staff who have worked so hard for the progress that has been made to date. Today, I urge you to hear the concerns of the people who live along the Lower San Lorenzo River regarding the management both inside and outside of the camp. I want to acknowledge you and urge you to continue your effective collaboration with the County of Santa Cruz and to continue to communicate publicly about these efforts. Thank you. Hello, my name is Brian Schulman. I'm the producer of the BTS Presents show. Last year we did a series of shows on real estate behind the scenes in Santa Cruz County and Silicon Valley. This year we're working on shows about the community cafe, which is a subject of community discussions. It's fine. Hi, Mayor. So I just wanted to let you know that I, a few years ago in 2014 there was a mayor's challenge nationally for ending veteran homelessness. At that time, I did a television show on ending veteran homelessness in Santa Cruz that Mayor Don Lane had taken his oath as a mayor to fulfill on completing ending veteran homelessness in, by the end of the year. At that time, there's a point in time count of the homeless people in Santa Cruz County, and it was 3,500. So, so today, when it's brought to our attention from the presentation today that we're down to 1,200 as a point in time count, I think it does not occur that there is an emergency and therefore I think the consideration for taking action today is relevant, but I don't think that, a, a, I don't think that we should declare an emergency. Hello, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members and staff. My name is um, Ari. I was born in 1995 and I've been a resident in Santa Cruz County since. When I was 17 years old, my mother terminated my residence at her household. I'm sorry to interrupt you just a second, sorry. Okay, go ahead, please. Um, my mother terminated my residence at her household when I was 17 and I've been homeless since then, on and off. During this whole time, I've held employment. I just got done working at Woodstocks for two and a half years. I actually have a member in the um, behind me who is uh, my coworker who had no idea I was homeless until this point. I mostly lived in my car for the last year and that got me in trouble with the law enforcement for purely sleeping in my car and I would do my best not to be in neighborhoods and still got in trouble and it made it almost impossible for me to keep holding employment at my job. And also there's something that I haven't heard brought up once tonight, and Santa Cruz is a big location for transients because it's warmer than all the other locations. Especially in the winter time, we have more homeless people come to Santa Cruz to find shelter and refuge probably than any other town in California because of the weather. And being homeless for the time I have, there's so many more homeless people that we can even account for. I would estimate numbers 3,000 to 4,000 easily. I went to Tent City for the first time today because someone stole my phone and I located it there and had the chance to talk to everybody there and meet them and met amazing people. People who offered me phones, offered me food and gave me clothes while they're in worse conditions than I am. And the biggest thing I think too about them is there's a lot of drug issues there that really aren't being thought of. And for a lot of these people, if they were just to be sent to a shelter, problems would keep pursuing and they wouldn't get the full benefit they need. A lot of these people need help if they wanted. And there needs to be more communication, I feel like, with the people that are actually homeless to see what is needed because these resources wouldn't help me being homeless. I need more job opportunities and I need more food opportunities. Thank you, Council. Thank you. I'm gonna try to keep this short. It's getting awfully late. I think, thanks you guys. I've met many of you. Um, 
I really appreciate what you're trying to do. I'm out there in the audience torn between the get rid of those people and how dare you even consider it. And frankly, I find that all just very upsetting that that it's so divided and frankly, so disrespectful. Um, my, <clears throat> some of my friends back there are like, you're not cynical enough. Well, I'm not cynical enough. I think you're trying to do some really good stuff. Is it gonna work? I think so. Is it perfect? No. Um, I guess what I really wanna say tonight is I would really hope that besides what you're looking at, we look at some things about how we define housing. I had a friend who um, is a retired teacher, very respectable person, was gonna buy an old convalescent home which would have housed like 20, 25 <laughs> low income people. And she couldn't do it because it only had 10 parking spaces instead of 15. I mean, come on. I think we have to get our planning stuff. I mean, maybe we're stuck with, with the Uniform Code Act, but maybe there are exceptions. Um, I realize that's not where you are today, but I think part of what's gonna help all of this is if we redefine what's housing in this county, because besides our huge suffering homeless population, how many of you have kids, grandkids who you will not see because they can't live here? So you put just put that into the mix while you're doing this, and I appreciate you, thanks. Good evening, my name's Linda Weaver. And um, people having to live outside, that's cruel. Closing the River Street camp, it was cruel. And I very much wanna be respectful for all the work that all of you are doing and you are serving. But over the years, I have to be honest, my observations have been that this all looks to be kind of helter skelter. But tonight, it was actually described as being lots of stall out. And that is what I think I have been observing over the years is stall out. The only clear action proposed in that is the closing of the camp on March 15th. Everything else is about when feasible which sounds like possible stall out. I see this as actually an opportunity. The campsite is an opportunity. You have 150 people who have gathered and have the possibility to become transformed community. So repurpose the Ross camp to a transitional encampment based on the proven models in Seattle and in Eugene and other places as well. So delete C in your action. The unsheltered, and I know this from, from working with, with people, the unsheltered need consistent long-term solutions. It is cruel and non-productive to not give them consistency in one place. Thank you. So they can regain their stability. Thank you. Oh, dear God, please be up in this room with me and tell me what to say. Can I have permission to speak from my heart? I love you, Mary. They might be not with you right now, but I love you. All that was just, all that stuff, that ain't right what y'all did in front of us. I stayed down there three days at that camp. I built a little old uh, box shed for this woman and these three kids. Thank God the next day I found a place for this woman. And they had to take her out to Watsonville with them three little kids, y'all. That was sad and I'm touched behind it. And I'm touched behind all them drug addict dope fiends down there. And I can talk like this because I was a dope fiend. 
but I got 33 years clean and sober, and I know there's help in this town. There's resources all over the place. If these folks wanted help, they would reach out and go get help. And I ain't got no pity party on nobody who don't. You talk about compassion. You talk about empathy. You talk about 150 people. You who got shelters here, take one person at a time. Take one of each of those and take them home and have the patience to go eye to eye with them. Go here to here with them and march them over to the AA program, the NA program. It's a lot of racism going on around here. And that's what I'm up against. I go to the Hopi Reservation, those people take me in and I don't even know my name. And they live in a box. All them folks have got open communication. And I look at you talk about empathy and love and compassion. Thank you. Then let's take action and do that. Okay. Good evening again, Council. Cynthia from Santa Cruz Tenants. I had to hear this litany of landlords talking about their threats to, um, oh, have a, a referendum or a recall, bailed threats, and kicking people out if there's any tenant, uh, any tenant protections passed. And it seemed like, uh, you know, there's this. Uh, they don't like to have someone tell them what they can do with their property, but they're not really that concerned about their property values. As I know on Felker Street, uh, someone just bought a, a small four unit building for over a million dollars. It's 48 years old. The carpets haven't been changed in 48 years. They raise the rent $400 on each of the four families. They do things like cook for you and clean for you in your city. Um, are those people going to take advantage of the new little ordinance and move? No, they're trying to hang into their, their place. So this, um, I, I have empathy for the Castillo family. I do because there's children and it's probably really an adjustment. But I have to say, um, if people are pressuring you and worried about their property values when homeless people are in their neighborhood, that's just bull because over a million dollars, this guy bought the place sight on sight unseen because I was there when he was inspecting it. And he gave, he told his tenants to lie to the bank and tell them that they pay $400 more a month uh, so that he could get the loan. And then he raised their rent $400 from $1,400 to $18, uh, $1,800. So there's no problem with property values. And the sick thing is the landlords don't care. They just kick you out because they know even if there's a bunch of people who are homeless on the streets, they can still sell their crappy old place for over a million dollars. So you figure that one out. <laughs> Hi, my name is Dennis Outlaw. I've been a resident here in Santa Cruz for about 30 years now. And I, uh, like many others here in the audience, thought that we had a new city council that would address issues that had been avoided almost since I've been here, <laughs> and longer still. But what I see is that the old way of doing things is being resurrected and being pushed through. I look up at this recommended city council action and what I see is simply put, the same old, same old. Bonnie, before we start, your um, before, are there any other members who are in the chamber who are interested in addressing the council bef before us at this time? Okay, seeing a few more. Okay, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Luba Kaplanskaya. I am a student at UC Santa Cruz and I just wanted to offer a suggestion. I am originally from Los Angeles and I've been working with an organization called Homeless Healthcare Los Angeles for many years and they just opened up a center called the Refresh Spot. The homeless problem in Los Angeles is also very big. There's over 64 blocks of individuals experiencing homelessness in the Skid Row population. And I recognize that funding is a huge issue and I can't even fathom 
how much it costs to run a center such as the refresh spot and how people even receive funding. But I can vouch as someone who has spent lots of time volunteering there and will be there this Friday that the opportunity for individuals that are unhoused to take a shower and have access to restrooms, which is what the refresh spot is, is invaluable. I have seen people from the ground up being able to get jobs because they're able to get a shower and go to job interviews and get back up on their feet. It's a fantastic idea and maybe that's something that could happen here in Santa Cruz. Again, the refresh spot, which I haven't mentioned, is like seven trailers with sh fully equipped with showers and laundry stations and it's all free and it's open 24 seven with security and there are electronic charging stations and it's a very comfortable, safe spot for people to be. I recognize it's so expensive and I don't know how they do it. It's from uh, Mayor Eric Garcetti, who I guess approved a grant permits for that, but it would be really great if we could have that here. I don't see anything like that, and I've seen it, again, like I've said, change people's lives. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. My name is Cherie Peterson, and um, once again, I, it seems like I've been addressing this for 7,000 years, the homeless. I've been homeless since way before I was born, it feels like, because I'm just tired of it. I'm, Today, crawling out of my van, I could I could only find two different shoes. Finding find, just clothes to wear is a problem. I go to Cabrillo. I make aids at Cabrillo. I'm not going to let it stop me. That I've looked at over 2,000 apartments. I don't have a credit score because I don't believe in charging money. I don't have, so therefore I don't fit in. Just like the people that are drug addicts and have dogs or whatever people mention aren't going to fit in the shelter beds. The shelter beds, actually, I'm sure that you know, you have to go to building K and be medicated with psychotropics to be in one of those shelter beds over there. You can't sign up and say, oh, I want to come in. I'm homeless. No. And then the other places over there are all running with meth and heroin. I don't know if you know that, but that's really true. I know people that have moved out of there because of the rampant drug abuse. It's appalling. And you're just not looking at it, not looking at us, the real people that are like, I almost died in, right before my grandbaby turned 12 in September. And it was lucky my friend Kale rushed me to the hospital or I wouldn't be standing here right now begging you, begging you to have temporary housing, to open that yellow building over there, to serve macaroni and cheese tomorrow at four o'clock at the homeless thing. Get real, get real, give us real solutions, not this crap. Oh, close the camp, close anything that works. What about us? What about us? Am I gonna die and there'll be nothing happening? You won't even have the shovel working or no one will, the architect won't have any plans because you'll plan to figure out that it doesn't matter and that's appalling. <laughs> Uh, my understanding is that we have one additional speaker. Is there anybody else in the audience who wishes to address the council? Okay. I'm, you, if you could uh, line up to uh, my left, there was an issue. Oh, that, okay. Uh, okay. You will be our, our last speaker. Go ahead. Uh, hi. Uh, my name is Wes White. I'm from Salinas. I'm uh, president of Salinas Homeless Union, also on this California Homeless Organizing Committee. Um, wanted to bring your attention. There's uh, it's, first they came for the homeless is in Berkeley, and they they're in between. They're on BART land, and and they're in between jurisdictions. And and what they do, they put a fence up, and now those same people are next to the road. So, you know, you, you have to be careful. You're not putting people in worse harm's way. Sacramento is about to, to close the Stockton encampment and it's between city and county property jurisdiction. Again, they're put up a fence. They're gonna drive people out. How are we actually helping people? I mean, people deserve food, clothing, and shelter. That's, that's basic human necessity. If it's just a piece of dirt or whatever, they deserve to be somewhere. You know, sign them up for the continuum of uh, care. If you need to identify them and assess them, know who you're dealing with, separate the harmless from the homeless. That's what I need to see happen. 
you know, um, and the continuum of care is about the only thing you're gonna be able to identify with, which is all dirty talk because it's about hungry hippo and some money, mental illness and drug addiction. You don't think house people have mental illness or drug addiction? I mean, what we're doing is, is a drug addiction in itself. You're, you're spending a whole lot of money hurting people and, and the human suffering is what's paying for it so that we can feel good about ourselves. Are you kidding me? There needs to be spaces available, Martin versus Boise, public, private space, make a collaboration. You need warehouses, you need something. You need a place for, to put these people. If you take them out and there's nowhere for them to go, you're violating Martin versus Boise, which is constitutional, and you're, you're being completely illegal. All these camping ordinances, they need to be stricken from the books. That's just the way it needs to be. You need to start dealing with people, treat people like people. You know, you treat them like little kids. What do we do with the, oh, I don't wanna deal with that brat, let's just get rid of them. You know, that's, that's it's abusive. You're our city parents, you need to take care of your children better. You, you need a stricken C altogether. A is just pass out a piece Thank of you. paper and Thank B you. is maybe we'll come up with stuff. Thank you. You need something. Permanent. <laughs> Hello, my name is Travis. I've uh, been here for, well, I've been a resident of Santa Cruz County for 20 years now. And I also have had a uh, residency in uh, Brookdale for up to seven years. Uh, I had lost my social security and uh, I've been homeless in Santa Cruz downtown for the last 10 to 11 years. And the only carpet I've been seed, seeing laid down has been being pulled out from underneath me. And all of the weather that I've been seeing, uh, I, I don't have any place to go anymore. There's no, there's no overhangs. There's no area where I can set up a tarp. Uh, there's no time period for me to be able to sleep anywhere. I have grand mal seizure epilepsy, and I've had over six seizures last year just because I've only had two to three hours of sleep every night. Um, all, all I want to say is just become friendlier people. Don't, uh, don't rev your engines, slam your car doors in front of people that are sleeping next to you. They're just as afraid as you are. And they do not want to hurt you. They do not want to be hurt. I am more afraid of shuffling feet and people that are rap rattling my tarp when I'm sleeping in the rain. And I am a police putting handcuffs on me and going to jail in the morning. So, Please have some love in your hearts, have some empathy, and have some sympathy. Okay. So, um, I'm gonna acknowledge that I believe that we have had everybody who's wanted to address the council okay speak. One last, is that okay? Absolutely. This is this would be you would be our last speaker unless there's any other member in the in the audience I that. I can't. Second. I'm sorry. I can't because you already had your time. And we. Who, I know everybody's everybody gets one opportunity. Well, I so I, I appreciate that. Okay. 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 Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That was. An, okay. You'll have your two minutes. Go ahead. Hello, Council. My name is Alex Londos. I'm tired and I'm really not in the mood to talk to anybody here, but I felt there was a few things that I wanted to mention. So as we deal with global issues, the human population will continue to see um, more disasters related to climate change, like we saw the 13,000 houses burnt down um, in paradise. We're gonna continue to see more floods and people displaced because of climate change related disasters. We're gonna continue to see the divide between the rich and the poor grow because of our capitalistic society and AI 
replacing um, people, uh, technologies, software, um, different computer programs, and we're gonna continue to see more homeless people, uh, not just in um, the US, but around the world. So I just got back from a long duration in Europe and I saw very few homeless people in there. Maybe it's the way their society is structured. Um, so I'm mentioning all this because I haven't heard one mention of tiny homes throughout this entire talk. Um, I think uh, there's a lot of people that live in huge houses. They live outside of their means. They own things that they don't need and that don't serve a purpose. A lot of the people in our society in Santa Cruz with the amount of money people make per capita, they see people that live in houses um, because that's how they want to live. But there's a lot of people that are in the homeless population that may be more minimalist than the average person. They may want to live in a smaller house, a smaller dwelling. I know that San Jose is starting to implement the tiny home village as our other communities around the world. Um, a lot of third world countries that I've been to, there's a lot of people living in shacks and shanties and we don't offer, um, the size of houses has to be a certain size for people to live. So I would think um, for women, children, disabled families um, that you would consider some sort of tiny home village or implementing that or discussing that somehow and how that might work for this homeless population here in Santa Cruz um, for to help them and for the um, minimize the environmental impact of a single person. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Okay. 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 It's okay. Okay. Thank you. I want to, um, I'll go ahead and uh, bring it back to the Council for Action and Deliberation. I want to thank each and every one of you for being here and taking the time to address our council um, and acknowledge that no matter your position, um, I think we all share a value for seeking solutions. Um, so I'll go ahead and bring it back to to the Council for Action and Deliberation. Okay, I'll start with Councilmember Myers, Cummings, and then uh, Glover. Um, just in the interest of time, and I know that we will be deliberating, I'm sure, for a while, I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, I'm gonna move to, um, I'm gonna put a motion to approve the staff recommendation as presented, um, <laughs> and then add a few additional uh, items as well to be consistent with um, some of the um, some of the intent um, from the Board of Supervisors this afternoon, uh, and then add just a quick comment after it. But uh, I'd like to add that, um, that we make sure that um, upon hopefully these facilities getting open as quickly as possible, that uh, we also make sure that they are operated with models that um, provide adequate management, staffing, um, uh, so that, uh, people can be properly cared for and, and, and feel welcome into, these, into the situations, including um, security and uh, understanding how to communicate about uh, this with the uh, surrounding communities and neighborhoods. Um, I think also we would wanna make sure that we're um, aware of or establishing um, the ability to understand who's, who's coming and going from the shelters that we have a proactive neighborhood outreach plan and good neighbor policy to ensure strong connection and communication between the operator and the neighbors. I think we've heard some uh, success stories from the River Street Shelter on that, um, that we maintain 24-7 um, hygiene and safety standards so that people are safe and uh, able to uh, maintain, their, <laughs> maintain their wellness in the facilities and that we have well-structured and enforced shelter rules and regulations, um, and including establishing a set of norms um, that the community and the residents of, of each of these facilities, when they're open, can communicate about and uh, agree upon. Uh, and then uh, in keeping with uh, the need to continue to work to address the other 900 plus people in our community that need help, uh, I'd like to add that we continue to collect information on the clients served at these facilities um, to make sure that we are understanding the uh, demographics and the circumstances of those served, um, similar to the continuum of care model. So I'll put that motion out there. I also just want to um, also potentially request that the staff, well, I'll request that the staff come back um, after the outreach is done uh, starting tomorrow. If we could get a, a report in a couple of weeks um, to understand how many folks are going to be looking at taking, uh, taking us up on some of these facilities so we get a sense of, of sort of how many people are ready to 
move into the other facilities, that would be helpful, I think, to uh, continue to work on this. Okay, so there's a motion by uh, Councilmember Myers and um, to move the recommendation with additional, I'll second that motion. Um, Vice Mayor Cummings. And then <laughs> First off, I wanted to um, acknowledge one of the things that I heard in the audience this evening. Um, Santa Cruz has, um, and the downtown community, or the community that we have, has been, has a, a population of people who have been living homeless. And I think that in addition to the people who we have who are um, being put into homelessness due to a variety of reasons, including um, um, not being able to afford rent or being um, forced into evictions um, or orders to quit that end up putting them on the streets. I also want to acknowledge that um, the university is playing a role in this as well, and that uh, by putting students who are homeless on their campus, by not allowing them to sleep on campus, that's further adding to the situation that we have to deal with. Um, and I so I would want to um, ask staff if they could reach out to the university um, to find out and encourage them to see if they are, are um, if they're able to provide alternatives for their homeless students, um, allowing them to sleep on campus, and also if there are parking options and opportunities for students uh, who sleep in their cars to sleep in their cars on campus um, so that we can uh, have some help with addressing our homeless population and that the university is actually helping us by helping to provide alternative um, sleeping arrangements for students. Um, in addition to that, um, I would like to um, make an amendment to the motion that's been provided um, around the date of the abatement, and I would like to um, make the mo uh, an, an amendment to the current motion that this come back to the council on March 12th at our meeting for us to evaluate um, the, uh, the camp Currently, or at that t at that point in time, to see how many how much services we've been able to provide, and determine at that point whether or not it would be um, it would be a point when we would want to close the camp or keep it open and consider other options. Well, the maker of the motion had to step away, so we'll go ahead and have that on hold until that um, the maker of the motion comes back to accept the amendment at this time. Okay, uh, Councilmember Glover and then Councilmember Brown. Great, thank you. Um, so first of all, thanks to everyone to coming out and sharing your perspectives and opinions. A lot of uh, really important things to take into consideration with shared experiences, individual experiences of being homeless yourselves or people that are coming from neighborhoods and running businesses concerned about safety. So I really appreciate you bringing all of that forward and sharing it with us. Um, I want to address what was said at the beginning of the uh, meeting specifically, and I wanna point out that I think it was a rather inequitable decision for the mayor to make a lengthy, sta lengthy statement at the beginning of the meeting, reference me personally, and then refuse to let me respond. So to respond. <laughs> So to respond, after weeks of working with fellow council members, interns, community members, advocates, people experiencing homelessness, residents of the Ross camp who actually live there currently, and people who live in cars, so making sure that there's that representation, we created a set of policy proposals. The policy proposals were refused for the reason that it would take too long, which is something that we heard a little bit earlier that didn't have time to get it on the agenda. Uh, I saw the draft agenda, just so the community knows, and it showed an estimation of this uh, meeting time ending at 9.30. So that's only two and a half hours to discuss such an important issue of homelessness that was allocated on the draft agenda. With the issue of homelessness, the sheer volume of suffering taking place, to cite time as an obstacle is disappointing. If we have possible solutions that can be explored and discussed, we need to be here until 2 a.m. if necessary. Yeah. <laughs> I have a job, I have a dog, I have responsibilities, but I was elected to do what's best for the city and will require, that will require sacrifice and at times long meetings. So the concept of trading my time for another person's suffering is in my opinion abhorrent. Mayor Watkins also brought up her gender as a reason for the, for the for 
uh, I don't even know, uh, the, for the community organizing approach maybe, or for me educating the community about what's going on, but I wanna emphasize that that really shows how little she knows about me. I'm an advocate for the rights of women, girls, and trans folk. I sat on the city's commission for the prevention of violence against women where I urged the commission to recommend the city council adopt the convention for the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women. And I'm pushing, uh, and it's one of the reasons I'm pushing so hard is because all of the women, girls, and vulnerable folk that are sleeping in the camp have no, because they have no place to go, are at risk of violence, sexual abuse, and exploitation right now. I want, I want the community to know that I'm a community organizer. I care about inclusion, I care about representation. I want to assure Mayor Watkins that I would have taken the same approach of building community support if she was a man or woman or non-binary person. The issue is not about gender or race. It is an issue of morality and principle. It is about prioritizing time over prioritizing people. I think we see this not only with Mayor Watkins' refusal to agendize the items for action, but instead gave me the option, so instead of agendizing them, she gave me the uh, option to make a motion with direction. And I wanna make sure that the community understands who don't know the process, that if an agenda item is not on the agenda, then we can't take any action on it. So at the earliest, any of my policy suggestions, a five point policy plan that I brought forward, the soonest anything can be deliberated on for actual action is at our next city council meeting. That's two weeks away, 14 more days before we can start actually looking at innovative, and as some people mentioned, radical solutions. So I hope that we can work through whatever this conflict is, but I must say that I find it offensive and in some ways irresponsible for her to try to belittle my effort to educate the community about the process and the impacts of her decision. So with that, I will make my motion. Uh, I'm gonna pass these around. Uh, here you go, if you could pass them that way. There's one over there. We have a motion on the floor, so you'll be making- I'm make an alternative motion. A substitute motion. Yeah. But it's not so here's this and these what? going over here this way. So I want to make um, a motion. So get ready for it. It's about a page and a half long because I had to put everything into a single motion so that I could have the community hear what's going on and ideally have the support of my colleagues to instruct staff to move on these issues. It's a point of order. I we have a question of point of order. Count Mr. I assume Nagas. that Councilmember um, Glover is making a substitute motion. Yes, he's making a substitute motion. Yes, so if the council accepts the motion to make a substitute motion, then you may vote on Councilmember Glover's motion. Okay, do we have a second to your effort for a substitute motion? A second and a question for the city attorney. Well, so are we, are we gonna... Uh, we can vote on this right now, or we can vote to agendize it. Well, this is. I haven't heard the motion yet. I have to but this is the vote first. for the substitute motion, essentially. Councilmember Glover, I assume, is about to articulate a motion, a substitute motion, to substitute the recommended action with a substitute action. And so we have to vote on that at this point. You have to vote whether to accept the substitute motion, and then if you do, you have to vote on the motion. Okay. Councilmember Matthews? Again, uh, I'm just trying to get clarity on process here. Uh, um, my impression is that you want to move to agendize these to a future meeting. Is that correct? Mm, well, there's that's part of it, but that's not all of it. So why don't you wait to hear the motion first, and then you can okay. pick it apart. And if I could just finish my thought, it may be that some members would want to support the motion at hand and some additional items. Okay, so if I may, I'll acknowledge uh, Councilmember Brown, um, then I'll propose maybe a possible path forward and then we could potentially get to both. Okay, Councilmember. So, um, I have a pretty good sense of the motion to come and I'd, I'd like to support it. However, I um, am I'm also wanting to John, it's kind of clarify because I, I don't necessarily see it as a substitute motion, but as an additional set of um, proposal. So I'd like to be able to um, support both. Um, and um, okay, 
Yeah, We've had yeah, a chance but, to hear um, from yeah. the community. Okay. But any, so anyway, I, I mean, I don't know that it's a substitute, but it, I'll just wait to just kind of okay, see where so we go. Okay, so if I'm hearing maybe might be a pathway out where you'll be able to have your motion come forward, um, is if you were to withdraw the substitute motion at the time, we could potentially move the uh, motion on the floor and then you could introduce your motion after. No. <laughs> okay, then this. I'll make, I'm gonna make the motion. So you made a motion to have a substitute motion that's seconded by council member Crone. Mr. Condotti? Can I say the motion first? Well, yeah, <coughs> by all means. Thank you. And I, I will say I find it interesting that knowing that I was going to make a motion to do some certain things, you chose to call on Council Member Myers first, who then made a motion which would have, if we didn't have this clarity, blocked my ability to make this motion. Really, really frustrating, but that's okay. I move that. The, the that the city council adopt the recommendations of the city staff for one A, one B, not C, and number two. I also move in that same motion, which you, now you can find the rest of this here, that to direct staff to put on the agenda the following items for council consideration and action. Between now and the next city council meeting on February 26th, instruct staff to A, provide a resolution to the city council of, for a, the city of Santa Cruz to proclaim a local homeless state of emergency, and B, a report identifying all potential locations for a transitional encampment on city-owned property and any identified opportunity sites on private property within the city of Santa Cruz or city-owned property in unincorporated S Santa Cruz County, and C, an action item to recommend uh, to remove overnight parking restrictions on Delaware Avenue between Swift Street and Schaefer Road, D, a report and recommendations based on the ordinance submitted this evening, which you'll find in your packets, uh, the establishment of transitional encampments for people experiencing homelessness and an interim use on publicly owned or private property within the city of Santa Cruz, including E, if necessary, a draft ordinance amending the municipal code to establish a permit process for such encampments and F, a report and timeline to enter into negotiations with UCSE with the intention of leasing the vacant lot at the rear of the UCSE administration building at 2300 Delaware Avenue for the establishment of a safe parking program. G, the first draft of an ordinance based off the framework submitted this evening in your packets to come back for a first reading at the next city council meeting to hear community input and response with regards to the safe parking program. H, a report from Parks and Rec regarding the reopening of public facilities and bathrooms based on the materials submitted this evening in your packet. I, to direct the city attorney and to coordinate city staff efforts to examine specific city ordinances concerning the disproportionate effect on residents without homes and to examine the potential conflicts with both the specific law and the spirit of the US Constitution as interpreted by the Boise decision and return to the city council with this data within 90 days of camping, sleeping ordinance, trespassing ordinance, urination and defecation ordinance, then J, direct staff to make data available in an organized format in the following ordinances to allow the council and the community to monitor the potential disproportionate impacts on residents without homes. This data shall include the address and the race and gender of the person cited, the charges, the location, date, and arresting officer or ranger, concerning stay away orders, the length of stay away orders, and shall also include conduct in parks, obstructing sidewalks and benches, obstructing sidewalks and benches after night, sitting, next page, lying, 24 hour stay away orders, smoking bans in public places, dogs downtown and elsewhere, arrest three infractions without a warrant, authority of the city attorney to reduce misdemeanors to infractions to avoid due process, open containers, parking garage loitering, median loitering, safety enhancement zones, youth curfew laws, aggressive solicitation, and vendor licensing required for handicrafts. 
So I would love to make that and submit the motion uh, for consideration by my peers so that we can not only move forward with this, uh, but then also start really taking tangible action on making sure we can solve these problems so that we can address the concerns of the neighbors that are in, inundated by the impact of a uh, camp structure like the one at the Gateway Plaza, and then also working towards a sense of compassion, justice, and equity. Uh, there's, I'll close my motion really quick with a quote from Dr. King to try and encourage my, my council member colleagues, which is, we're all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one affects all indirectly. I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. This is the interrelated structure of reality. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, now it's the time for us to have deliberation in action. Did that set off the alarm? Okay, so. Um, set off the alarm. <laughs> okay, so we have a motion by Council Member Glover, a seconded by was a Council Member Crone, Mr. Condotti. The motion is to substitute the main motion with that motion. the motion that was just um, that was just uh, articulated by Councilmember Glover. Okay, and so so if you approve this motion, then you can proceed to vote on Councilmember Glover's motion. Okay, is there uh, okay? So let's go ahead and vote on whether or not we approve the motion at this time. Is that correct? Okay. Um, Councilmember Matthews? You'd think I'd know this after all these years. Yeah, here it is. Here it is. That's okay. I just, again, want clarity. Are we voting on whether to consider the substitute yes. motion or on the substance consider. of the substitute motion? Whether to consider the substitute okay, thank motion. You. Okay. We'll go ahead and vote on whether to consider the substitute motion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? No. Oh. Okay, so that passes with Crone, Glover, Brown, and Vice Mayor Cummings. Um, approving? <laughs> Matthews, Myers, and myself. Not. Okay, so we'll go ahead and vote on, or unless there's further discussion, we'll go ahead and vote on Councilmember Brown. Well, I mean, I feel like I'm now in at a place where I may be uh, injecting a bit of a tangent, but I was hoping we could have a, a bit more conversation about kind of the the, um, the proposal that we received from staff, and I wanna thank staff for the efforts that you put in. I want everyone in the audience, as well as my colleagues and staff to know that I'm really coming at this from a you know, place of um, empathy, um, respect, um, a little bit dismayed by the divisiveness of the conversation. I, I really hope that I'm not contributing to that in any way. Um, by making these comments and asking some additional questions, I realize this seems like a tangent, but I just do wanna ask, um, you know, one, um, I understand, this is for staff, um, I understand that um, staff have been in, and again, total tangent, but I don't see any other place for it. Um, I understand staff has been in conversation with the warming center regarding a gate and concrete pad um, at the end of the property where the warming center currently operates its storage facility. I'm just wondering if, um, and Susie's a little bit busy right now, so sorry, um, um, if we could have a, a, you know just a reply to the, well, where that's at, if that's anywhere, um, and to, um, I um, understand that the availability of the armory as a possible shelter location has been um, up in the air. Um, sometimes yes, sometimes no. I'm wondering if um, we could get an update on the availability of the armory um, as a additional shelter um, location, possible shelter location. I don't wanna take us too far afield. Again, I don't see where else to have that conversation. I'm wondering if, if it would make sense to divide the motion or divide the question, essentially, to uh, divide aspects that were part of the substitute motion that encompassed some of the uh, recommended city council action 
vote on that and then move on to the additional suggested language. Yes, the, the, um, as the presiding officer, the mayor may divide the motion into multiple questions after a motion has been made and seconded. Any council member may, may request that the presiding officer divide the motion into multiple questions after a motion has been made and seconded. If upon request, the presiding officer declines to divide the question, any council member may make a motion to divide the question. The presiding officer shall desire, desire whether or not to allow debate or limit debate on a motion uh, to divide the question. When dividing the question, the presiding officer or the requesting or moving council member shall clearly state each question to be the subject of a separate council action. Okay. So I think the best, or one path out that would work would be to divide the motion into what is before us um, and then have the, have the council vote on that and then move on to the additional recommendations. Does that <coughs> feel comfortable for the majority? Okay. With a comment. Um, no, sir. I would like to add back to the motion regarding the recommended city council action item C. And I, I wanna state the reason for that and I'll make an amendment to do that. And please, I would like to have Thank you. A, a discussion with respect. Um, this represents significant progress in our relationship with the county and getting the County Health Services Agency, Human Services, to work with the city and, and all the other departments and partners. Finally, for the first time in this very difficult discussion, we actually do have significant money available to us. We're trying to figure out how to begin using some of that money for immediate services with the goal of spending the bulk of it on real uh, physical facilities uh, for longer term um, assistance for homelessness relief. Um, this was the action adopted by the county. I think it's really important that we mirror their action. Um, and I think if you look at C, uh, it could be, uh, it talks about a planned, I would say closure, I agree with the use of the word abatement, of a planned closure by March 15th. You don't get somewhere without having a target. Um, I excuse me. I'm. I'm. I'm hey, excuse. I, all right. I'm. I'm. I'm trying to explain my logic here to my fellow council members. Um, what's intended here in B is a really serious, aggressive effort to get shelter, a variety of shelter facilities, up and running. Some in the city. DFW in the county and working with the faith communities with uh, pr aggressively pursuing small s scale safe parking programs. Um, and there are other other possibilities as well. Uh, the armory was mentioned. I know that's, and that is included in this discussion here as um, shelter options that have previously been used or something like that. So um, I really want to fully encourage that we take this opportunity of available money and an unprecedented partnership with the county and get going on this. That the um, impetus for doing that will be the intention to close the uh, <coughs> Gateway Plaza encampment. We can come back with reports at both of our upcoming council meetings as to how that's going. So I would like to make that amendment to the motion that, as I understand it, currently sits on the floor that would uh, add item C back in there, um, just mentioning a planned closure okay. by March 15th with reports back to council at our, at our upcoming meetings. Okay, so we have a, we've, we have an opportunity now for our uh, council to take action and to deliberate and we appreciate you being here and talking to us and uh, we appreciate all your opinions. But now's the chance for us to find areas of alignment for movement and action in an effort to meet the needs of our community. And so I appreciate your respect in that regard. Um, everyone has an opportunity to speak. So we have uh, Councilmember Matthews 
putting a request to the maker of the motion to reintroduce C as a potential uh, possibility, knowing that there would be updates before the 13th date, but as a estimated uh, approach. Okay, and that's to the maker of the motion. Well, I, I put that to the maker of the motion as a request. Okay. So I'd be interested, to, now can I ask to hear from my fellow council members about their thoughts around that before I either accept or refuse it? Yeah. Okay, I'll Excellent. go ahead. Um, I'll, I'll go, can I acknowledge this council, this vice mayor, because he mentioned he wanted to. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Okay, absolutely. vice mayor and then uh, this Councilman Brown. So um, the first thing I want to say is to the community, and I just want to encourage folks that, um, you know, we're in working with the county and having worked on the two by two committee with staff and having reached out to people in the community, one of the things that we really need from the community is for you all to continue to reach out to people around you in the public and private sector and find out who is willing to actually allow us to utilize their space for providing more homeless services because that's a big thing for us is that people want us to do something about this about the homeless situation in Santa Cruz, but nobody wants to offer the space in their neighborhoods. So um, we understand that, um, you know, currently where the Ross camp, the camp is um, at the Gateway Plaza, that there have been people from those communities, some of which are low income communities and have already been facing some of the, you know, bigger social injustice impacts that we have in our community. And they're some of the people who are coming to us asking that we do something. And they're not telling us to just ru like rush and push everybody out. What they're asking us for is help in finding alternatives. And they're also asking us for making sure that their neighborhoods are safe. And so um, with that, I would just like to say that um, having worked with the county on this, I think that as we move forward um, with regards to um, letter C of this, that we should, and, and I also wanna point out one other thing too, is that um, it's 1040 and I do understand that, um, you know, we wanna address these issues as best we can. And by bringing this forward and in support of the decision of the mayor to not include these items, I do wanna say that um, we're just getting to one item right now, and if we had had five more, given the fact that, yes, we should be spending a lot of time on this, but at five o'clock in the morning, having been sitting in meetings since 11 a.m., will we be making the best decisions that are gonna infect our entire community? And I think that as a sleep-deprived de city council, we would not be in a position to be making the best, most effective decisions for our community, given the fact that we will not be in the best states of mind. So I do wanna keep that in mind, that we are trying to be mindful of time when we're trying to set up these meetings. Um, I personally um, think that um, we are trying, we, tonight we're proposing ways that we can start addressing this issue starting tomorrow. So I think that our intention was to make sure that we start acting on this immediately. And um, I do want to, um, with regards to see, rather than having a plan, well, we can plan the closure for March 15th, but I think that what would be a friendly amendment would be that we revisit our situation on the 12th, and we can determine at that point in time whether or not we'd wanna move forward with the closure of the camp or if we should have alternatives um, at that point in time. I support that. I, I support that. Yeah. Okay, we, we, okay. <laughs> okay, that's essentially the friendly amendment that I believe was offered on behalf of Councilmember Matthews. I, I believe there were two friendly amendments offered at this point. Okay, so uh, again, we have an opportunity to now deliberate and take action. I could take a recess and we could reconvene to, to be able to do that, but I appreciate it if you uh, keep your comments to yourselves and allow us to now find time to deliberate and find areas of alignment. Thank you. Um, the next interruption, I will ask that we take a five minute recess so that then we can come back and deliberate. Okay, I wanna make sure that we're really clear on where we're at with this. We have a divided motion um, one that encompasses the recommended city council and county action that uh, is now having on the table a amendment to, in, to modify C to essentially. Basically say planned closure by March 15th to be revisited at our upcoming council meetings. And I would say both 
upcoming kill. Okay. And that essentially covers what I believe. So, so we would revisit this on the 29th, well, sorry, Six. on the uh, 22nd. 26. On the 26. Okay. Does that accept? We'll let Council Member Brown and then we'll see if there's if that's right. accepted by the mayor. I mean, I'll just make a comment that I'm uncomfortable with setting a date without, um, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable with setting a date at this time. And so I just want to make sure that I'm clear, um, Vice Mayor Cummings and Council Member Matthews, if there's a difference there in the in the amendments that you're proposing related to item C, um, whether we're talking about setting the date for March 15th or we're talking about um, coming back to the council on March 12th. I think uh, that I know what yours. I know what your intention is. Uh, I'm just <laughs> wanting to make sure, um, Vice Mayor Cummings, that um, I'm getting your intention because I feel like there may be two potential amendments there, and I just want to be clear what we're talking about before um, Council Member Glover decides on whether or not to accept any any amendment, an amendment if any. So I'll just say before, my understanding, and you can correct me, Vice Mayor Cummings, is that you're uh, proposing that we move forward with C, but knowing that we'd like to have an update prior to the 15th to ensure that we're on that path or if we need to make any changes. Is that correct? Yeah, my intention with this is that on the 12th or beforehand that we can revisit whether or not closing it on the 15th would be an appropriate action to take. But including the, yes. the including that as yes. the action now, which is essentially the same yeah. thing as what I'm hearing. So they are the same am amendment. 22nd and the 12th. 22nd and the 12th, okay. So so as I understand, we would do the 30-day the notice, however, on February 26th, <laughs> and then uh, we would check in with the council to see if you still wanted to keep with that date. Uh, and then again, we would check on uh, the second meeting in March, uh, which is the 12th, and to check to see if you still wanted to keep to that date. Yeah. So we can do that, yes. Okay, does that... I would be uh, open to extending the 30-day period to a 60-day period, uh, and then have a reevaluation at the next two meetings to find out if that 60-day closure period will be sufficient. I would also uh, move or add to my motion to remove the term abatement, abatement, and replace it with something less dehumanizing. Okay. Well, so that, I think. Um, okay. So maybe the. Okay. So the friendly amendment is not accepted is my... I did not interpret that as acceptance of the friendly okay, amendment. Okay, so I but think I'd be what happy would to be... Change my I'll, I'll go ahead. So what I think would be appropriate is if a council member wanted to make an amendment to the... To, and then we could vote on the amendment. If that passes, then we could go back to the original motion. Does that seem appropriate, Mr. Kandati? Yes, a council member could um, make a motion to amend part one of the main motion. Okay, is there a motion yes, to... so okay. I will amend... I will move that we... Um, uh, add uh, item C, return item C to the recommended action, changing the word full abatement to closure. With the direction as previously outlined? With the direction to return to council with an update at both of our next meetings. Okay. Is, is there a second? Progress. Okay. Yeah. Is there a second? Second. Okay, so there's a motion and a second, uh, a, a, a motion to amend the main motion to incorporate that language. We could go ahead and vote on that and then move on to the other. This is on the motion to amend the main motion. This is on the motion to amend. All those in favor on the motion to amend the main motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. no. That passes with, no? I'm sorry, I didn't hear your vote. Yeah, no. Okay, that passes with Council Member uh, <laughs> Matthews, Myers, Vice Mayor Cummings, and myself um, in favor, Council Member Crone, Glover, and Brown voting against. And now we'll return to the vote of the amended. Part one of the main motion. We'll return to- As amended. The, okay, we'll return to part one of the main mo motion as amended. Um, and that's essentially what we see before us. Um, One and that two. That is except as modified by the. As modified by the amended. <laughs> okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. No. Okay. So that passes with Councilmember Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, Councilmember Myers, and myself in support of uh, that action. Councilmember Brown, Crone, and Glover uh, voting against. And now we'll move on to the final uh, component of the motion, which is essentially the recommendations that were handed, handed out by Councilmember Glover, correct? 
uh, part, part two? Okay. I believe that was one and two. Third? I, I believe was it was one A, B, and C as amended. And, and two. two. And two. And so I two. Okay. That's right. So now we'll go ahead and move on to what is before us, to, which is to essentially agendize uh, the following uh, outline provided in regards to specific actions for the next city council me meeting, which would be on February 26, correct? Correct, yes. Okay. And that is a uh, motion by uh, mm -hmm. Councilmember Glover, second by Councilmember Crone, Councilmember Brown. Again, tangent, but I just, I'm hoping to get my questions answered yeah. <laughs> uh, regarding the armory and discussions with the warming center about uh, lo locked gate at the end of their um, facility there. Yeah, so um, I can answer the question about the warming center and then Tina and I can talk about the armory. Um, Sergeant Carter Jones and I met with um, Mr. Adams on Friday, um, did a walk around of the facility and, and did um, speak to some of the tenants that were in the same building. Um, as the warming center storage program. There is accessible, an, an accessible pathway from the levee path to um, the uh, levee side or the west side of the building. Um, that would be a much more direct access to the warming center storage program. Um, I'm in agreement with Sergeant Jones that that's something that we should consider um, helping out with. I do think it would um, greatly lessen the foot traffic that goes all the way around the building to access the warming center. So you have to go all the way down Felker, enter through the front of the building through the parking lot, and then go to the very back side to access the storage facility. So um, I have advised um, Mr. Adams to uh, apply for heap and cash funding for the capital improvements um, bucket um, to think about kind of the bigger scope. Uh, I know that he has other things that he would like to see done. Um, for the purposes of immediate action, I do think we should help to f facilitate opening up the fence in one section so it can um, be a gate and possibly putting some hard surface down so folks that might be mobility or impaired or have you know, push carts or whatever could access the storage program from that side. So um, I would like to work with city staff to figure out how to support him with that. Just a quick follow-up question there, and thank you for that. Um, is the, will that be coming back to council, or is that just something that can move I, ahead? We don't, don't need to take action. Okay. No, I don't. Gotcha. No, I don't think so. Great, thank you. And then, um, or Martine or Tina can talk a little bit about what we've we've learned in the last couple of weeks as to the armory. Well, yeah, thank you for that question. The armory. So, council might recall last year when we were working on the siding question that that is the one site council actually provided direction on go ahead and try to use the armory facility for a six-month period for our phase two of our three-phase plan. I believe that was your motion, Councilmember Brown. Um, and uh, within 10 days, literally, of that council action, we heard definitively back from the, I, I forget the exact um, individual of the rank, but the, the armory uh, management that, in fact, it would not be available because the this um, planned renovation of the facility would actually going forward. They'd had it funded budgeted for years and nothing was happening and we thought it was inactive. And um, they said, no, we're actually gonna start. So that was supposed to commence in October of last year. And we learned just this past week that nothing has happened with the armory. Um, so some sense of significant disappointment there. Um, and this is something that we're interested in following up on. So. Uh, Earlier in our in our presentation, I think there was a part D of like the plan and also talking about exploring other sites as possible. So that's clearly up there and something that I think and um, validation from the council that that would be of interest would be helpful as well because we can reach out to our state representatives and our partners also to assist in that. So if that's you know an alternate site that still would be of interest, that would be good to to get that sense. Quick follow-up question there. Uh, would you need that as uh, a motion to include that or just as a consensus, taking consensus? A, a motion is always wonderful to have that clarity and that clear interest. expressing okay. interest. That, that's always helpful for us to have that council interest. I wanna make sure I'm not out of order, but I do wanna make sure that that motion gets made, that, we, that I have the opportunity to make that motion Thank before you. we close this agenda item. Thanks. Okay. <clears throat> Um, I just had a, a, a couple of quick things. One was uh, uh, just wanted to clarify with respect to the main motion, whether the council had wanted to consider the 
additions that the county made to their motion with respect to the security yes. um, and the and the and the allocation or the reconfiguration of the encampment. Just want to be clear whether that was something you wanted to include or not. Yeah, that's something I wanted. That's to my motion, right? So that that we can assume that was that was included. Yeah, it was in the, in the alignment with the county stuff. Okay. That was my motion. That was her motion. Let's, let's have it on that the record. That was in the motion that Donna motion made. made yes. But it wasn't, <laughs> it was it wasn't in the one that, that oh, okay. right. exactly. So, That's because I want to make sure. That okay, so then do, um, okay. I'd like to suggest we clean up this one First. before we go on. <laughs> the next yes. And so, um, so that one's been voted on. That anyway. much has been voted on, but I'd like to add, um, to move that we add to this motion the additional um, uh, direction given by the county, which was uh, provision of security to minimize neighborhood impact, moving the encampment fence um, back from the levee. And again, I think the importance here is that it's a collaborative plan. Point of order, isn't there a motion on the floor currently? I, it's the second part of the motion that you. You could have multiple motions on the floor. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. That was just a question uh, with respect to. Uh, and I wanted to just clean outstanding up. Outstanding things, and then yeah. you've got yours too to keep on the list. And then the other one, uh, with respect to your motion, just wanted to point out that, uh, with respect to the items here, uh, just to be clear, that uh, some of these we may not be able to fully complete in two weeks, uh, just simply because the time frame to get these completed would be. The packet goes out on 21st, so it really just give us about six days to get all this complete. So we'll certainly do our best, but uh, we might not be able to have all the ordinances drafted or all the calls made and all the communication back from the university, for example, and that sort of thing. But we'll, we can do an update on where we are with each one of them. But I just wanted to be clear so that the expectation is that, that they'll be 100% completed, because that's probably unlikely given the short time frame that we have between now and the next council meeting. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor as my understanding is one motion at this time with other potential motions waiting for Part two of the main motion is still on the floor. Part two of the main motion is still on the floor and that's the only motion on the floor. Okay. As far as I'm aware. Okay. So why don't we go ahead and vote on part two of the main Just motion and then revisit the additional conversation around the alignment with the county actions as well as the recommendation that was brought forward by council member Brown. Yeah. I, I thank you. It's, I, yeah, okay, well, let me just go ahead and pause here for a second. Why don't we go ahead and take a brief recess? We'll take about five minutes. We'll reconvene and then we'll re, and then we'll discuss. And at that time, we'll have our opportunity for deliberation and action, and I'll ask that the community um, allow us to do that. Okay, so we'll take a five minute recess and then we'll come back. I know. So, did this did this get in? You all, uh, please take a seat or um, close your conversations. <sighs> okay, we'll go ahead and bring it back for some last areas for clarity and uh, for movement. And I'm gonna go ahead and ask again for you to please all close mm -hmm. your conversations and allow us to have our deliberation and action take place. There are a few areas where we still need to uh, see where we can find alignment and movement. Okay, so I'll just uh, summarize where I think we might be at. And then I also failed to mention that we received a letter from our uh, colleagues at the county in our two by two committee um, expressing their appreciation of the participation and collaboration, as well as um, further explaining their support of the recommended action with the additional considerations um, as listed by uh, previous council members, which incorporated some security as well as uh, movement 
of the uh, location uh, away from our uh, river bed. So uh, that came in uh, earlier today from the Board of Supervisors, so I just want to acknowledge that. So that's the components that we still need to get to in regards to uh, the, the main uh, recommendation before us tonight. Um, in addition to that, we have the uh, pending half of the divided motion, which is the recommendations provided on the screen before us. So I'd like to uh, f go through that and then we can open up the opportunity for additional motions to encompass some of the other th aspects that council members brought up. So we'll go ahead and start with the divided uh, motion um, before us. That is the proposal by uh, council member uh, Glover, seconded by council member Crone. Is there any further discussion or debate on this before we vote on this item? Councilmember Matthews and then Councilmember Brown and then Councilmember Glover. Yeah. Put his hand up first. So yeah. Go there first. Thank you. Mayor, does that work for you? Can I go? Well, you know, I think I, you know, one of the things that I'll just briefly say is that as mayor, um, for, first of all, I have only so much ability to sort of see, and I, I do my best to acknowledge both. And um, I do also want to acknowledge just my role and that I didn't create the role. This is the role that has been designated by our city government for me to adhere to, and I'm honored to serve in the role. And part of that requires me being able to maintain um, <coughs> deliberation, action, and um, and decorum. And so I just I just really want to clarify that. So if if I'm not looking one direction and I realize that that's the case. It's not necessarily personal. I want to also think that, you know, if Councilmember Brown does, if I see three hands or if I'm looking this way and there are three hands that didn't come up or one was up before and I didn't acknowledge that for pointing that out, given that I'm happy to acknowledge you and then I'll acknowledge Councilmember Brown and then Councilmember Matthews. Go right ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Brown and Matthews for acknowledging my hand up first. I will say that it has been a pattern throughout the evening that you've looked to your left first before you've looked to your right. So that's why it was kind of like, come on. Uh, but that's okay. Uh, I want to emphasize uh, that there is a lot encompassed in this document and I will acknowledge that and I totally understand what uh, City Manager Bernal uh, is referring to with regards to time associated. I will point out though that some of them are uh, to come back within 90 days. So specifically lines I and J are to come back within 90 days. So that should loosen it up a little bit. Uh, and also I wanna emphasize for my uh, fellow colleagues because unfortunately since these weren't agendized, I couldn't share all of the documentation with you to review ahead of time <laughs> effectively as it would have been in your agenda packets if it had been. So I understand that there's the desire for there to be more community input and a little bit more opportunity for people to uh, not only share their perspectives but also for us to be able to dig deeper into some of these different issues, which is the impetus of me bringing bringing this forward tonight so that we could have the staff. The only actionable item that I'm asking to come back for on the 26th is items A and items, oh no, not just items A, oh, and item C. So item A, which is uh, for coming back with language, which I believe after speaking with um, City Attorney Kandati, we already have the language for the resolution proclaiming a homeless state of emergency. And the logic around the homeless state of emergency, just because some people get it confused with shelter emergency, is we declared a state of shelter emergency so that it would be um, applicable for us to receive the HEAP funds, the $9 million that we're talking about. We had to declare a shelter emergency. The difference with its, the declaration of homeless state of emergency is it opens up the bureaucratic barriers that tend to slow down the process of establishing different kinds of transitional encampments, as well as it makes it so that we can kind of circumvent some zoning regulations so that we can get us into places and find more uh, applicable locations where we can establish transitional encampments. Uh, one of those models is Dignity Village, which was referenced before. Um, and so I wanna just let that be known, just to clarify in case anyone had any questions. And then also, yeah, so the second half from I down is all 90 days, and then everything else is to come back with a report of feasibility or just the perspective of the staff, and then for discussion and deliberation at the 26th meeting. Okay, uh, we have Councilmember Brown, and then we have Councilmember Matthews, and then Myers, and then Brown. So can I just ask for clarification 
because I, what I just heard um, Council Member Glover say I, is not consistent with the way I read the language of the motion. So the action items that you're requesting for the 26th are A and C, and then a report back on the 26th on items B uh, and D through H, and then items I and J to come back within 90 days. Correct. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that my, um, I'll reserve my comments because I think it's been covered. Thanks. Kathy? To me, this is just overload. There's so much in here. Each one um, has a different level of review, of probably process, um, both for the public and um, going through commissions f for one thing or another. And honestly, um, I'm happy to look at it, but I don't feel at all comfortable um, putting this yet additional workload on our staff. All the stuff we loaded on them this afternoon, um, everything implicit in getting these programs up and running, um, you know, I, I appreciate the intent here. There are a lot of things. A quick glance at them, I see some that make sense to me, but others I would be absolutely opposed to. And I'm, I'm just going to vote no on the package. Okay. And then, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I think it was Council Member. No, not enough time to process. Okay. Yeah. So Council Member Myers and then Vice Mayor Cummings and then back to Council Member. Take, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate um, the information and the packet that's been provided to us. And uh, I'm happy to, to try to look at these things. My biggest concern right now is to try to make sure we have staff resources focused on getting people into shelter. Um, that's what I'd like to see done with our staff time. Um, and I'd like to make sure that's done in a way that's um, predictive for the community, that is um, done well, and uh, that we focus on that. We need to get these people who are living in those conditions into other types of housing right away. Um, so I appreciate that this is a this is a, a complement, a set of additional ideas that deserve attention, um, and they and we can we can pull these up. There's a few things in here that I can, I just not. For example, the hours of public facilities. That's a that's a big conversation, and uh, I you know there's just a few things in here that I feel like um, are going to take away from the focus of trying to get people in shelter right now. Um, I do have a question, uh, Council Member um, Glover, about the safe parking uh, residents um, here. I'm just curious, um, is this different than what was in the staff recommendation? There was in the staff recommendation that we, re that we voted on, um, there's mention of initiation of a small scale safe parking program specifically. Is this a different... Um, safe parking program that you're proposing here? It is, and we've met with the Association of Faith Communities to compare notes and talk about the differences. Theirs are smaller with potentially five vehicles. This would be to establish a parking location for t uh, 15 to 20 vehicles. Okay, and I'll just remind us that we don't want to get too in depth with right. discussing the content of okay. the so items. I'm good, thank okay. you. Uh, Vice Mayor and then Council Member Brown. So, First, I want to clarify, I just want some clarification. Would the, would we be bringing back A, action item A on the 26th of February, and item action C? Yes. And with the anticipation that we will have community input on item C and then make an informed decision on how to uh, move with staff after that. And then we'd have staff addressing B, D, E, F, G, H, what would happen with those items? Those ones would, uh, since we've, I've had interns working on doing the research and kind of pulling out the backgrounds and recommendations on everything, um, as well as working alongside local advocates. The content is here, essentially. All the research has been done that can provide the preliminary analysis of the proposed uh, ideas. So this is for, this packet essentially is for staff to be able to take, look at the work that's already been done, 
come back with a report based off of what they perceive from the reports that we have and then come back so we can have a conversation about it at the 26th meeting so that we can uh, decide either if we want to move on any of the things based off of staff recommendations or whether they identify that they need more time and a uh, report of the progress they've made thus far. So my understanding is that we're gonna bring the language back as is of A and C on the 26th for discussion and then items B, D, E, F, G, and H, you're directing staff to look into what you're doing and then to bring a report back to see if we could put it on for the 26th or could put it on later. I'm just trying to get this to have a good understanding because um, while I do, same thing, it, this is a lot to take in and I know that staff is also, um, has a lot going on trying to get this stuff moving forward. That being said, I do want to respect the time and effort that you put into this because I think that there's a lot of good things in here that um, we can, that'll probably help with our efforts to deal with a lot of the homeless situation. I do want to be respectful of, of people's um, time and our ability to do this in a way that we can do it well mm -hmm. and make sure that it's something that not only is effective now, but it's something that we can use moving into the future. And so I just don't want us to, to do this with too much haste in the sense that we might not be able to do it correct the first time. Uh, Council Member Brown. No, I'm gonna support the motion uh, and I just wanna make the following comments. You know, my, I understand that what we're doing here is, um, is a direction to come back for the, op one for s particular actions, but also um, for consideration of um, these additional um, <laughs> provisions, and um, some of which I uh, wholeheartedly support, some of which I kind of contingently support, and you know, some of which I have concerns about. But I, what I understand here is that we're opening up the opportunity to have that conversation. I trust that staff will let us know in a staff report back um, if they, you know, how much of this um, they've been information they've been able to gather, how much of a recommendation they feel comfortable making it this, that time, and um, staff will do what they do, and they'll get us the best information they can um, for our deliberations, and it may be that we continue the conversation. So I don't think that um, supporting this motion here t tonight suggests that we are going to demand that our staff um, take on all of these immediately um, in lieu of uh, the other uh, efforts that are have been undertaken. Um, and so with that, I'd say I'm, I'm gonna support the motion. Um, forward to an ongoing right, conversation. Okay, Council Member Myers. Uh, I'd like to just call a question. Okay. Yeah. So we have the call the question for the motion um, as before us. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? No. Oh. No. Okay, so that passes with Council Member Crone, Glover, Vice Mayor Cummings, Brown voting in support, Council Member Matthews, Myers, and myself voting in. Okay, so at this point, we'll go ahead and end that part of the discussion. And we're not done. <laughs> so at this time, I'd like to ask if there would be a motion to um, put on the floor some modifications to the uh, recommendation of the agenda item that we previously voted on, encompassing some of the additional direction, potentially, and then um, we can go from there. Um, did we add, oh, let's, if we could pull up the language that the county added um, to the first mm. part of the main motion. Yeah. Um, that we add, uh, provide 24 hour security to minimize neighborhood impact, move encampment fence to provide set back from the levee pathway, um, a proactive neighborhood outreach plan um, to ensure strong connection between the operator and the neighbors, and uh, direct collection of basic data on clients <laughs> served at the city or county funded programs and facilities in order to better understand the demographics and circumstances of those served. So is that a motion to encompass yeah. language? Yeah. Okay, there's a motion by Council Member Matthews. Is there a second? I'll go ahead and second that. Okay, all those in favor, please. Could, could you repeat the motion back just yeah. real quick? Okay. Yeah, okay, it's, it's this, oh, it's this. Okay. those two. Awesome. And then I added um, direct, um, 
let me see here. Um, well, I'm trying to piece together two different things. Um, move the encampment fence, uh, develop a proactive neighborhood outreach plan to ensure strong communication between the operator and the neighbors, and um, direct collection of basic data on clients served at city or county funded homeless programs and facilities in order to better understand the demographics and circumstances of those served. The purpose of that is simply to know the variety of needs and circumstances and who we're serving so that we can better shape those needs. Sure. Sure. Can in the future. Sure. Okay, thank can you. Can I ask a point of clarification from staff's perspective? Yes. <laughs> yes. So um, what I'm hearing is potentially a conflation of Donna's um, motion that is re more relevant to future shelter opportunities and what the county approved was specifically for the gateway encampment. Okay. Okay. So I just wanted to make sure that those. That's clear. That, okay. That, yeah. So I would say implementation of homeless services in the city will have a um, proactive neighborhood outreach plan, provide 24 hour security. Um, or security during hours of operation. I'm gonna put it that way, because they're not all 24 hour. Mm -hmm. um, the implementation of homeless services in this city, um, including the proposed shelters, will provide security during <coughs> operating hours, proactive neighborhood outreach plan, with the other language, Bryn, uh, uh, Excuse me, Bonnie. <laughs> Sorry, why did a little, I did a little time work. <laughs> I'll get you the exact language here. Uh, a proactive neighborhood outreach plan um, to ensure strong communication between the operator and the neighbors and directing collection of basic data. Okay. So um, that's the motion. There's a second. At this time, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Okay. Council Member Brown. Well, I would move that we direct staff to include uh, the National Guard Armory in um, uh, consider as consideration in consideration of uh, potential shelter spaces and report back to us um, when might when does staff think that might be feasible for report back? I think we should try for the 26. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, on the t on the 26 um, for. Uh, Consideration. Okay. So there's a motion by Councilmember Brown. We're going, we're going the same place here. <laughs> yeah, we're going to second that. Um, and can I make a friendly amendment to that? You should <laughs> offer it to her. Yeah, offer it. <laughs> that we um, that, in addition to the recommendation earlier, that we actually direct staff to reach out to UCSC to look into um, ways that they can like potential opportunities for them to house homeless students or allow for. Um, homeless students who sleep in their cars to sleep in their cars on campus. If I could just for clarification, I believe that was encompassed in the, mo the other motion. It, I think this is different. I think what's what's included in here is to lease the, the yeah, <laughs> to lease the, the building at Delaware. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sure, yeah, I think that's a great idea. I'll be reaching out to Chancellor Blumenthal when we meet tomorrow morning about this very issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, is there any further discussion on the motion? Any clarification on the language needed? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that too passes unanimously. Okay, so I think that's the remainder of the discussion for the various motions. And so we'll go ahead and close the item. Thank you to those who were able to stick around till the very end tonight. Um, at this time, I will go ahead and adjourn the, the meeting without any additional action to take. So we're adjourned.